Three. All right, everyone, welcome to the last city council of 2023. Today is Tuesday, December the 12th. And uh, as is traditional in this council chamber, we like to start off with the singing of O Canada. And we've got a special singer back who did a great job for us before, an amazing job uh, with our Remembrance Day. She's got quite the voice, and we're really excited to have her back. Her name is Reese Patterson. She joined us earlier this year, and again, as I mentioned, uh, with uh, helping us out at the uh, Remembrance Day. Reese is nine years old. She sings like she's much older than nine, but she's only nine, grade four at Prince Philip School. She's been taking singing and piano lessons at the Niagara Rock Academy in Chippewa for more than two years. Reese also enjoys training with Athletics Niagara, and she loves her dog. Please give a warm welcome back to Reese Patterson, and please stand and join me as we listen to her rendition of the National Anthem. To say potato pay, you say potato la croix. Tony Swore, Tony Popay, day plus brillant, say soir. God keep our land glorious and free. Oh, Canada, we stand on guard for thee. Oh, Canada, we stand on guard for thee. Well done. Wow. Wow. Well, Reese, I want to say you do an outstanding job. As they say, the apple doesn't fall too far from the tree. Mom's also a great singer in our community, and I know you're going to follow right closely in her footsteps. So thank you. You did a great job. Thanks for having Thanks. me so much. Thank you. Thank you. All right. That's the way to kick off the meeting. Much better than Councillor Strange singing it, because he offered to sing it earlier, and I said, I don't, I'd rather not. Next up is the... Land Acknowledgement and Traditional Indigenous Meeting Opening. And I'd like to invite Chief Stacy LaForme, Chief of the Mississaugas of the Credit, to share his testimony as we acknowledge and thank the Indigenous peoples who were stewards of this land for a millennia before us. I need Gamer, Chief R. Stacy LaForme, Mississaugas of the Credit. I'd like to acknowledge the Creator, the world around us, and our place within it. I acknowledge the many nations that walked this land in the past, the many nations that walk it today, and welcome you to the treaty lands of the Mississaugas of the Anishinaabe Bay. The treaties with the Mississaugas are the Niagara Treaty of 1781 and the Between the Lakes Treaty of 1792. I would also like to acknowledge the Treaty of 1764 that recognized the Royal Proclamation of 1763 which set a new relationship between the indigenous people and the crown. Keep which one be. Thank you, Chief Laform. We're grateful together for the land we share. So now, Council, we're looking for an adoption of the Council Minutes from November the 14th. Motion by Councilor Strange, second by Councilor Neustag. All those in favor? Okay, and that's approved. Thank you for that. Also looking for approval of the council minutes of the special council meeting, November the 28th. Councillor Baldinelli makes the motion, seconded by Councillor Patel. All those in favor? Okay, that's approved. Thank you for that. Any disclosures of a pecuniary interest? Oh, the fly, you can't see? Oh, that one? Just that corner one, Mr. C.A., if you could, yeah, just that one. She wants to keep an eye on me, apparently. <laughs> Bigger ones, too, to really block the view. Uh, any disclosures of a pecuniary interest of council? Okay, seeing none. Oh, perfect timing. I know this is everyone's favorite uh, part of the meeting, especially uh, CAO. He always asks me to give him a little teaser, and I won't tell him. I just got to wait for the meeting. 
First off, uh, we will acknowledge obituaries. Rod Perrier, husband of retired city employee, Tony Lynn Perrier. Our condolences go to their family and also Donna Weens, mother of Brad Weens of our fire, our fire department. Birthdays, our director of HR, our director of HR, Trent Dark celebrates his birthday today. Happy birthday, Trent Dark in the corner. Yeah, that's right, 35. Uh, happy birthday to you, Trent, and uh, many, many more. Uh, also coming up the day after Christmas is Councillor Lococo on the 26th. Happy birthday in advance, Councillor Lococo. Yeah. <laughs> Boxing day sale, that was a good one. Um, uh, the Niagara River Hawks recently had their cancer awareness night. I was joined out at Center Ice with Councillor Strange as we uh, dropped the puck that night to uh, acknowledge a number of people. I thought, Mr. Uh, Council Strange, maybe you may want to speak a little bit about, uh, since you've been so heavily involved through your box run charities. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, the new owners of uh, the Junior uh, C's, who were who originally, they played for the Junior C's years and years ago, so they come back and they, uh, Andy Burt, um, Al Fife, Mike Cressman, I think one of the Pepperells as well. And uh, so they had a, uh, a cancer awareness game um, and uh, we had Adam Egerter who uh, was one of our heaters heroes and, and uh, we had him drop the puck and he suffered from brain cancer six years ago and I remember you reading um, the script uh, of what it was all about what he went through and the chemo and radiation and everything like that and uh, he just started high school th this year and he's been cancer free for five years which is truly amazing and plus the, uh, the team wore pink shirts in honor of uh, Jordy Pepperell who just recently passed away and, and we dedicated that game to them so uh, you know it was, it was a great great day and, and, and legacy of, of Jordy and uh, and Adam and what he's done and, and being a cancer survivor as well as yourself. Yeah, thank, you. thank you very much that was a great day appreciate you being there to help us. Um, we did um, recently have the SPA winter auction fundraiser uh, event that took place at the Americana where they're raising funds for um, their uh, facility for all the animals. Uh, regarding council representation, I'd like to thank Council Coco for representing the City at the Faith Fellowship Church Fundraiser. Also, we did have some business happenings recently. We had some grand openings. Uh, first was Niku Japanese Barbecue celebrated both their one year anniversary and their grand opening. I was joined by Councillor Peter Angelo that night. A lot of fun, Japanese barbecue on Victoria Avenue. Real neat place to go to eat. Um, also, we had the opening of, of the new location for Lugo Clinic uh, that took place. I don't know if we've got it yet. Yeah, there we are, Lugo Clinic for all that ails you uh, at the professional building on Kitchener Street on, uh, and Portage Road. We also had the grand opening of the Tide and Vine Fish Market. And there I am kissing the fish, I guess better than swimming with the fish. And um, uh, we're really excited. It's been such a great success story, Tide and Vine. Uh, as a restaurant, you know, first they got started back in the day with a little van shucking oysters, traveling all over, and it was so hard for them, they'd have to eat the oysters that broke apart on the floor at the end of their day. And that's how they'd get through, living in the van, sleeping in their van, uh, and, and working their way to this dream to open up a storefront in Niagara Falls. It was doing very well and then COVID hit. And they just had challenge after challenge after challenge. Their twins were born. Anyway, now they're back doing very well. They're thriving. And right next to their restaurant, uh, which is down on Portage Road in the Stanford Green Plaza, they've now opened a fish market. So for all the people Christmas Eve that like to get their, their uh, fish uh, feast, uh, you can get everything there, your scallops, your, your uh, smelts, your, your salmon, and everything else. So we're very proud of them, and uh, congratulations to them. And I, and I was joined by Councillors Baldinelli, Thompson, and Patel. So thank you for all of you being at that grand opening, and you can see them in the picture as well, watching and saying, I'm not kissing that fish, not, not after you did. Um, also, we had the grand opening of On the Ridge Cannabis. I was joined by Councillor Patel, as we opened up uh, our newest cannabis uh, outlet on the corner of Dorchester and Lundy's Lane. We had some flag raisings. Uh, we had the Romania National Day, which took place out at the Rosberg's flagpoles, and I was joined by Councillor Thompson that chilly morning. 
So happy to celebrate with them. Coming up, ladies and gentlemen, of course, I don't need to tell you, uh, Christmas is around the corner. We wish everyone a happy holiday. Uh, however you celebrate, we just want you to make sure you have a good time. Don't drink and drive and look forward to your family time. Next council meeting uh, will be the first meeting of the new year. That'll be Monday, January the 15th, which will be budget. And then back to back, then on Tuesday, January the 16th, will be our regular scheduled council meeting. So thank you for your indulgence on the mayor's reports and announcements. So now, um, Mr. Clerk, I know we've got some deputations and presentations. Um, our first one is, did you want to introduce our first one, Mr. Clerk? Yeah, thanks, Your Worship. The uh, first presentation we have uh, this afternoon is regarding the Niagara SPCA and Humane Society, and that's uh, a report on the agreement renewal. Uh, we have with us today Mr. John Greer. He's the general manager from the SPCA, and he'll be providing a presentation to Council. Great, fantastic. We'll step right up to the microphone, Mr. Greer, and you bring some someone with you. I did. Good afternoon, Your Worship, Council. Thank you very much for allowing us this time to give you a little bit of background on what the, your local SPCA Humane Society has been up to over the last year. This is Nina Tumel. She's our Animal Services Supervisor. So she enforces all of the uh, Animal Patrol officers and the bylaws for the City of Niagara Falls and oversees that operation. So we just want to go through a little bit, I guess we just click that. Uh, just to give Council and Your Worship a little bit of uh, background on what we've been up to and all of the different programming. So, do you want just, I guess, quick. Just go. So, uh, so Council knows, uh, the Wellington District Humane Society from 1954 and the Niagara Falls Humane Society has been since 1947. In 2018, there was an amalgamation to form the new Niagara SPCA and Humane Society. Uh, so we. Oh. One second, sorry. Sorry. <laughs> Little technical glitch. Give us one half well, a second. Oh, uh, I just forgot to share the screen. I'm sorry. Uh, sorry. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Got it. Okay. Yeah. We're never at home to see it. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Oh, well said. Uh, yeah. So uh, out of the Niagara region, we serve those seven municipalities that you see there on the screen. We also service uh, Haldeman County. And uh, we're very proud to announce in 2024, we will be providing animal control services for the Mississaugas of the New Credit, which is kind of a historic uh, event for a humane society to go into a First Nations community. That's ironic that the, the chief of the Mississaugas- Yeah, he was here. Yeah. yeah, that's great. Uh, so again, just to give you a little bit of background, this is our veterinary clinic opened in 2014. Services are available to anyone from anywhere. We don't. Uh, turn anyone away for, for any reason. In 2017, we became a certified full companion animal clinic and we're actually underway right now for to double the size of it to expand to serve the community even better. To date, since that date, we have performed 56,000 surgeries. Our veterinary team does about 25 surgeries per day, five days a week wow. for the community. No, go back. We'll go back up. Oh. oh, there we go. And I, I just threw this up just to give you a little bit of an idea. Uh, the number of cats times six years, if they're left unaltered, equals 66,000 cats. And a dog, six years, it's, I, I guess, I, I think I must have cut it off. I just took a screenshot because it's up in our clinic. Would be 67,000 puppies born. And of course, some of them possibly, you know, unwanted, not able to find homes. So we, we think we take that very seriously. Uh, we're very proud of this. So we were the first humane society in the province of Ontario to launch a mobile spay neuter clinic and be able to travel to First Nations communities into low cost areas and provide surgeries basically right at your doorstep. And this is our unit. Uh, we were, were accredited by the CVO and we travel around the province providing services again for those people who maybe can't get to our brick and mortar clinic and we can come right into your community and, and do it right on the spot. Yeah, we'll just go. We provide humane education throughout, uh, so our personnel attend schools, keep, <laughs> provide schools, or attend schools, youth groups, uh, seniors homes. We have a pet team that goes around with a couple of our shelter animals and uh, just, just make visits. Uh, we'll provide all kinds of training for animal control related issues to bylaw. We have 
and our East Main location, an 850 square foot training facility that we work with bylaw and different things. And I think we, we do that the next time. We also do a lot of bite prevention training for the Niagara region and the public health departments. And in fact, uh, Family and Children's Services has approached us because they have to enter homes. So we provide bite prevention training. Yeah, just click through there. So as you know, we provide on patrol and bylaw enforcement services on a 24 hour emergency response basis for the city. Is that a pig? Yes. That would be, yeah, that's a pot belly pig, yeah. So <laughs> uh, as a humane society, of course, it's not just dogs and cats. We get calls for exotic animals, for farm animals, and we're able to respond to all of those calls. Uh, we're, again, another thing we're quite proud of is that we actually control the provincial safe house for reptiles. So the province reaches out to us. So currently, I think we have a couple of alligators under our care, a couple of large venomous snakes that we work with zoos and, and get them out of. It's very important in the Niagara region. There's a lot of exotic animals within the Niagara region that is very under the radar a little bit. So it's, it's good that we can provide that. All of our officers, we make sure they're well trained in, in use of force, de-escalation, uh, different things like that. And we just, we were very proud of the officers on the road. They, it's a hard job. They do a good job. They're there 24 hours a day for the animals of the community. We work closely with Niagara Regional Police, of course, uh, the OPP, whoever calls on us, fire, uh, EMS, any, anything like that. So we thought of, in today's society, social media, so we have our own uh, in-house multimedia service and we that we've actually been contracted out as you can see there the Sarnia Humane Society has called on us the Ontario SBCA uh, to do their educational conferences and the Northern Animal Summit. So just to give you a little bit of an idea under animal services we have six animal control officers four senior managers that oversee those departments so that we, we service them well under animal care shelter operations, there's 18 animal care attendants, and we employ two full-time registered veterinary technicians. Our clinic, which is separate from shelter operations, employs three veterinarians, two registered veterinary technicians, and four support staff. So this is a little bit of a, the stuff that we do outside of the actual animal control contract. We get out into the community. We're very community-oriented. We're very proud. Now, this was through corporate partnerships, of course, that we developed over the years with uh, the, some of the bigger corporate people. So I think, Mayor Diodati, I think you're down there with me in front of the truck there. It's not a very great shot, but down there. Uh, so we parked, we pulled three tractor trailers into the Niagara Falls location uh, just before Christmas of last year. And we did it throughout the year. And we just gave it out to community members just to help them through Christmas, to give them a bag of food so they didn't have to spend money. It was Royal Canin food, veterinary approved, so the bags were worth about $160. So we don't do cheap food or ro old Roy or anything. And we estimated we gave about 270,000 pounds of food in need. Uh, we also work with many of the shelters in the area, grow here in Niagara Falls. Uh, we supply food to them and a lot of the outreach programs, so we'll get, take skids of food to them. And that's just a couple, oh, more, pic <laughs> a couple yeah. more pictures, just as you can see. Uh, we had a partner reach out from Guelph that runs a homeless shelter and of course they showed up and we loaded up their truck for them as well. And this is just, again, we have our community engagement team so we're out and about. Uh, we attend all kinds of events, the Christmas parades, different things. Uh, we have a fleet of vehicles so that the one on the upper right corner is an adoption vehicle with 22 kennels. We can do curbside adoptions anywhere in the city. And the other ones are transfer vehicles if we have to go out and transfer a large amount of animals from a call. So I'm sure probably most of council is aware uh, there's a lot of social media over it. These are two dogs that were dumped in Fireman's Park. Uh, the person that dumped them for, unfortunately put them into the bush and only for a member of the public being down at the bottom end of the park and seeing a dog walk out we probably would never have called. So they called and our officers showed up. I went down myself as well. And they were in very, very poor condition. We're not sure how long they were there, but it probably took about two months for our medical team to treat them properly, get them back up to weight. And Harriet, the little <laughs> wire terrier there, I saw her just before she got adopted and she was like bouncing off the walls. So I mean, it was just great to see and they're adopted into their loving homes. So this is again, some of the work that we sort of do outside of that the content, like 
treat these animals as they come into us. Uh, this is another one. So this is something that we really can't plan for throughout the year. I mean, any animal that comes in that's highly adoptable, uh, we're going to do everything in our power to make sure that animal gets out into a loving home. So this was actually a surgery that we had to perform. And although we have our in-house veterinarians, they're more spay-neuter veterinarians, we have to contract a lot of this out to local veterinarians. So this, just this surgery alone cost us $6,000. This dog, again, is out. Joey is out living a great life in a loving home and all fixed up. Uh, this is just to show you a little bit of some of the things that the staff encounter pretty much on a weekly, monthly basis, just depending on the time. This was actually uh, caused by scalding. This puppy had been left in a plastic crate in its own urine, and that's what it will do to the pods of their feet. It will actually scald the pods of their feet. So again, we treated the puppy, our medical team stepped in, and the puppy's out in a loving home. Another thing our community engagement team were very aware of, so as many of you know, 2022, December, the big storm hit. Uh, these are our mobile units at, I believe, the Vale Center in Port Colburn. Uh, we went around, we are the first responders for the Canadian Red Cross in the Niagara region. Uh, they kind of forget animals a little bit, so they, you know, they set up the warming centers and people can go in. Many of them don't want the pets in there. Uh, just a little bit of background. One, I was at one of these, and I just can't remember which one. But we treat the animals outside. They stay on our mobile unit, our adoption unit, while the people can go in and figure out what's going on, when they can get back home, get warm, get something deep. And a lady couldn't get back to her home, and she showed up, and she had a diabetic dog that needed its insulin. And our registered veterinary technician was able to give that insulin on the spot inside the mobile, and she was very appreciative. And this is our big one. So we're committed to the city of Niagara Falls in 2024. We're going to be building a 23,000 square foot state of the art humane society. Our concept is we're going to build a humane society inside a community center. We want our community involved with humane society. We don't think our current building is really conducive to that type of relationship. Uh, so there'll be a lot of outdoor space, inclusive playgrounds for children, a seniors area. Uh, another thing that's very, very important, we will have a state-of-the-art animal hospital that we will move from our current location, and we've already been in talks with the College of Veterinarians, and it will become a teaching facility for them as well, because the fourth-year students always find it very difficult to find placements. And another thing that I think is very near and dear to Council is we will have boarding kennels. Have what? Boarding kennels. Oh, boarding kennels, <laughs> great, fantastic. Uh, and yeah, so that's the rendering, uh, the inside, some of the, the, the renderings we've come up and we will be launching that campaign in 2024. Excellent. And that's it, that's all we have. Oh, that was great, fantastic. Thank you for that. I know there's gonna be a lot of questions from council, okay. a lot of interest, we all love our pets. Uh, first off, uh, Councilor Newestay, <coughs> and then Lococo, then Patel. I'd like to thank you so much for the wonderful pre uh, presentation. Um, often we get, oh, through you, Mary, got the protocol, sorry. Um, we hear all the time from uh, taxpayers, what am, I, what am I getting for my taxes? And I have to say, the work that you do for our residents really speaks volume. You're definitely a community partner. I'm just hearing all the things that you do, and I've got to say, I was not aware of all the um, aspects that you do. Um, as a resident, knowing that we have somebody taking care of any exotic animals or any animals at large that could be frightening to any of us. We would want to see that. Um, the exotic, the fact that you are dealing with the youth and the seniors, the food donation, um, really just speaks volumes about the, the great work that you do. Um, so you're here today asking for us to renew a contract and so it made me question, if you weren't here to do this, if your services weren't available, what would it look like for the city? Where would we, how, how would we, would we have to take over that kind of all this this work that you do and um, I'm not even sure what that would look like so maybe you can speak to that for a minute through you mr. mayor to the councillor uh, yes so we have the infrastructure we have the building currently and we own the lawn so it's it's owned by the, the charity uh, for the city to undertake it you would have to build infrastructure so you would have to build basically an animal shelter which I mean, by the time you probably put it all in, it's a $20, $25 million project because there's vehicles involved, there's training of staff, there's all of that, and th that's really like, and it would become like bylaw kind of doing it. You wouldn't have the expertise that we have, like 
I've been 24 years, Dean has been 20 years, most of our staff are long term. You want people that know animals to look after the animals, especially when it comes to exotics and whatnot. It would be a huge undertaking for the city. Like I say, you would have to appropriate land, build a building, buy vehicles, hire staff, have them all trained. And, you know, so again, we have staff seven days a week. I mean, even on holidays through Christmas, our folks are in looking after the animals. We don't leave them there for the day. Like, they're in there working. So there's all of those components. It's quite complex when you get to the sort of down to the bottom of it, when you realize all what a humane society does. It's not just puppies and kittens and, you know, adopting them out. There's a lot. The enforcement end of things, you know, and following through the court procedure and officers having to be trained in court procedures issue fines, attend court on behalf of the city and do all of that. So it's quite a complex operation once you sort of like sort of look into it a little deeper. Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor. So it's not just the capital cost of this 24 million, it's the whole operating, so this 24 seven and everything else. It would be a very costly endeavor for the city. We didn't um, solicit your uh, services for, for the city. So I think you're looking for 530, is that what 74, I think. Yeah, so, um, or it's, yeah, so it's, it's quite, um, I guess, comparative to that. It would be very or very well done. Um, now, if um, the next question I have, and Councillor Patel, and, and I'm doing this all because we've experienced this, uh, we both sit on the Dangerous Dog um, Committee, and we learned all about liability. So maybe you can share with the rest what that really means for the city as well with respect to the issue of liability and who holds that. Sure, so through you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, yeah, so we carry $5 million liability, and we also, because we do so much community work, we carry a rider policy of $3 million, where the city is actually named in that policy, so anything that happens under DOLA, which is Dog Owners Liability Act, any of those court cases or bites would come through us and our legal. Uh, so from a liability standpoint, uh, again, through the amalgamation, the old organization of just the Niagara Falls Humane Society put all of DOLA cases, dog owners liability, back on the city. So the city was actually liable for it. When we took over, because we encompass everything, we're full service, we took DOLA back. We took on the liability. Uh, again, our officers have to go. I think I did a, an information session for a few of the newer counselors on the liabilities and how the process works and how our officers, like again, from an investigative standpoint, work their way through and then issue that muzzle order and there's specifications within the muzzle order. So we, we own that liability as far as that goes for anything that the, the uh, Humane Society does. We carry our own insurance. The only time liability would fall back onto the city is as the animal experts, if we issue a muzzle order and we don't take it lightly because it's for the lifetime of the pet. Uh, if uh, the tribunal, like when, when we meet and Nina and I usually attend those, if the city decides to remove our muzzle order, that would be the only time that the liability would fall back onto the city because you've removed our, our muzzle order. So if that dog bites in the future, would have a whole lot of lawyers arguing over stuff. Yes, so we learned all about that. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and uh, just one other comment. I know we have our, our bylaw officer on through Zoom. Um, because he works very closely with you, is that something that we could hear from him? Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, just to talk about the relationship and, and the work that they do because, again, you're asking us, it, we're being responsible to taxpayers, that we are yep. um, spending taxpayers' dollars, that um, I think it's important that we can hear that. that sure, we can do that. Uh, we got Gerald Spencer, our manager of bylaw. Uh, uh, Gerald, welcome to the meeting. Uh, maybe uh, Councillor Newstead requesting that you give a little bird's eye view of your interaction with the Humane Society. So through you, Mr. Mayor, to the councillor, I can just suggest that we have a great uh, working relationship with the SPCA Humane Society. They also work closely with our core unit, so they work directly and indirectly with the Niagara Regional Police core unit, and they assist us as necessary. We recently assisted us in rescuing, there's about 20 cats. We had an issue here in the city more recently where there was displaced people that were in tents, and there was in excess of 20 cats that were there. And John and his team came out expeditiously that same day within a matter of minutes. They've rescued all 20 cats, and it's my understanding that they adopted them out. So uh, the relationship that we have with the SBCA Humane Society, since, certainly since I've been here, has been fostering one of a, a great relationship. And not only with us, I can also I, you know, speak for the core unit. They work closely with them as well. So overall, it's been a great working relationship. There's been no concerns or issues. 
John's very responsive. His team are very responsive in terms of any complaints that we might receive uh, for animal related concerns here in the community. And overall, I just think they're doing a great job. So that's my, hopefully that'll answer those questions, Councillor. Thank you, thank you very much. And through you, yeah. Mr. Mayor, um, I'd like to, I know they're asking for, I'm sorry, I had it in front of me, 700 and um, the, the amount for the, to move um, this. So it's okay. 574,000. Okay. Um, originally it was 557,000. I should add though that Mr. Greer, in year one and two of the old contract, he didn't receive any monies whatsoever, didn't ask for any monies, didn't receive any CPI or any annual increases. He only received CPI in year three and four of the former contract. And in year five, council approved a one year post pandemic contract, had no increases. So there was no CPI increases. There was certainly no uh, monies or increases in any way. And all John and the SBCA main society is asking for is uh, five years at 3% cap CPI increases and that's it. Thank you, Mr. Chair right. Spencer. Appreciate that. All right. And thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Councillor. Got Councillor Lococo, then Patel, then Strange. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through the Mayor to uh, Mr. Greer, thank you so much for your presentation. Um, thank you for all the work that you do in the community. I had two questions, and then I'll have comments later on. Does the region contribute any money to the SPCA? Through you, Mr. Mayor, no. We receive no government funding nor regional funding. I, I did see that on the website that it said no government money, but we're government. So I, I guess it's in, in perception about what government is. I think he means no regional, no provincial, no federal. No. Okay, so that, that's different. Yeah, so okay. through you, Mr. Mayor, we, I guess, yeah, we, we look at it as we provide a service for a fee, so we don't look at it as government money. It's not just money being given to us by the provincial government or federal or, or, or region. We provide a service, we're compensated for that service. Mm -hmm. Perfect. And the other one, uh, where is the new facility? Is it on the same location or is it somewhere else? <laughs> Three of us to I guess I probably should have addressed that, right? Yeah, so we're going to build on our Chippewa location. We're on about seven and a half acres there. Uh, we figured that's where the city's kind of moving. Uh, and we just think it's, it's sorely, sorely needed uh, in Niagara Falls, especially because of the age of our old facility. And it's just animal welfare is progressing at such a fast speed. But it'll be on our, uh, the, our same location. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. Those are all the questions that I have. Okay. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Patel, then Strange. Through you, Mr. Mayor, Mr. Guerrero, very great presentation. And actually, I have personal experience. A couple of times I have called on your services through Mr. Spencer, and it was responded within hours. And it was for the residents who called me, loose dog, and there somebody lost the dog, and you guys did look at the dog in a matter of a couple hours, and it was done on the weekend. So thank you very much for your prompt uh, response. Uh, my one question is, the services, where we appear when the contract is $574,000 a year, does that include all the services? It's just the one flat rate we are paying? Through you, Mr. Mayor, yeah. So that's, we're all inclusive. So there's nothing, there's no hidden fees. We don't come back to the city for any fees. So basically the animal services contract covers the officer's wages, um, building maintenance. We pay taxes back to the city as a charity as well. Like our tax portion comes back to the city out of that money as well. Uh, so all of our operations, anything that we do outside where you see our community engagement team out there is done through either donations, we raise funds through donations, uh, we apply for grants, so we have our uh, Haven for Companions uh, program where anyone experiencing homelessness or hospital stays or anything like that, we bring them into our facility completely free, we house them for 30 days, our veterinary team looks at them, they get vaccinated. Uh, and we keep them for the 30 days. We take it on a case by case. We've had some animals for seven months while people get back on their feet. So we think that's very important. And like I say, all of that outside community work is done as our charity arm and we raise those funds separately from that. And that's how we are able to do our programming. Uh, to you, Mr. Mayor, would you like to expand on Havens for a companion program, especially, I, I do know that you told me about uh, working with the women's shelter. Yeah, so through you, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, so one of the things we've identified uh, through our community partners, some of the women's shelters especially, uh, to leave an abusive situation, a, a lot of the women's shelters won't allow animals to come into those shelters. They're for humans only. They're just not set up for that. Uh, so through research, and it's been proven, you know, uh, some women won't 
or people won't leave an abusive situation because the animal is actually used as a tool against them that they would hurt their animal. So they'll actually stay with children in abusive situations. So we feel we've alleviated that problem by now all of the community centers know that. Like if someone has to come into the shelter for that reason, they reach out to us, we take them in through our Haven for Companions, and that's one of the, the, the facets, or homelessness. Um, I just got an email, I didn't have time to put it on because I had to have my slides in, but we just got our community engagement team. We will go out to homeless people if they reach out to us, because a lot of homeless people actually have phones and they can reach out to us. So, uh, but they sent, they sent a, a, an email back saying, thank you very much, I, I became homeless, and your officers came out and dropped off a bag of food for my dog for a couple of months until I got back. So even on the streets, we're out there, again, working with the core team or our community engagement. All of our officers now are trained as community engagement team. We're no longer, do, are we reactive to things? We want to be proactive and get into the community and stop these pets from coming into the shelter. Uh, the human-animal bond is another big thing that, of course, you may, uh, us as Humane Society recognize they're part of our family now, and we want to keep those pets with them as long as we can. Uh, thank you. Through you, Mr. Mayor, you talked about exotic animals, especially venomous snake and alligator. So if we, have, as residents, find something like that, do we call you? Through you, Mr. Mayor, yeah, absolutely. So like I say, we're full service. We have uh, contracts with farmers, so we can take cattle, horses, anything like that. Uh, I did Ontario's largest reptile removal in 2011, not because I wanted to, but because <laughs> I was forced to. I was on the road as a cruelty investigator at that point in time. So I, I got a lot of contacts through the province, through the federal government, and actually through the United States. So they've tossed our Humane Society, like I say, it's actually a secret location because it can be, uh, these animals can be seized by police. If by law encounters them, they would call us, we would call our experts in it, because we're not, we're not experts in it, but we have the experts in the field. So like I say, we run the safe house, it's here in the Niagara region, it's not Niagara Falls, but it is here in the Niagara region. Uh, and we currently, like I say, we have a couple of alligators, we had one that came from Toronto, uh, venomous snakes, and we again, work closely with experts in venomous animals or exotics. Uh, we deal with tigers. There's people in the Niagara region have tigers. There's like, there's a gentleman in Wayne Fleet that had lions. And so we're very well versed in all of the exotic. And like I say, I, I, it gets missed a lot because it's very underground. And when you sort of, I think just luckily with me doing what I did in 2011, I got a lot of connections where they'll reach out to us because they know we'll work with them, we'll get them to zoos, we've transported them down to the US to zoos, some of them we just don't want them in Canada, period. So we have all of those connections. The farms that we work with are all certified, they're inspected, so if we have to remove 25 horses, there's a, there's a trailer ready to roll out, they'll take whatever. So there's no animal that really comes through our door that we can't respond to. Thank you. Through you, Mr. Mayor. You are partners with eight municipalities. Does Niagara Falls bring any more challenges than other municipalities because we have millions of people visiting Niagara Falls every year? Yeah, so through you, Mr. Mayor, yeah, it actually, I'm, I'm glad you brought that point up. It's, it's a really good point because we have seven municipalities and we would like the other ones, uh, a county and, and, and a First Nations. Niagara Falls definitely brings its own challenges because the population of Niagara Falls uh, 95,000 last time I looked, 700. Say the city of St. Catharines is around 135,000 of a population. But what we see from the service provider is 12 to 20 million tourists per year coming into the city of Niagara Falls. A lot of them bring their animals with them. So that just increases our call volume exponentially to sort of service that as well. So it's not just the residents, it's the tourists coming in. Uh, some people, I know there's a lot of education out there, we do it ourselves, no hot pets, but they'll come in, they'll lock their dog in the car, they'll go somewhere, our officers have to respond, it'll leave that distress. They work with provincial animal welfare investigators, they work with the Niagara Regional Police to relieve that distress. So the, the tourist industry definitely has, has an effect on us, like at different times of the year. Okay, thank you, that's it. Okay, thank you, Councillor. Councillor Strange. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thank you for the presentation. Um, I'm a, I'm a dog owner, so I'm a dog lover, um, and I, you know, I, I don't think people realize how important our, our partnership is with the SBCA and, and the Humane Society, and you can imagine if we didn't have this service in our, our city. I've gone to countries like, you know, Mexico, Dominican, Cuba, Thailand, where there's just dogs and cats everywhere, 
And if we didn't have your service and, and we didn't have the, the uh, spade and neuter program that you've done over 56,000, can you imagine what our city would really look like? It, it would be exactly like that. So, uh, and I didn't realize all the stuff you did as far as contributing pet food to, to the shelters and, uh, and, and the Red Cross program. And you don't think about it in, in disasters or flooding or whatever. And uh, the Red Cross is out to, to help people, but they, they're not there to help the dogs and the cats and all the other animals where you guys step up and do that. So um, we really, really appreciate the partnership. And um, when the, uh, the public meeting is done, I'm willing to, to make the motion to approve it. Um, as well, is, is there volunteer programs? I've heard of volunteer, like I bring my dog to the, uh, to the uh, Humane Society and you have a couple dog parks there. And I see people coming in and out with dogs and I think there's a volunteer program if you might be able to elaborate on, on walking dogs and stuff. Because a lot of kids that want dogs but they can't. Is there an opportunity for them to come maybe just come and visit the dogs or walk them or whatever you might have there? So through you Mr. Mayor, absolutely. So our volunteer base usually sits around 200. Uh, so we have a dog walking program so you can come in and walk our dogs. We have a I guess a cat petting program where you can come into our community rooms and spend some time with the cats. Uh, and our animal care manager actually runs the program. Uh, the high school kids that need their hours can come in and spend time with staff, learn a little bit about animal husbandry, animal care, uh, so they get their hours in. So there's all kinds of opportunities. Uh, we run in the Seaway Mall, it was, it was just who we had at the time. We run a cat offsite cat adoption center. It's a little bit more friendly. And since I opened that, I think we're around 8,400 cats adopted out through there. Wow. But our shelters also continue to adopt the animals. So there's lots and lots. We have reading programs. Children come in and read to the cats or read to the dogs. It's very therapeutic for the children, for the animals. So there's all kinds of opportunities for volunteerism. Thank you. And I, I, don't, I, I don't think people realize that. You know, it's, it's not all about cats and dogs. and It's about our children and, and, and seeking the opportunity of Going out, going in, and, and being able to to volunteer. I remember. You know, I guess we all remember going into Niagara Square, and the first thing you want to do as a kid is go to the pet shop and see the dogs and all the different animals. And that's an opportunity that that you guys keep keep alive, and, and for these kids to come up and, and volunteer. So thank you. Thank you for that. I've got uh, Councilor Baldinelli. Then I come back to you, Councilor Newstead. Through you, Mayor uh, John and Nia. Thank you very much. Uh, the presentation was fantastic. Again, I just want to make sure people are aware that you have. Obviously, a great website that you've never mentioned, right? So, NiagaraSPCA.com. If anybody has any information about adoptions and donation requests or anything else like that, um, as we touched base before, um, maybe you could just give a quick synopsis of, of what people would do in case of, of an injury, because most times you won't see anybody come to your or require your services unless it's, you know, all of a sudden it's a problem, right? Animals, whatever, a dog gets injured. How would people get to contact you to, to see these services in action? Through you, Mr. Mayor. So uh, we do. So most people, uh, you know, we get a lot of dogs hit by car, cats hit by car. Our officers respond to that quite frequently. Most people would probably reach out to their veterinarian or they would know that there's an emergency veterinarian clinic in the Niagara region that they would go to it. Unfortunately, there's a shortage of veterinarians across the province and we're experiencing it here. Luckily, our, our veterinarians have been on staff for quite a long time and they're not going anywhere soon because I just won't let them, so they're <laughs> staying. So uh, basically, if they reached out to us, again, our officers, we do offer an ambulatory service where our officers will come. They're all trained in triage of wildlife because we do all your wildlife as well. Maybe I can touch on that as well. So anything from a great horned owl, to coyotes, we work with Coyote Watch Canada very, very closely. We monitor those situations. If, if uh, residents have concerns of coyotes we, in their backyard, we warn them of the danger. So we work very closely with Leslie from Coyote Watch Canada. But back to your question, we would provide that ambulatory. So again, very basic, they're trained in a triage, but that would allow us to, and we have uh, connections through different veterinarians. We, just to give you a guess, I guess this is a good example, and it was just one of our animals, it wasn't a resident, but we had a dog hit by a car. Our officer picked it up and got our veterinarian on the phone and the veterinarian said it needed immediate treatment. NVAC, which is the veterinary clinic here in the Niagara region, uh, emergency veterinary clinic, refused us because they were too busy. So our officer had to drive to Hamilton to get treatment. So they will do that. They will transport that on. They stay with the animal while it's at the veterinarian. 
It's a service we offer, but I think that really the basis of your question is more. Most people, if their animal goes into any kind of distress, they're probably their first call is their veterinarian, but absolutely we're always there to help. Our clinic runs five days a week, sometimes six days a week. Uh, Nina just held a, a rabies clinic and it was very well attended on a Saturday. All, you know, people, and it's of course all low cost for people. And I think we could do maybe better on education because I don't think the general public probably realizes just how much a work a humane society does under that premise of just the dogs and cats and get them adopted out. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Councilor Newstate. Actually, that was a, oh, through you, Mr. Murray, that was a perfect uh, segue into what I was going to speak about. So this afternoon, what I'm hearing people, we're all kind of amazed at the services that you do provide. And again, going back to the tax base, uh, ta our residents who's paying taxes asking, what am I getting for my services? This is just one immense um, service that we are being provided. And I'm not sure how we can um, educate or provide. I just went on our city website and there really isn't anything there, so maybe we can start with that. And I don't know if there's any, um, I know we send mailers out like our tax bill or things like that, whether there's even something that we can add to it just to say, hey, you know, or even, uh, I know we get the rec recycling program, but something that maybe we can give some thought to that really can educate people. And also, as Councillor um, Baldinelli said, what do we do if these things happen? So just information as well as, um, and things that people can get involved in, just like Councillor Strange mentioned about volunteer work. So again, I wanna thank you very much. It's been very um, uh, eye-opening to see the services that are provided, and I thank you. Thank you, thank thank you. you for that. Also, uh, uh, animals that, uh, skunks that uh, get run over on the streets, uh, you know, when we have dead animals, people wonder what happens to them. Do the animals eat them? They come pick them up. Yeah. You know, sure. so sometimes they get eaten. You'll see the odd uh, turkey <laughs> vulture. But, uh, but, but you guys come and help us out, right? We call, especially skunk, they can be a little bit uh, ripe, right? When they get hit in the very middle much, of the street. Very much, very much, yeah. Huh? So now, uh, next up, um, so thank you very much for your presentation. We do have a member of the gallery that would like to uh, address council, and then I'm gonna take a motion from the floor. I know Councillor Strange offered that he wanted to make the motion, and, uh, and if uh, I think there's no, further, okay, and we're gonna have a second over here as well. Um, but before we do that, the clerk informs me we're going to have our member of the gallery speak first. So thank you very much. Well thank done. You. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Sandra McKinnon, you got your chance at the microphone, so welcome. Welcome, and uh, just a reminder, you've got five minutes, and if you could state again for the record your name and your address. My name is Sandra McKinnon, and I live at 8055 McLeod Road. Thank you very much, welcome. Um, I, um, I was here August 15th, and I had a wardrobe malfunction. My shawl was falling all over the place, and I probably look, didn't look very together at that particular presentation or uh, moment I spoke. But anyway, I'm, I'm okay right now. Anyway, what I wanna sp speak about is I'm a resident and a pet owner. And um, I want to say to the presenters that it was um, a, um, a well done presentation. Um, and I wanted to, I have to read some of this stuff because it, it's a lot to do to read 21 pages and pick out five minutes in it. You know, it's a lot. So I, I have to read some and I'll speak on some. Um, uh, so the SPCA Humane Society, um, the society's mandate is to ensure that all animals have the best possible care. Okay, so. However, animal control and care are falling very short on service delivery. Three times I access service um, in 61 years. I'm 61 years old. And the uh, SPCA is in a society since 75 years. So I was 61 of that, I was in. So the three times that I accessed the service, I, have, I had two pets, I had two small dogs. The, the oldest one is 13 and she was a rescue. And um, she had a, uh, a cyst on her belly. The groomer went over it and it left a big red 
lump on her. I tried everywhere in the city to get help to get that removed, including the SPCA. And I was, no, 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 we can't help you, we can't help you. And that was my, that was my response many times. So anyway, my son paid for it. He works hard, he works 10 hour, 10 days a week, 12 hour shifts in Alberta. And he paid the $1,500 to remove that cyst. So then I had to um, access it again um, with my dog, Thor. But I wanna back up a bit. I got my glasses to read and then I gotta look this way. Anyway. The other thing I believe that the society, the uh, SPCA needs to do is have accountability for what they're providing. And you know, where are the donations going? It was already brought up by counselors already. Where are the donations? You know, who are the benefits of those, do the benefactors of those uh, donations? Can anyone view the documentation or is it just specific to certain individuals who view this documentation? I mean, we all can say this, that, and a million other things, but until it's on paper and you actually see it, then it's believable. But as far as verbally, you can say, I will, yeah, I'm trying to not to be going with my hands, I'm sorry. Um, so the cost of adoption, I paid $300 for Zora. Zora is 13 years, I think, because when I adopted her, the SPCA said she was eight years old, but when I took her to a vet, they said, no, she's 11 years old. So now my time is shortened with her because I, I didn't know that, but I was getting her and taking her anyway because I love her. Um, so, um, the SPCA uh, in their presentation spe specified that there was a vet technician on staff and a vet, et cetera. You know, why didn't they help me? If they had all these vets, why weren't they helping? Like what, you know, what, did, what was it? I have no idea. I don't understand. Um, now this is, this is on this 12, 21 page document. The services that they provide assist persons in the community that otherwise would not be able to get animal care for their pets. Who are they talking about? Who are they talking about? Now I heard them say that it was, you know, homeless people, etc. But is it just them alone? Like myself, I'm on ODSP. Do I qualify too? Or I obviously not because I tried extensively to get help throughout the community. And I want to talk about Thor now for a minute. Um, Thor was a loyal and um, uh, loving, affectionate um, dog, a beautiful dog. Here you go, Lori. Pass it around. That's Thor. Thor's dead. Thor died as a result of antifreeze poisoning. Now, I went to Alberta for four days for my son's wedding, and I left them in the care, my two dogs in the care of somebody that I trusted. And I didn't find, find out <laughs> until much later, that, and it was after the fact, that he was, he was getting sicker and sicker, and I got him to a vet. The vet gave me, um, it was really expensive, but he gave me antibiotics, he gave me food, and he gave me eye drops on a Saturday of the 26th of August, 27th, Thor died. And I was devastated. I was like totally devastated. So, you know, some of this stuff, you know, people understand, some people don't. Um, so, 
I know I gotta get back to here. Yeah. We gotta Just wrap to... it up, uh, Ms. McKinnon, because we are over our time. Okay, you gotta give me a few seconds here. I'm only on number 13, and I got a 20. But We're we, not we, get can, 20. we can we can skip. We can skip. So, um, so the education part that was spoken about to the public, where is it held, when? The content of information, you know, are they taught about antifreeze and how it could kill your dog? If you leaked from your car and get on your pavement and your dog licked it, it could kill them. Um, what about, um, you know, an animal, to get an animal is a 15 year commitment. You don't just get a dog for the sake of getting a dog. And, you know, vet veterinarians are very, very expensive. So that could be an education piece. I'll skip all that. Um, never mind that. All right. So, you know, the society, to me, when he did his presentation, which was very well done, and, and, and I believe it to be so, but I want this other point made up because there's a lot of elderly people that have pets, and when they die, my friend, who was a former jockey in Fort Erie, this was at the end of his obituary. It says, donations of, oh yeah, of desired uh, be made to the Canadian Cancer Society, because he died of cancer, and to Sam's charity of choice, the SPCA. I called the SPCA and I'm like, you get money, where, where is it? Like, why can't you help me? And they just, you know, they don't even answer the phone most of the time. And the wildlife, that's another big issue, I had a paper, uh, I lost coming in here with a picture of a, a geese with a broken wing that is Janet Dufferin, and it's been there since August. My friend here with me can I vouch for that. She's here because of that as well. And there was a fox that had two legs paralyzed crawling up the road to try to get to the bushes. And it took a more, almost two hours for an SPCA man to come down, he came, came down, went up to his knees in the bushes and said, oh, uh, we're not going to be able to find him here. Now, he was a professional, and I was just a resident. He should have had cutters, cutters for the, the bushes to search further into the bush for that fox that needed to be shot and put out of its misery. So that's... The gist of a lot of it, um, yeah, I just have my last thing okay, is a last suggestion. Yeah, my last, suggestion. this is my and last. We'll call Mr. Greer back up to address the news. Yeah. yeah, this is my last suggestion. And that is that before the contract gets signed by council, that it be copied and sent to the public and ask for any feedback. Since it's the taxpayer's money who are paying, they should have the right to where their money is going. If not, to the public at large, then a 12-member resident panel. As I earlier stated, animal control and care are falling very short on service delivery. Thank you. Okay, thank you, uh, Ms. McKinnon. So I'm gonna invite Mr. Greer to come back up, and if you wanna address some of the comments uh, that were made by Ms. McKinnon, and then we're gonna go to council and... Uh, Thank you. <laughs> and we'll look for the motion. Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, Council. Yeah, so I just made a few notes. So we're contracted for stray and abandoned animals in the city of Niagara Falls. That's our mandate is to look after animals without owners. We do feel there's an onus on owners to look after their own pets, and we're not going to take business away from local veterinarians such as the CIST. No, I would say we probably said no to that because you own the animal, there's a certain amount of responsibility that goes with that, and one of them would be veterinary costs. If we started treating everyone's owned animal, the, the figure today would not be the figure today because we would become a veterinarian clinic for the entire, nobody would ever have to pay for their vets. Uh, as far as the money goes, we are heavily regulated by CRA as a charity. We're audited every year. All of those financial documents are readily available through the CRA website. The city every year gets a budget from us. We work closely with your treasurer, Tiffany, and we everything is very, very transparent as far as that goes. That's a good point. Yep, uh, to that, yes, Councillor Strange. I just want to can and help the CRA. You can actually see exactly. Microphone. Microphone. Sorry, to that point, I went on the SBCA and, and the uh, Revenue Canada site where you can actually see where all the donations are going to, uh, whether it's employees, uh, fundraising, management, administration, gifts, uh, and all re other revenues. So 
get that. There. Thank you for that, Council. Uh, and as far as Thor goes, if our veterinarian said it was nine and another veterinarian said it was 11, uh, they're stray animals, so when they come into our care, they're either stray or abandoned. So really, honestly, even through veterinary medicine, it's the best guess. They'll look at their teeth, they'll look at their gait, they'll, they'll check certain things, and they, they attach an age to it. And to have two veterinarians vary in what they think an animal's age is by a couple of years doesn't really, really surprise me. Uh, all of our education programs, again, we, we're very uh, big on social media. We have Facebook, Instagram, I mean, I, I, I'm not sure of all of them, but all of those. So all of our education programs are posted on there. Uh, we, again, we do training, we do education. I mean, I don't know how else unless maybe through the city, we get it through the city website, uh, some more exposure to that. We have a large, large uh, following on Facebook where again, everything is posted, all of our adoptions are posted, all of the programs, if we run a, a clinic, all of that's out there. I'm not sure how as an organization we can really go much further on that. Um, to say that the animal control officers are falling short, I will take exception to that. I know how busy our guys are here in the city of Niagara Falls. And I think I touched on it a little bit earlier. I mean, the court process and animals are a little bit more of a complex than just a bylaw out, write an order and leave. Uh, like I say, we work with Coyote Watch Canada on foxes and coyotes. One of the main things I am very aware of for our staff is, because uh, we deal with the gorge, we've had officers go down the gorge, is their safety. I will not endanger the life of a staff member to save an animal. I'm sorry, but I'm just not willing to put a human life into that. So I think there would be a little bit more to the story than an officer just stepped into a bush and went, well, I, I can't find it. The other thing is wildlife are very, very good at hiding themselves when they're injured because they know they're injured and they know they've now become a prey animal to larger coyotes or whatever. Uh, geese, <laughs> if a geese is out in the middle of a pond, we, we do not have boats. We can't go in the middle of the pond. The officer can't swim out there and, and save it. And actually a lot of geese injured. We've seen geese with an arrow through their wing on golf courses and the people in the golf course feed it. So that goose just lives its life out normally. No, it can't fly away, but most of them don't migrate anymore anyway. A lot of them stay behind because we do feed them. Uh, so there's care provided to them. But like I say, when you get in, it's a living being we're dealing with. And it's very, very complex. The officers are very, very aware of the public perception. They get out there and they do the best they can. And I mean, we've attended all kinds of, you know, we get a lot of calls for a cat in a tree. We don't have the equipment to go up a 30 or 40 foot tree. It's just not there. And, you know, I mean, maybe because we're, we've been in the game for so long, we say, the cat went up the tree, the cat's coming down the tree. Like, we don't need to call fire, and, but people are passionate today, I get that. But like I say, it's, it's a complex situation. The officers are very, very aware. They're very, very well trained. They've done training with Leslie through Coyote Watch. They're trained in triage as far as the animals go. And they would never leave an injured animal if, if that was the case. I just, I'll, I'll, I'll disagree with that one. That's great. Okay, thank you very much. Appreciate that. Thank you. Okay, so we're looking for a motion now. I'm going to, Councillor Strange, you wanted to make that motion? Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. And yeah, I'm willing to make that motion. And I think, you know, of all the services and contributions we give, I think this is one of the most important services that we do. So I'll make the motion. Okay, okay. and I've got second by Councillor Patel. Wanted to second that. And, yeah. Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, I agree with Councillor Strange that what services we are getting, actually, for price we are paying, I think we are getting lots out of it. Yep. Thank you. Got that. Thank you. I've got Councillor uh, um, Thompson and then Councillor Lococo. I was involved with the, the, the people um, for 17. They were you great. And the clerk was always very helpful with this, the specificity. And um, Gerald Spencer is great to deal with that. And I would very support the motion and the, thank them for their work. Thank you for that. Uh, Councillor Thompson, uh, Councillor Lococo. 
Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I don't think anybody can argue the value or the, um, the need for the SPCA in our community. What I am going to um, think about is the financial responsibility that we have. I'm wondering why we're only doing a single source and not putting it out to an RFP. Maybe if our CAO could respond to that. Yeah, Mr. Burgess. I thank you through the, uh, through the mayor to council and to the councillor. Um, <clears throat> there's only a few players in the space. You have uh, this player who actually has a shelter in uh, the municipality. Uh, you have um, the provider in St. Catharines who also provides services for Fort Erie and a couple of other uh, ones. So you really only have two uh, two potential like two potential players who could respond to a bid. Uh, we've had a long relationship with it. When we look at the value, what we obtain for the service, we think we have good value for taxpayer uh, dollars. And because we have the service here uh, in our geographic boundary, if we shift it, uh, that we may lose that uh, physical uh, facility going uh, forward, and you cannot really replace that. Uh, the organization is taking a uh, pretty significant campaign to actually improve uh, the service there and that kind of guarantees improved service for uh, the city going uh, forward so uh, you know we made the decision based upon value based upon long-term value and making sure that we have a service here uh, that's important I lived uh, as a prior CAO in Norfolk County where we didn't have animal services uh, and uh, uh, we tried actually to get uh, them to stretch their response beyond Haldeman to uh, Norfolk County unsuccessfully um, and it's a municipal responsibility that we could never actually fulfill and we failed on that so uh, we thought a single source was uh, good for the taxpayers from a value basis when we compare our cost to other municipalities and long term having that service actually be here in uh, the city provides the city with other benefits where if we moved it to um, Lincoln County then we might lose those additional services that are there for the residents which we don't actually pay for we just get it because they're here so that was the rationale for the single source great thank, thank you through this um, through the mayor the other um, thing that I was looking at was usually with fee for service they, they come back year after year and we approve it with the CPI or whatever we're signing a five-year contract with CPI and there's um, a comment in there that they can come back uh, if there's financial <coughs> challenges they can come back and ask for more on CPI and I'm just wondering why we put that in there in comparison to other contracts and fee for services usually you come back every year provide your financials not that they're not providing the financials but I'm saying usually there's a process mr. CAO yeah thank you through the uh, through the mayor to uh, the council so there's still an annual review that's being undertaken every year for the services provided so we do that contract review um, the um, you know at the end of the day um, we just decided on a five-year contract for efficiency so it's not coming back every year for um, essentially a single source if we're gonna single source it we will put it out for a period of time and then reevaluate that hopefully after they've started their capital campaign and then reevaluate that uh, I embedded the 3% uh, CPI with the clause uh, that if you went through a high inflationary period um, that we would be open to talk about it it's no different frankly we have other contracts where even though there is no adjustment clause for it when costs go out they come back to us anyways so uh, I just wanted to give them uh, that opportunity to treat them as a fair partner that if uh, fuel prices are up 40 50 percent and that's a big chunk of their budget that if they needed a slight adjustment then we would we would you know uh, consider it at, at that time as part of the annual review process Okay, thank you. Again, I don't have any issue with the service or the, the need that's out there. I was just looking at the process of RFPs and, and the CPI index. So thank you for answering those questions. <laughs> thank you for that. Well, if we've got no further comments, we've got a motion on the floor. Moved by Councillor. Yeah, yeah, sure. You know, this is, this is when you look at the amount we're spending, it, we, we're, it, it's a drop in the bucket compared to what they're, they're doing. It, it's unbelievable. Think of what would happen if they couldn't spay it and neuters those dogs and, and cats, there'd be, we'd be infilled with at the city. It's unbelievable. And the stuff they do um, for nonprofits, 270,000 pounds they contribute to pet food. So when people are going to Project Share and other places, they have pet food where they can grab as well for their pets. So it's such an important asset that we have and one of our best uh, services I think we can provide. Yep. And, and I'll add to that too. We talked about all the things that we contract for. There's all the things that we don't contract for that they do anyway. Like I was there at COVID when they had transport trucks full of food 
for whether it's women's shelter or homeless people so they can feed their pets. I mean, they go above and beyond. They never say no. They work so we're, we're lucky to have them. Other cities would love to have them in their in their backyard. I'm, I'm grateful for it. And I look forward to helping on the campaign. I know it'll be a big community drive. People love their pets oftentimes more than people. So I'll just leave that comment there. We've got a motion by Councilor Strange, second by Councilor Patel. All those in favor? Okay, and that's unanimous. And I know I've got Councilor Campbell at home right now, and I'm assuming that was good for you as well. You'll let me know otherwise if you're opposed. Maybe that'll make it easier for you. Okay, now moving on. Um, Mr. Uh, Clerk, you've got another uh, presentation scheduled here. Yeah, thanks, Your Worship. Uh, the next item uh, is PBD 2023-82, and that is a planning services fee review. We have with us today Sean Michael uh, Stefan, a uh, consultant from Watson & Associates, and he'll be making a presentation. Okay, great. Yes. Is that going to be virtual? Yes. Well, okay. He'll uh, move the approve. Okay. Well, we, I think he's presenting first. Uh, for, oh, okay. Yeah, I think he's going to present first, Councillor. We don't have him. Oh, we don't have him? Uh, okay. Well, well we've or got... Just Double check, double check with uh, yes, Mr. I, I, Mr. I, I, I Bryce. Yeah, if you so could. Online, so. Okay. And if not, I think there's a will of council that we're going to support it. So maybe, uh, Mr. Bryce, it's not necessary if, uh, if we can't get him, if he's not online. Uh, so just before we do, so I've got a motion by Councillor Thompson to approve, second by Councillor Strange. Uh, any comments to the motion, Councillor Coco? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I know we're looking at fees that we haven't charged for a while or at all in some cases. I, I really have a challenge with some of the huge increases. Like, for example, the zoning bylaw standard is going from 6,100 to 12,500. That's a huge increase. A uh, common element for the standard was going from 3,000 to 4,300, as that is the base, to 10,600. Um, extension of the subdivision, $1,050 to $2,000. Pre-consult consent from $750 to $1,500. Pre-consult OPA zoning from $750 or $1,500 to $2,900. So some of them I'm really questioning about the, the percentage of the increase. Mm -hmm. Um, it, it states that the fees remain in mid-range for the Niagara region, but I'm wondering how we compare outside of the region. Quite often with everything that we look at, taxes, water, whatever, we always look at the region, but the region tends to be sort of an island of our own, and I'd like to know what else is going on out there. Can anybody comment on those? Yeah, so I'll uh, start with the CAO, and then if Mr. Bryce I'll start, and, and Andrew can uh, follow up. Uh, generally, when you go outside the region, most of the cost, it's a cost allocation process, so they look at what is the tasks that are being undertaken and by who and what is, and the major driving of these costs for planning is salary cost. Um, so um, if all our planners close their ears and put their earmuffs on, outside Niagara region, most of the planners get paid more. Um, so we have competitive pressures uh, trying to attract anyone from Hamilton or Toronto. Uh, and therefore, um, you know, their costs would be higher because their costs, um, their labor costs associated with that would be higher. You know, a municipality can also uh, always choose to subsidize and not get as much cost recovery back uh, on those tasks. Uh, but then that's a shift to the levy at that point in time. So you're trying to balance, you know, levy with uh, fee cost recovery. Um, so the task that, you know, the consultants did on this is reviewing how long does it take to undertake these measures, uh, who's performing those measures, uh, if there are any other costs associated with, uh, uh, with those tasks, and then come up with here's the average cost to undertake the task, and that's how you set your uh, fee based upon that. So generally, if you go outside, um, you know, the, the labor costs are higher outside and their, their fees are higher. Uh, but I'll have Mr. Bryce add anything else on it. Mr. Bryce? Yes, through you, Your, your Worship. Uh, I did uh, check a couple of the fees in the, uh, the Golden Horseshoe area. Some of the fees are significantly higher. City of Toronto and uh, City of uh, Burlington. We're, we're looking at uh, fees of uh, between 16 and 25,000. Uh, for a official plan amendment, uh, those two municipalities are over a hundred thousand for those applications. 
Great, thank you. I know I said this before when we were um, talking about fee structure in Bill 23. We've been told that we need to decrease the cost of how much it, it takes to build a house. And here we are, we're increasing the cost. And I know it should be a cost recovery, the amount of time that we put in. But I feel like we have these conflicting um, ideas about what we're supposed to be doing. Lower the cost so people can build houses to get houses so you can live in them, but yet we need cost recovery. So there's this conflicting, and now we're increasing them again. Um, I had two more questions. Uh, for sing um, um, accessory dwellings in people's backyard, I didn't see any reference on there. So if I was to build a second unit in my backyard, is there anything within this fee schedule that addresses those fees that I don't have to pay for that? Uh, Mr. Bryce? Yes, uh, through you, Your Worship, uh, those fees would be under the mm -hmm. building services. So not within the planning? No. Uh, if you do not need uh, any kind of planning act application, like a zoning bylaw amendment, minor variance, uh, then there would be no fee. Great, thank you. And my last, um, on page 16 of the presentation, it says about removing of the planning policy and approval responsibility for the Niagara region. Um, to my knowledge, and a few residents contacted me, that's not accurate. Can maybe Mr. Bryce talk to me about that, please? Yep, that it will become. <laughs> Mr. Bryce? Yes, uh, yeah, through you, Your Worship, uh, that is, is something coming down from the province. But later, through the mayor, not right now. Yes. Through, through the mayor, it, the bill hasn't uh, been enacted yet, it's been passed, so we're just waiting for the enactment. So uh, everyone is positioning themselves for that. It was anticipated to happen earlier this year, but it's going to happen at some point in time. Okay, thank you. Those are all my questions. And, and it just, uh, if I, just for the indulgence, I understand the councillor's questions with regards to raising fees and trying to do affordable housing. Um, the other big push on, on the fees and some of the cost is uh, speed to application uh, or speed from application to development is what developers uh, were pushing for. Um, we have been successful thus far uh, meeting all our statutory deadlines, which is not seen in other municipalities. Um, most builders would have no problem paying an extra thousand dollars on an application if it speeds up their process by 60 or 90 days because the interest cost on that time delay uh, for major projects is far more significant than the fee. So the big push that the province had, they came in with those deadlines to make sure that um, we weren't incurring uh, holding costs for the developers. Uh, part of that was we had to up staff to meet those uh, speed timelines and part of that now is increase of the planning fee. So it is a trade-off for speed uh, that the developers have and you have to understand that there is that holding cost of inactive land that they're paying interest taxes on that um, is offset by the speed that we can deliver the, uh, the services to the map. Thank you. That led into the question I forgot. We, we have this new ERP system and <coughs> online system that uh, developers can go in and, and put in their plans and submit their applications. So when we looked at the cost of what it cost us in time and staff, were we looking at before the ERP? If we have all of the ERP and the online submissions, wouldn't that time be less with staff and then the cost should be less? Or are we based on old mm -hmm. amount of time? Mr. CAO. Um, through the uh, through the chair, the ERP is not in place, and the ERP won't really affect uh, this. The online submission portal um, um, is now uh, mostly running. Uh, most of the features are running on that. Uh, we can reevaluate it, but most of the time here is analysis by the planning staff. So it doesn't. Uh, their ability to sum submit online is more of a convenience factor and their ability to see our questions or get feedback online, which that feature is yet to be turned on, uh, but, um, uh, but actually won't, you know, won't um, reduce the cost. It'll just allow them not to have to drive down their, their stuff from Toronto and, and that kind of stuff on the plan side. On the planning side, uh, for a lot of these official plan amendments and stuff, uh, the process really won't change as much with uh, with the blue beam technology and that kind of stuff. So, um, you know, in the planning, these fees will get reviewed every five years, so there'll be uh, you know another chance uh, to to review that. But the biggest time for these, when you're doing official plan amendments, it's the planning justification, the review of that, and the coordination between. Um, 
you know multiple departments uh, that's there. So it's you know it's the vast majority of it is just people time reviewing the plans. So the technology helps from a convenience point of view, but doesn't really take away the cost of the time. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, uh, Councillor Patel. Uh, to you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, in our feed schedule, uh, uh, industrial development fees are lowest in the whole region. I'm really happy to see that the, we are charging the lowest building and development fee in the whole region for the industry. And one question I have from Mr. Bryce through you, Mr. Mayor. From pre-consultation application, how many applications go through next stage? Uh, through you, Your Worship, that is a very good question. Um, I don't have a, a figure right now, but uh, I would say it's anywhere between 50 and 75%. Okay. Thank you. So are we increasing the fee for the pre-consultation? Uh, through Your Worship, uh, yes, we're, we're recommending to meet uh, basically cost recovery. So right now we're not achieving cost recovery in many of our applications, including pre-consultations. So with these fee increases, we'll be meeting uh, cost recovery. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Said. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, if there's no further, oh, Councillor Strange. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. And um, through you to Andrew Bryce, you're saying that we're, we're not comparable to other municipalities right now with, with our, our fees? Uh, through you, Your Worship, with the majority of the fees, we are approximately in the middle of the pack in the region. Uh, but if we start to compare with fees outside the region, especially the, uh, the Golden Horseshoe, many of those municipalities, they are significantly higher in their fees. Yeah, and we, we get, as, as the city's growing, we get tons of applications in right now. And I'd rather see it go up than put, uh, you know, add, add to the tax levy and make it pay that way. So with 3% increase, it's gonna have to help the taxpayers. <coughs> okay, thank you for that. Um, all right, so if there's no further comments, we have a motion made by, oh, did you want to speak to it again, Councillor Thompson? Yep. Uh, I was, have the planning fee compares with the region and everything I see this with what we're talking about, we're a middle of or the region and and that's tell the story yeah yep. i very support this okay thank you for that councillor uh councillor lacoco thank you mr mayor just to clarify this is not just a three percent on the fees that we've had there's a bunch of new fees or things have completely doubled and gone past it's not just three percent yeah i don't think who said three percent we're targeting 3% tax levy, so not to push Oh, that. right, right, Thank yeah. you. Uh, did I see another hand? Is there another? Uh, Councillor Newsen? Oh, I'm sorry, Count, uh, Mr. Bryce. Uh, through your worship, I, I wasn't sure whether there was a question, but the 3% uh, recommendation is on top of the recommended fee uh, schedule you see in the study. Uh, and that is basically, uh, the, the study is based on 2023 fees and recommending an additional 3% on those fees to get up to a 2024 uh, cost recovery. Okay. Okay. Yes, Councillor Newsay. And thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just want to make a comment on this. Um, at the end of the day, I listened to Councillor Lococo about the cost. The cost is a cost, so either the developer pays it or the resident pays it. I think at a time like this, um, the resident is, we keep putting a lot of um, taxes on the resident and this is something the developer is obviously going to make money at and I think it should be a fair um, tax so I support this 100% I think it's fair to the resident fair to the developer and it's, it's strictly a cost recovery it's not us making any profit on it so I would definitely support this okay. thank you thank you for that yes Councillor Coco thank you Mr. Mayor just to that point this is not just for developers this is for our residents too when they're building or they're they're applying for things so it's not just for developers it's for our residents as well Yep, it, it, it is, and I don't know if there's a break. Yeah, good. Do you want to speak, Councillor Newstead? Residents, but residents are putting it into their own um, equity, more or less. It's for their own home as well. So it really does come to an individual who's going to benefit from whatever development as opposed to the entire um, tax base. That's the way I see it, unless I'm, I'm misunderstanding that. 
Yeah, and I think you're right. Uh, the objective is cost recovery. Development should pay for development, right? Not be subsidized by the general levy. That's the concept. That's what we're trying to get to. And I get the, the dichotomy that, of course, we want to build more houses, but when you look at the GTA, we're nowhere near their pricing, and they are having a boom there. I was there the other day. I couldn't get over how many cranes are in Mississauga. It's unbelievable. I mean, and they've got very high rates uh, and fees, and they're building like crazy. So I don't know what the holdback is. Land is a lot cheaper here than it is in, in the GTA. Um, okay, so we've got a motion by Councilor. Oh, do you want to speak? Yeah, go ahead, Councilor Patel. Through you, Mr. Mayor, to Mr. Sierra. From our draft plan ex uh, extension fees, uh, if we increase them, does that uh, encourage people to put the shovels in the ground before extension? I just I, well, I think you know. I think I don't think so. Like I think at the end of the day, the the fees will go in, um, in another three percent. If we were, if we were back in May and pushing this forward and saying we're going to do this on January first, twenty twenty four, it might have encouraged people to try to come in before the fee increase. But we're December and we're we're putting these fees up on on January first, so I don't think it'll motivate anybody to to go that quickly. But. Um, uh, you know, I think at the end of the day, um, you know, on the extension, uh, right. as long as uh, as long as council doesn't waive it, because sometimes developers will come to ask for a waiver or extension on some of those, uh, then yeah, it should motivate them to, uh, you know, come on time with the building, because that has been something that's been plaguing us, is that we have these great plans that right. no one actually built. Mm -hmm. So we're hoping that it 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 does, but. Uh, we've seen council defer some of those sometimes. Okay, thank you. Sorry for putting you in this. No problem. Thank you. All right, let's get this vote going on. So, motion by Councillor Thompson, seconded by I already forgot who seconded it. Was it Councillor Councillor Patel? Okay. All right, we'll call the vote. All those in favor? Okay. Opposed? Okay. One opposed. All right. Moving on, um, Mr. Kirk. We have uh, this is my my part, right? Isn't it? Uh, yes, Your Worship. Uh, we are on to your proposed draft 2024 water and wastewater budget. And I believe our Director of Finance, Tiffany Clark, uh, will provide a presentation to Council. Yeah. So we'll ask uh, Ms. Clark if she'll uh, lead us through this presentation. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, okay, so we're going to look at the 2024 uh, mayor's proposed uh, water wastewater budgets. It is a two-tiered system. Uh, so the region's responsible for parts, the city is responsible for certain elements. Uh, I'll give you a little highlight and summary of the rebate programs we include, uh, as well as the proposed rates, the impact on the users, and then the recommendation to uh, deem the budgets adopted as of today, uh, with proposed rates effective January 1st, 2024. So this is just a little snapshot of what the region does for us. They're responsible for water wastewater treatment facilities and pumping stations. They're responsible for part of our water network in our city. Oh, this went too fast there, sorry about that. They're responsible for the sewers that um, span over um, municipal boundaries. And then they're a co-contributor to our capital projects via their CSO program, which I believe they have actually put on hold for this year. Um, and then their rate structure, they charge us 100% fixed cost for wastewater and 75% variable and 25% fixed for water. And then moving forward to our responsibilities. So city council is the management authority. Uh, we maintain and replace the utility infrastructure. Um, this is done by our operations staff. And then our finance staff do billing and collection. We're responsible for directly charging the residents for their usage. And we provide customer service to the rate payers. Um, looking at the water budget at a glance, uh, summed up, you can see uh, broken into the two columns. So the region uh, in 2024 is responsible, or 47% of the costs are from the region. So this is the amount we owe to the region uh, for the, their services, the treatment, as I mentioned. Um, and then 53% is city costs. So the increase from 2023 to 2024, the region's costs increased by 889,000 and the city's costs have increased by 423,000. So breaking that increase apart, the region's responsible for 68% of that increase while the city's responsible for 32% of that increase. Um, with the overall increase being the 1.3 uh, million and that's just on the water budget side. Moving to wastewater, that gets a little bit uglier. Um, the 
Total increase in wastewater is $4 million, and 92% of that is um, from the region uh, increasing their costs. So the region's responsible for 3.7 million of that increase, while the city costs of, uh, we're requesting go up by 302,000 or 8%. Um, so this year in 2024, you can see it's quite a jump from 2023, where um, 23, the region made up 56% of our total budget. Now in 24, they make up 60% of our total budget on the wastewater side. And then this is just looking at them combined. So adding the two wastewater, wastewater budgets together, overall you've got a $5.3 million increase. Uh, city staff have requested a $725,000 increase, which is about 14% of the total increase, whereas the region's costs uh, equate to $4.6 million, or 86% of the overall combined increase on both water, wastewater. And then overall combined, the region um, costs make up 54% of, of the total cost of those two budgets. So this is just looking, I'll get into more detail later on in the slides about what the rates look like, but at a quick glance after giving you uh, the news of, of what the increase looks like, I just wanted to point out, even with our proposed rates, which you'll see later on, we are still maintaining uh, essentially the same positions that we had last year um, in comparison to our, our neighboring municipalities. Um, you'll notice there's 10 municipalities there. Wayne Fleet doesn't have a water system and Grimsby charges their wastewater fixed charge on their property tax bill, so it's not an accurate comparison to use them. Um, so we are um, below the average uh, and we are in the same positions we were last year. This is comparing our 2024 rates to um, the other municipalities' 2023 rates, so it does not even include their increases that they'll have in 24. Then just looking at the water budget expenses in just slightly more detail, um, you can see I said the region increase was about 889000 That's made up in those two first two lines there, the volumetric charge going up 7.4% from the region and the fixed charge also going up 7% from the region. Um, the city, we reduced our debt placeholder, so that's the uh, placeholder that was that's in place for Montrose, Bigger, Rexinger Road reconstruction as well as the um, Rexinger Water Main Loop. Um, we just uh, reduced our estimate based on the uh, interest rate uh, we're anticipating. And then overall, our city costs were going up about 522000 uh, So in that cost increases, there's a small increase in materials, and there's three new positions requested. And we'll get into that a little bit more later. And then our non-rate revenue, you're just seeing that uh, small decrease there in relation to those debt placeholders. So the debt placeholder decreased as well as the DC contribution to it. Looking uh, just a quick glance at the assets. So because the increase was quite large from the region, I didn't even try to increase our transfer to capital. Um, it's staying the same as it was last year, which was 6.1 million in the water budget, which is short 2.76 million as compared to what our asset management plan says we should be at. Um, so it's just something to keep in mind. We will have to work at increasing that in the future. I, I don't want to go two years in a row without increasing it, but uh, I took a little break this year. So in the water budget, as I said, um, the city costs, the ones we control at least, um, we are asking for three new staff members. Um, we do feel these are required. So there's a new compliance approval. It's the Municipal Consolidated Linear Infrastructure Environmental Compliance Approval, which is a mouthful, um, acronym CLIECA. In a nutshell, it's a single approval for all sewage work components of a municipal sewage collection system or a municipal stormwater management system. So these changes essentially serve to treat the stormwater and sanitary systems similar to the regulations that we already have in place for our drinking water system. So the MECP, which is the Ministry of Environment, Conservation and Parks, has now modeled the wastewater sector similar to the drinking water sector where there will now be inspections, approvals and licensing and sanitary and storm systems will now require more tracking, tracing, monitoring and reporting. Some of these um, regulations came into place during June 2023 and some are being phased in in 2024. Uh, so as a result, we feel these three positions are necessary to accommodate that as well as you'll see later on another one in the wastewater budget. And then just a quick note on the debt placeholders. Um, there is a debt placeholder amount of 701,000 and 672,000 of that's offset by development charges um, because it is related to growth and that's the, the Montrose Bigger Rexinger project that I talked about. So the net impact of the placeholder is about $28,000. <coughs> Sorry, just looking quickly at our rebate program. So we do still have our senior water account rebate. Um, 
We received 140, or sorry, 1,044 applications in 2023 were approved. Um, in addition, we've got our high water consumption adjustment, so that has a budget of um, 35,000, and to date we've um, given adjustments of 25,000. And then our sod watering rebate, we've got a budget of about 2,000. So far, we've uh, rebated uh, 1,980. I will say um, we wouldn't turn people down in the event that um, we did run out of budget room on these applications. We would look to, to fund any differences with reserves. So water waste water budgets, so looking at those in more detail, um, the biggest hit is obviously the region at the top there. Uh, the increase is 3.7 million or 22.5% uh, as compared to 2023. Um, didn't I, you can see the next line? I didn't increase the transfer to capital here either. The debt placeholder uh, is new this year. It's, uh, it has to do with councils in your approval to add funds to the Montrose Bigger Rex in your project. But again, DCs are offsetting a bulk of this cost. And then on the city side, our costs actually went down by 42,000, and that's largely due to um, pumping station uh, electricity bills were now moved over to the region. And then on the non-rate revenue, you're seeing an increase there of 938,000. A big reason for that is um, we are proposing to use $500,000 of our wastewater rate stabilization reserve to offset some of the regional increase, um, just to bring it down just a little bit there. So overall in the wastewater expenditures, as I said, it didn't increase the transfer to capital. It's still 6.5 million. It is shy of our asset management target, which as of our 2022 plan was 7.13 million. Um, arguably you'd have to inflate that by two years to see what our, our true cost is. So it, it is shy. Um, we will need to work on increasing this in the future, but we're taking a little holiday this year. And then our wastewater expenditures, um, the wastewater compliance analysts, uh, same, same spiel as the water side. It, it has to do with that new legislation from the project, uh, from the province around um, sanitary and stormwater systems. And then just a little note on our debt placeholders, the net impact there is 69,000. And another note about the reserve money uh, that we plan to use to reduce the impact to the uh, rate payer. I will say I did include there in the small text the bullet on the bottom, if council wish to remove that reserve, if you don't wish to use reserves, um, it would add about $10 a year to the average um, user of, of our rate system. So that would be using about 175 cubic meters a year. So that's the impact of um, using the $500,000 reserve funds. Looking at our rebate programs within the wastewater, uh, we've just got the weeping tile removal assistant program. So in 2023, we had 52 applications approved. Um, and the, the program is remaining the same for 2024 with the exception of um, we will now be paying the homeowner directly and not the contractor directly. So what do our rates look like after all that? Um, our fixed rates going up uh, for water about $7.80 where the volumetric is going up $0.08 cents. for wastewater it's going up $28.44. Um, so overall fixed, fixed costs going up $36 a year and the volume metrics going up uh, about 28 cents. Looking just at our meter system, you can see the different meter sizes and how many um, accounts we have. So 96% of our system is made up of, from the 583 quarters meter, which is the kind of meter you find in your residential home, like a small convenience store, um, smaller commercial enterprises. So that's most of our system, and that's the one I'm gonna focus on when I do an impact for you. So we'll do an impact of a low average and high user. So this is kind of your idea, let's say a family of four. You'd have 175 cubic meters a year if you're an average user, 275 if you're a high user, and 85 if you're a low user. So what does that look like? For the low user there on the left, their annual bill would go up from $802 to $862. That's an increase of $60 a year or $5 a month. On your average user, your bill's going up from $1,057 to $1,142, increasing $85 a month, or, or sorry, a year or $7 a month. And then your high user is going up from uh, $1,340 to $1,452. It's an increase of $112 a year or $9 a month. Just a reminder, after all of that, um, this is where we still land, uh, like I said, where we were before uh, as compared to our neighboring municipalities. And we are still below the average. 
And then just looking at the fixed charges, so we do have other meters other than the 5H three quarters, so uh, the monthly charge for those fixed meters uh, are going up as, as indicated in the chart. And then just a little plug to our dashboard. We have a dashboard you can sign up for where you can pay your bill online, you can view your statistics online, and as of November 30th, we've got 10,964 people signed up. And then I did throw the rep I did ugh, sorry I did throw the recommendations into the slideshow, but they are also on the report on your agenda. There is a companion report that has a lot more detail on the budget variances, um, and I believe it's linked right under under or above the presentation. So, is there any questions? Just before we started, so I'm just asking Ms. Carter, microphone. Oh, sorry, thank you. Uh, give me a summary. So that was an awful lot of detail. <laughs> Break it down into some, just a, a few basic uh, points if you could. And think, then I'm gonna go to questions. Yeah, I think the two basic points are there, the increase of 5.3 million is related to cost passed down from the region and this new provincial legislation. So the city's increase is, is essentially around the provincial legislation and that's why we've asked for the four new positions and the region increase, it, it just is what it is. Those are the costs that get passed down from the region that we must absorb. And now uh, we've gone significantly more toward the region where we were before we were more around the 50-50 mark. Now we're nowhere near that mark, especially with wastewater, I believe it was. Yes. So it's really skewed. So um, any, it, did you want to address that at all? Or are you concerned about that? Or if that's a trend, uh, any insight into that? <laughs> I do believe, so the regional fixed charges are made up of two things. There's the fixed charge that they pass on to us and then there's this true up they do. So their fixed charge is based on three years of your average flows. So in this case it would have been 2021 20, and, or sorry, 21, 22, 20, 23. Um, I think about June to June. Then they figure out what you actually used during the year and they do a true up and you either had an underpayment or an overpayment. Well, in our case, we have so many hotels out there that during the three years I just discussed were offline because of COVID, our three-year average is very skewed. So not only did we face a 14% increase on the fixed charges from the region on the wastewater side, we also faced a $1.2 million underpayment that was added to those fixed charges, which then made the increase from the region 22%. And so long as that three-year average is capturing COVID years, we're going to continue to have this underpayment that gets added to our fixed charges. There's really nothing we can do about it. It just it is, is what it is, uh, unless they want to change how they do their average. But in any event, they're always going to do the true up. So the cost will be the cost. Um, now that we are building in the underpayment, when we get the one in 2023 right now, it's trending to a $1.3 million underpayment. So we'll at least have some of that built in now with the 2024 budget, and it won't be as drastic. Um, in terms of the region, I, I, like I said, it is. They, they get to decide what they need to fund their system sustainably, and if that's what they feel they need as an increase to get there, then we must pay it. <laughs> but the skewed part should write itself and correct itself now that the further we get away from COVID and those yes. numbers. Yes, yeah. yeah, I do expect that true up eventually to swing the other way back to, you typically we usually have an overpayment and we're getting a bit of a refund on our, our next year's um, fixed costs. But I don't expect that to rectify itself ne uh, next year, maybe the next year, I'm not sure yet. Hmm? Oh, the, the reserve? Yeah, we're, and we're, I said we're using the $500,000 of our wastewater rate stabilization reserve to um, mitigate some of that true up cost, but in reality, I either pull that out next year and we absorb the rest of the true up or we leave it in for two years and then you're in for a million dollars. I will say our wastewater stabilization reserve is one of our much healthier ones. It's 4.36 million right now. So it can certainly handle the $500,000. But again, if council isn't comfortable using the reserve money, we take that out and the average bill increases uh, $10 for the year. That's great, thank you, appreciate that. So I saw some hands, I saw Councillor Patel, Councillor Baldinelli, Councillor Lacoco, so far. Through you, Mr. Mayor, to Ms. Clark. The chart you showed about us about the different cities and different prices, why is the price so different? The price difference, why is that? There's many factors. So not we are a 60-40 system, 60% 60 of our charge is variable, 40% is fixed. Some are much different. For example, Port Coburn up there at the top of the list, they have a 100% fixed wastewater charge. Um, Welland, I believe, does 25% uh, 
fixed, yeah, 75% variable. Lincoln, um, I thought I made a mistake on Lincoln there. See, on the low, Lincoln's at the bottom. They climb to the middle in the, in the average user, and they climb up. It's because they have a very high variable rate. So the more consumption you use, the higher you jump on the list. So we're 60-40, which is exactly what BMA Consulting said we should be in our last rate study, which was done in 2021. So we're where we need to be in terms of fixed and variable costs. And I guess you could say it's not really an apples to apples comparison to every municipality. This is the reality of what their bills are, but not everybody's a 60-40 split like we are. So when it comes to wastewater, uh, wastewater budget, we are just the middlemen, right? We're just buying water from the region. Whatever price we get, that's what we have to give it to our residents. We don't have any much lane way in there to change it, do we? Uh, well, so from wastewater, we're controlling 40% of the cost. Right. The region's controlling 60. And then on the water side, we're controlling 53% of the cost. The region's controlling 47%. But I would agree, the cost the region passes on, we have no say in, uh, other than voting for it at, at regional mm -hmm. council. We don't have a, a, a say in that. We just must absorb it. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Councilor Baldinelli. Through you, Mayor, maybe you can expand on what you heard at regional council as to why the rates are so high. Well, we've uh, we've heard some concerns in in waste in the waste department uh, with increased um, expenses, and we understand fixed costs because fixed costs, because if you don't fix them now, you're gonna have problems down the road. But uh, that's been, I've heard a number of counselors asking a lot of questions about what's going on in the wastewater department. So uh, we're hoping to get some more answers on why that number has uh, spiked at the region. So there are definitely some concerns. And, to, and through you, Mayor, uh, I guess, so during COVID, uh, our fixed costs are actual buildings, piping, is that your fixed cost versus variable cost usage? I don't know, Mr. Nickel, did you want to, those, we're getting into municipal work questions. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Mayor. So I think we want to be careful not to confuse the cost that we get from the user. So the fixed uh, revenue we get is whether you use water or not, you're paying a fixed revenue portion, and that is, I think, 60% of, of the contribution from your bill. 40% of the overall contribution we estimated is from your actual usage. And that re does actually reference approximately what our costs are to run the system, because even if you don't use the water, we still need to make sure it's clean and the facilities are maintained so that it's safe to use when you want to use it. I was looking more on the uh, uh, three, uh, on the wastewater side of it. Uh, you know, they said that during COVID, uh, usage went down. Is it a, do we not pay for usage or uh, we pay you know, based on what we didn't use, what we should be using, because the plant continues to run. I just want to know why, if it goes down and usage goes down, why does our bill go down? And then when it goes up, why don't we just pay more? What do we do for over and for, for stormwater access that in, infiltrates and then, you know, produces more volume? Do we pay for that? And why do we pay for it? And et cetera, like that. So people understand why those changes are happening. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor. Um, the wastewater system, uh, as built by the region, is if we think of it like one piece of the, or one pie, right? And if we take a smaller piece of the pie because we're sending less sewer, um, you know, wastewater to the, the treatment plants, all of the rest of those elements of the pie have to be get redistributed to the other ten users of the pie. So. Maybe the pie is not the greatest example, but the pie doesn't get larger or smaller. It stays the same, and so it just our portions go up and down because the region's cost to deliver wastewater services are fixed regardless of how much water or wastewater passes through their treatment plants. So um, the fairest way for the region to distribute those costs is to say, well, Niagara Falls used 20% of the service of their overall $80 million fixed costs, so Niagara Falls will pay 20% of $80 million. If we use less, everyone else in the region use, pays more. If they use um, less, we pay more. And so we're, we're really not in control of that slice of the pie um, because if others are using less, we're paying more. And if we're, um, you know, if we're in a good year but everyone else is in a good year, we net out pretty much the same as everyone else. So it's a, it's, it's, um, a, because it's a 100% fixed system cost to the region, we don't have the ability to um, increase or decrease based solely on usage, our costs, that is. 
I'll throw you, it confuses me a little bit for the rate payers. Um, you know, even though you had COVID, probably stayed in the house more, you probably used your washrooms more. Why, what is the difference between usage before COVID, during COVID, and after COVID that would require such an increase if, if it's a, a use-based system, rate pay system, and you have hotels that are not being um, using their flushing as much as they used to before, then the rates should go down for them. And why would the rates go up for anybody else later? Forecasted models versus now you have more people coming and staying. And that's the confusion I get. I don't know if Tiffany or you can answer it because the taxpayer or the rate payers want to know is they didn't change their, their usage. Why is the bill going up so much for them? And what did COVID have to do with it all? Yeah, so through you, Mr. Mayor, um, the city of Niagara Falls actually benefited from overpayments for a number of years. So when our hotels were not using them, our actual flows were much less than what the three-year average would have been. And for example, the underpayment, sorry, the overpayment in the last year's budget was about 301,000. Before that, it was in the million dollar <coughs> range. So it just fluctuates based on, like I said, they've got this three-year average, but they base it on today's flows. So when your three-year average is part of the COVID years, well, it's going to be too low for what we're actually going to use. But when our three-year average during COVID was based on the three years before COVID, well, our actual uses was much less, basically because of our hotels. Does that, does that address it? Okay, yeah, Mr. CAO is gonna try to give it a shot. I know it's con it is confusing, it's confusing. <coughs> if, uh you know, if they build you at a assumed lower rate because they use a three-year average and they just assumed that that your prior use was going to be your existing use. So during COVID, they, the prior three years of that, you had high usage. So they build you at that during COVID, but you never used it. So you got the refund during COVID. But now, now your actual usage has gone down, and now when your usage is now higher, they're billing you based upon that lower artificial one, and therefore when you get trued up, the cost comes back up again. So it, it swings. We're just on the bad side of the swing at this point in time. It'll level out in two years' time back to, you know, as long as the usage is there. But they, what they try to do is they try to use a three-year average because what they don't want is small fluctuations uh, jumping your bill up and down. It wasn't really ever anticipated that a global event like COVID would happen and make these massive swings. It was always around trying to take a three-year average of cost with marginal increases and decreases in, in usage and trying to smooth that out. The challenge when you have these big swings, it, it creates this kind of um, carry-on effect on, on the billing. So we overpaid during COVID, now we're underpaying. And what happens is when they true it up, you have the bill to pay. We're gonna stretch it out a little bit with the use of our reserves and try to have an additional smooth on the, uh, on the fee. I try to use a food analogy, but I won't bother. Councilor Baldinelli. I still get a little confused. I think most residents might be. So my usage is based on water. So which that's is, broken out which, into which two. Is, which is measured because there's we all have we all have meters. Well, there's the, the meter is only part of it. There's right. fixed that whether you turn the tap on or not, that. you're getting billed. And just for clarity, Ms. Clark, what percentage is that? The fixed. The fixed costs are forty percent. It's forty percent is fixed. Sixty percent is variable. Okay. <laughs> and and the plants also know their volumes that they they produce or or, or treat every day as well so i'm not understanding the three-year average on recovery when i'm being billed and you're being billed and everybody's being billed on usage charges today based on flow rates that you're taking and i understand the fixed part of it i'm just talking about everything is like when i go pay for gas it's a dollar 32 a liter and i put it in and it's a dollar 32 a liter based on doesn't matter so if everything is measured why do we have fluctuations in averages Mr. CAO. Yeah, I'll, I'll start and uh, Ms. Clark can. Um, the reason they use a average rate for that three year time is this, the, the region doesn't know how much use you're gonna actually have this year. So they set their rate based upon a predicted amount. That predicted amount to charge you is based upon your last three years of actual usage. 
right? So when they're setting the rate for this year for you to pay for your usage this year, they don't actually know how much you're gonna use or how little you're gonna use. And so they have to predict an average amount. They use the three year average to put that forward. Uh, if their three year average is substantially off base, that's why you get these uh, variations. Um, and, and that's you know that's how the region tries to bill it out because otherwise you would end up having to adjust every year you know your your bill true up to actual that's why we true it up with a three year or the region trues it up with a three year average so the, you know that's they have to make a guess of how much usage is going to be because their most of their cost is fixed no matter what like whether you wire your line 10 times or don't wire your line, the actual cost of production and all that stuff is fairly fixed in the region system. Um, it doesn't vary all that much. Um, but if water usage goes down <laughs> tremendously, it's not like they're laying off people in their water system. Their costs still stay the same. So their costs have to be absorbed to, through what was actually used. And that's why this three year average and catch up period uh, happened. So, um, so over a five year period, you'll get charged for what you used based upon the cost, but it, it requires time for that three year average to work itself out. So that's the best way to, that's the best way I can explain it. Hey, Councillor. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Lococo. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I was wondering, looking at this chart, um, Ms. Clark was, ex was explaining about the differences between fixed and variable. What is St. Catharines? St. Catharines is um, less expensive than us. What is their model? Th through, through the mayor yep. to Ms. Clark. Yep. She's looking it up. Are they doing something differently? Like when you look at sometimes things are cheaper when you have more more people, a bigger system, it ends up being cheaper. And I'm just wondering why um, they're they're um, less expensive. Yeah, more critical mass. Yeah. You're suggesting. Three, Mr. Mayor. I don't know what St. Catharines breakdown is off the top of my head, um, but they would have more customers than us as well. Mm -hmm. But um, we can try to look on their website and see if we can find what okay, their breakdown you. is. Okay, thank you. They would also have more customers on a more condensed area, so they actually would have, uh, my guess is if you look at their total urban pipe system, it's probably more compact than our urban pipe system is. Just like we have more road kilometers than they have road kilometers. So my guess is they have less pipe kilometers than we do too, okay. which impacts our local cost. Ms. Clark did so well, she, she gave all of the other percentages of the other yeah. ones, so I was really focused on St. Catharines, so that was good. Some of my other questions have been answered here. Um, I, I guess I just want to confirm, when we were looking at the combined city and region, waste and wastewater, the region is going up 86% and the city is going up 14%. So the CAO wanted to... If that's, if that's the one chart, I believe. Yeah. If that's, yeah, this, that's, it's not going up 86%, it's 86% of the increase is related to the regional increase, 14% of the increase is related to regional, or uh, city increases. Okay. So that 86 is not what's going up, it's the percentage of oh, okay. the increase itself. Okay, okay thank you. And um, I don't have any other questions, but I'll have some comments later. Okay. Thank you. Uh, any other questions of council on the water wastewater budget? Welcome, Councilor Peter Angel. Yeah, Councilor Peter Angel. Yeah, thanks, Your Worship. Um, oh, Ms. Clark went to the actual slide. Um, <laughs> Your Worship, I just wanted to point something out on the slide. So at the bottom of the slide, you, you'll see Niagara Region, it says 54%. City of Niagara Falls says 46%. That, that's just in terms of the amount that we collect as opposed to what the region collects when people pay their bills. That's correct? Well, let's uh, ask. It's more clear. or less, it, it's not exactly the amount we collect, but of the total um, budgets, which right. would include some non-rate revenue, we control 46% and they control 54%. Right, but when you look at the, uh, but when you look at the very last, I guess, line in the tables that you have there, in terms of regional cost versus city cost, I, I, I think what staff are trying to point out is that for every dollar increase this year uh, in the water wastewater budget, the region, because of the amount that they've increased, are getting 86 cents out of that dollar, and the city is only getting 14 cents. So when people's water and wastewater bills go up this year, 
86 percent of that increase is going to be going to the region. Is that correct? Ms. Clare? Through you, Mr. Mayor, I believe that would be a correct assessment okay. of the I, increased portion. I just want to be able to answer people, Your Worship, because mm -hmm. we, always, we always field questions as to why are the services going up, and, and it, you know, it's helpful to be able to say that, you know, well, 86% of your increase is attributed to the region, so um, perhaps they can contact the regional counselors this time. Thank you for that, Counselor. Uh, to, yes, Counselor Newestay. Through you, Mr. Mayor, to the CEO. So basically what I'm understanding, um, can you hear me? There's nothing we can do about this budget. It is what it is. There's, um, we can't control the region. We can't control anything we do other than our own personal consumption. So if a taxpayer said to us, why is this like this? We don't have control over this. It's just, I'm just trying to understand this. It is what, we, what we're dealing with. We can't do anything with respect to the region. Um, I, I appreciate, and I do want to make another point where that we're using um, reserves. People say, about what do we do with the casino, the OLG money? We are using it in this case to help um, offset some of that that cost. But really, am I no. miss? No. No, no, no OLG money. Oh, Just our reserve. There is reserve. Okay, reserve. Sorry, but anyway, at the end, my question is: there is nothing we can do regarding these, but this budget, correct? We can't change anything. We can't alter it. We can't. Um, do anything to reduce it. Okay. Uh, that's pretty much correct. We cannot alter the regional charge. Um, and then the biggest source of the increase of our city budget relates to uh, downloading from the province of certain responsibilities that we have to hire staff for. Um, so we can't change that. We have a legal obligation to meet those requirements. Um, we did give the option to council to use $500,000 of reserve. Um, as staff, we thought $500,000 was an appropriate amount because it is likely that we would have to use additional reserve next year so we can kind of cushion, uh, it, we know it's gonna take three years to cushion it. Um, so we didn't want to do uh, more of that. If you wanted to use less reserve, that's something a that council can have, take the full impact this year, pass on more of an increase to uh, the, the rate pairs, um, or you could choose to use more reserve also to try to cushion it more. The only caution we have is, you know, you have to be careful because you're just kicking that can down the road. So we wanted to do something that we know that we could kind of cushion it over a three-year period of time. Which is still not reducing anything. It's just kind of we're cushioning it. Reducing saying, it a little but, bit, yeah. But, it's, but we're taking it from reserve. So it's we're not really, it from, we're not able to go in there and say, okay, let's just cut our expenses here. They no, are what they are is what I'm understanding. They are, they are what they are. With water, as this council knows, and it has had an education session on it, uh, councillors are, have obligations under, uh, under the legislation to ensure, um, you know, to ensure safe drinking water and, and uh, a functioning wastewater system. Um, you know, what I will say is regionally, um, I don't want this to be a beat up on the region uh, thing. You know, the, their obligations under the act is, is very significant and uh, I remember when I was commissioner at the region, um, I would talk to the my public works uh, counterparts and you know, he said, Burgess, it's simple. Uh, you know, in most other places you let the water go downhill in the region, we have to pump it a lot uphill and moving things around the escarpment. Uh, it's great to go and see when water falls over or uh, the one part of the escarpment, uh, but uh, for uh, for engineers, moving water uphill is difficult and expensive, and that's the uh, challenge with it. We also have a lot of customers over a, a wide geographic area, which also adds to the uh, cost to it. So, um, so you know, I think the region is trying to do their best to maintain their system. Um, as this council knows too, we have a, um, I think the most expensive uh, project in region in the region's history being scheduled for a wastewater treatment plant in to support Niagara Falls. Um, so, you know, I, I think it's it is what it is. I, I don't, you know, I think the region uh, is trying to also be reasonable with their rates that they have, but they do have their challenges that they have to pass on to uh, to us. And just you touched on the point that we all took that education session regarding uh, safe water and that was quite, um, although we know about the Walkerton, but really understanding the impact that bad, like if water is, is contaminated, residents get sick, 
um, they, everything happens. They, they can get sick, they can die, and even they were saying how property values will go down because nobody would even want to live there if there's ever a contamination of anything. So um, we have to pay for clean water whether we like it or not because that's such an important aspect of our life. Through you, Mr. Mayor, to piggyback on what Councillor Newstake said, 86% increases from the region and 14% increase per city, that includes the three positions that are, those are mandated by the province on the city, right? Four position. So the, this budget is actually set for us. There's not much wiggle room we have. I just want residents to know why we are approving the budget. Yeah, yeah that's correct. It's, when you take out those four positions, you got inflationary cost pressures on our normal supplies and our existing wages, and that's it. Uh, in fact, in theory, it should be a bit higher. We're, we're reducing it by 500. We're recommending, and it's in here, we're reducing it by $500,000 this year. So, and, oh yeah, no capital. And we're not, and we're deferring uh, what should be a capital, uh, uh, some savings towards our capital replenishment program. We just, we decided to defer that because it, they are significant increases. So, uh, so when we said that $10 per household goes up per month, so from that ten dollars, eight dollars and forty cents goes to the region, basically. Eight dollars sixty cents. Yeah. Eight dollars sixty cents. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, when when Councillor Newistig asked if we could change anything on the budget, there were two things that um, I think that we could look at at doing differently. Um, one is not just us at council, but us in general, uh, residents, and when we're developing, um, a lot of environmentalists have put out a, a new um, graphic showing one inch of rain and that if that one inch of rain goes in one acre of forest or wetlands, only 750 gallons goes off runoff into the sewers that we end up paying for to be treated. If it's not going into a forest or wetland and it's going on a parking lot, let's say, uh, 27,000 gallons of runoff goes in the sewer. So we end up paying for all of that treatment of the water. So from a council perspective, we can be looking at permeable surfaces, um, changing away some of the developments that we do internally if we're building something, or when we're talking to developers that they use permeable surfaces. So it is something that we can do, and then the, your costs start going down. Permeable, permeable surfaces are much more expensive at the beginning. There's um, a, a more a heftier charge at the beginning, but then you start uh, reducing your costs later on that you're not paying to treat all of that water that's just running down. And I did have the opportunity to talk to our municipal work system to find out about our sewer separations. Approximately right now, we have about 14 to 15% of our sewers that are com um, combined. So the water's going in the, the sewer and we have to pay for it. Compared to a separated sewer, you have your water, water and your wastewater. So there are things that we can do. And the other thing that I was looking at was the debt of the um, Montrose bigger re uh, reconstruction. That was our commitment for the hospital. And again, everybody can, can say that we need the hospital and we definitely do. I've always said about the dollar amount that we're committing, the dollar amount that we committed to the hospital and the dollar amount that we committed to the reconstruction. So if that was removed, that debt is in this budget. So those are two things that I see that we could be doing differently. So th those are two of my comments. Are you saying not build the hospital? No, I didn't say that. <laughs> I said the commitment, the dollar amount that we committed to the hospital. In the, in, in the financial commitment to the hospital and the amount of money that we are taking on for infrastructure costs. I did not say do not build the hospital. No, but I, my concern about that last comment is you're suggesting what we could do to keep the cost down is if we didn't have that infrastructure, that's there to service the hospital. And, and this council clearly strongly supports the hospital and that infrastructure. So I don't think it's really an option. No, it's not an option now. We, we made that decision. We're not going back on it. It's not an option, but we could have done something differently to keep the cost down. If you didn't support the hospital. hospital. I, I, don't, I don't support that comment at all. So uh, I do support the hospital, but not the dollar amount that we contributed. I don't know how you do that, but thank you. I don't know how. You, but, uh, and I agree with the permeable solutions, and the biggest thing is water and sewer separation. That's the biggest thing. We're treating rainwater. We're putting it through our, our, our filtration systems, and that's the biggest waste. That's the biggest 
cost in front of us. And every day, every year, uh, Mr. Nickel, and uh, what, when do you figure we'll actually have everything separated in the city based on this budget uh, and the capital budget we just approved? When do you think, like what approximately? Yeah, thanks, Mr. Mayor. I'll have more line of sight when we finish our master plan, but it's, um, it's 25 years plus at this rate. It's significant cost because these are large trunk, diameter trunk sewers. And this, the new storm sewers we need to build need to go into outlets, which is primarily our um, hydro canal, which is deep and challenging to get access to. And, and we have to pay OPG a fee to drain into that canal. So it's expensive, it's time consuming, and it's disruptive, but it's important that we continue to fund it and do it. And it's even more important that we look at that as a corridor where we're doing the water main, the sewer, the road, the curbs in those areas, yeah. which are likely needing it anyways. But again, we'll have more line of sight on that coming forward to 2025 capital budget. Awesome, thank you. Uh, any other questions on the water wastewater uh, budget? So Ms. T Ms. Clark, if I could just ask, so what's the overall increase then? I mean, we've got a lot of numbers here and year over year, but what is the actual percentage increase? Uh, if you're looking at the average bill for the average user that uses 175 cubic meters a year, or even the low and the high, it's, it's around 8%. Yeah, around 8%? Yeah. Okay. Uh, it was... Yeah, for that same average user. Mm -hmm. For the average user, $7 a month or $84 a year. Okay. And that's about an 8% increase on their, their prior year bill. Okay. And, and to that point, it would yeah. be $94 a year if we didn't use the $500,000 in reserve? Correct. Okay, thank you. Soften the blow a little bit. Okay, uh, do we have a motion yet? That was too quick? No. So we're looking for a move by Councillor Strange, second by Councillor Neustag, that we move the recommendations, and you'll see in your notes there are five <laughs> recommendations, uh, and you've heard the presentation. We'll call the vote. All those in favor? Okay. Opposed? with one opposed. Okay, um, so now we are gonna be going in camera. So I need uh, the clerk, well, I'll let maybe better you explain it, Mr. Clerk. Uh, yes, we do have two motions or two um, uh, resolutions to go in camera. Uh, the first one is just to recognize the fact that on January 15th, uh, council will be holding an in-camera session uh, for an education session or a Q&A on the operating budget. Uh, we will not be meeting in person between now and then, so it would be best to make sure that we did that publicly in today's session. And then the second resolution would be to go in camera for the items listed on today's agenda for a camera meeting. Okay, motion by Councillor Patel. You move in them both, second by Councillor Thompson. All those in favor? Okay, so we're, not gonna, we're now gonna go in camera, folks. We'll be back uh, as long as it takes us to deal with these couple of matters. I'd say probably, I'm guessing 20 minutes. Is that about to half an hour, Mr. Clerk, or do you think it'll be more? Uh, my crystal ball suggests a little longer. A Little longer, so it's a good chance to hit the bathroom if you like, and uh, we'll be back as soon as we're finished. Thank you.
All right, everybody, welcome back. We just concluded our in-camera meeting. We're now ready to start back in open session. Um, Mr. Clerk, I believe we are at the report section of the agenda. Is that right? Okay, so um, anyone following along on the agenda, we're at section seven. So first up is 7.1 CAO 2023-07, land acknowledgement opinion. There are three recommendations in the report. Uh, Councillor Lococo. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I talked with Brian Kahn, the gentleman who um, brought this report, and he would like to point out in what he considers an error. The word First Nations is excluding Inuit and Métis. It would be correct to use the word Indigenous rather than First Nations. Okay. Um, it, it's uh, two, two different times within the report. Okay, no, you said he didn't do this report. No, he didn't do the report, but he has, oh, sorry, he, he brought the motion from the diversity, e uh, equity, and inclusion to this council, and that's why he's involved. He brought the motion here. This report that's in front of us, the word First Nations, in his um, opinion, is incorrect. It should be Indigenous, because First Nations is excluding the Métis and Inuit. Okay, so I'm just going to ask our CAO, because I know you're involved in this, um, did you want to, like, do we have, did this go through our legal channels, Mr. CAO? Yeah, through the, uh, through the mayor to uh, council and councillor, we did have legal review take, take a look at this, and I know there, there is debate with regards to uh, uh, what they call um, in community uh, indigenous uh, individuals and how do you treat them in, uh, in your acknowledgement and and and, uh, and with outreach, you know, at this point in time, we've <coughs> undertaken the review um, with, you know, with our outside legal counsel um, on, on the matter, and you know, I, I you know, and, and counsel did receive uh, did receive uh, commentary from from outside legal counsel in uh, in closed session. Uh, so, you know, I could postpone this report. I can go back and check with legal counsel. I'd just be cautious of, you know, uh, of changing it right now after I've already had a legal review done on it. So if, if counsel wants to check that, I can certainly check and I can bring back an amendment next, uh, uh, you know, next, uh, next session. So I think, why don't I think, we do that? Yeah. So, so why don't you just bring forward your concerns and then we can refer okay, back to staff fine. and bring it back. Yeah. A and the word was in the report, not necessarily in the recommendation. The First okay. Nations is not in the recommendation, but it's in the report. Do you okay. see what I'm saying? Well, we can move the recommendations. Yeah. Well, I have more, more things okay. to say, but that was the first one. Um, so I want to be clear that these are not my words and just the voice of three Indigenous leaders that I've talked to. Um, spoke to, thank you. <laughs> I spoke to Phil Davis, who is the Community Outreach and Fundraising Coordinator at the Niagara Regional Native Center, and Jessica, I'm sorry, I don't know her last name or her title, but she was with Phil when I spoke to him. He gave me permission to share his thoughts and after he reviewed the land acknowledgement. To his knowledge, the center was not contacted. He said it is kind of brief, not specific, very generic, no mention of nationhood, that we should invite Indigenous people to open up the meeting, not just with the three videos. Our statement should be culturally sensitive, competent, and move towards reconcil reconciliatory action. It should be about learning, education, and interaction. Phil does not believe this statement has met this criteria. He believes that the city should have a working group to work on the, these challenges, and he strongly suggests that we do that. There could be a subcommittee meeting through our diversity, equity, and inclusion committee, recorded minutes to stay on track and be accountable. There should be interaction from council with the working group. He feels that the statement should not be read the, the same every time by the same person. It should be personalized, rotated, rotating the speaker, and touch on the main points of the purpose. Non-Indigenous people should perform their own research and include knowledge and in their connection. He said it will have a detrimental effect to council if we are not proactive as other councils are in Niagara. I, now that's Phil's, I'm going into my own. 
I'd like to give credit to the Diversity and Equity and Inclusion Committee for their land acknowledgement. <coughs> they rotate, they add their own experience and knowledge, and they make it personal. Other committees have, have put more fulsome statements. I feel that if we go to this statement, it's very brief, generic, and it's set up backwards for what the DNI committee is doing. St. Catharines in 2018 has a memorandum of understanding with the two centers, Fort Erie and Niagara on Lake. I would like to see that the city of Niagara Falls form a meaningful relationship with Fort Erie and Niagara on the Lake, uh, and that should be through working groups. And I've been told by staff that these, there, I've been told by staff that there are regular meetings, and to the knowledge of the people at the, the centers, there's only been very minimal. So my second one is um, an email from. Councillor, did you send these to staff? I just the got them. I just got them. Because we should defer this tonight, and why don't you send your comments to them so they can deal if with this? Because we're not going to make. Because we're not going to do any decisions tonight. It's already. We're going to send this back to okay, staff. Okay, if that's deferred, so that's it, fine. I think. Don't you think that makes more sense? We're not going to make a decision. Make decisions on the fly with some meetings that you had with some individuals. I don't think that's a fair way to deal with all the council. Better off you send your comments in advance to our staff who wrote the report, and then they can come back with a more, full, more fulsome report. So I do understand what you're saying, but you do have to realize, you see how big the agenda was. By the time I got to these items on the agenda, by the time I spoke with other people, I was on the phone five minutes before I left to come here. So it's very difficult because of the timing to do all of that. In a perfect world, that would be okay. I appreciate that, and, but we and shouldn't you, hold up everybody tonight for planning matters. This matter's not going to be dealt with tonight. So that, why don't That's we, fine, but that wasn't what was on the agenda about deferring it. So now that we're going to defer it, I'm fine with not not bringing this up, and I will forward them. Thank okay. you. Okay. Do, do you want to make that motion then, Councillor? Yes. Refer this um, to staff? To def uh, defer this. Just refer Are it we to re staff. Referring it to staff? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay. We're looking for a second by Councillor Patel. All those in favor? Okay. And then if Councillor, if you'd be so kind as to send your comments to staff, and then we can go through that. Okay. We're at 7.2 schedule of fees. Uh, looking for uh, motion of Council for the two recommendations in the report. Councillor uh, Strange, uh, seconded by Councillor Peter Angelo. All those in favor? Okay, and that's approved. No, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Councillor Peter Angelo and Councillor Lacoco. Uh, yes. uh, at the. Uh, take. Are we talking about schedule of fees? No, I have to declare my conference. Oh, okay, okay. So, okay, so just just so I know, are you talking about schedule of fees? No. Yeah, can we just take the vote on schedule of fees, or is okay. so? Okay, that's all, that's all I was doing, I was taking the vote. Did you want to speak to schedule of fees, Councillor? Yes, thank you. Um, uh, regarding the special event, the rental fees, the lots and parks is oh. non-profit, would that not be coming yeah. back to us as a fee waiver later on? Mr. CAO? Uh, only if they request it and apply for a, a fee waiver. There's lots of charities that pay for rental of, of spaces. Okay, thank you. And um, I, I completely object to the $500 code of conduct. Our integrity commissioner has already commented on that, that it's too high. It's out of reach for people to submit um, a, a complaint. And as with the last fees, I have an issue with completely doubling the fees. It's not just a small percentage, but some of them are doubled. Okay. Did you want to comment, Mr. Cieo? The, the clerk would have more up-to-date figures, but um, even the code of conduct complaints that aren't even uh, going to a full report is costing us thousands of dollars. So, uh, you know, I think, uh, f uh, you know, a $500 fee is a fraction of it. I think it it's then becomes incumbent on the person who's making it to seek out appropriate advice before they just put a complaint in that other somebody else is actually going to have to pay for. So, you know, a $500 fee is covering probably less than 10% of the cost of what these things are costing the taxpayers. So I hope that the $500 is enough for someone to stop think, seek some advice before they go down a road that costs us, you know, five, ten, fifteen thousand dollars uh, $15,000 worth of fees. Um, the fees are frankly out of control um, on that. So from a staff point of view, um, I'd rather have someone pick up the phone, talk to our clerk to say, this is the problem I have. Can we resolve it? Can we take a look at alternative actions versus just a code of conduct complaint, which a taxpayer pays for? Uh, Councillor uh, Baldinelli and Newestag. Through you, I just, just have one question on the, 
on a fee for the swimming lessons. Is that seventy? Is that thirty minutes, for seventy-five dollars? Is that for the pool, or is that for each individual in the pool? Is that the private lesson or the group lesson? This is just a change? swimming lesson indoor, thirty minutes, seventy-five bucks. Now it's going to eighty-five dollars, and then forty-five <coughs> minutes is ninety-three, and sixty minutes is one hundred twelve. I know for thirty minutes you can't teach anybody how to swim or anything for seventy-five dollars, and I just out of reach for. People, so I just want to know. Or is that the, for the ten lessons? It's for the ten lessons. Oh, it doesn't. I don't see it stating. So the there's two. Yeah, there's a private lesson fee. I think the seventy-five dollar fee, if I remember correctly, is for the younger age group, mm -hmm. and the those fees and the group lessons are for ten lesson uh, sessions. Okay. So it's seventy-five dollars for for the younger kids. It's thirty minutes, but it's ten lessons, so it works out to be about seven dollars fifty cents a lesson. Because I believe the private fees are around forty dollars, if I remember correctly, and that's for one-on-one -on -one instructor in the pool. Yep, thank you. Well, th just the lessons that said outdoor, five lessons, the swimming lessons, indoor, didn't say any amount. That's it. Okay, yep, good catch, good catch, Councilor Newstead. Um, with respect to the cemetery fees, just a comment with the perpetual care and, um, and trust maintenance fee, um, there's a comment here that we have to be, that, and part of the reason for the increase is because if a cemetery ever becomes uh, full, then we have it, the onus becomes on the cemetery to maintain it. Is there any uh, report done annually that says this is what we have in perpetual care and trust fund with the, I know it has to be um, uh, put into trust and they should, it should be making money as well. Um, is there anything saying that this is what we have and any estimate or for, forethought in terms of what, if a uh, cemetery becomes full, what are we looking at in terms of maintaining it, just so that down the road we don't end up with a huge cost to the taxpayer? Um, I don't have the figures off. Uh, the report was issued to us l two years ago, if I remember correctly, uh, probably just before the election. Um, as to the uh, status of it, the recommendation was that we had to increase our fees because we were short on our perpetual care. Um, and we also need to take a look at a, a new uh, site uh, so that we can continue to uh, collect those fees. Uh, but what I could do is uh, we can forward that report to you, uh, and I think we get it updated. I'm working at Miss Clark every five years is what we have for mandated to get that report updated. But I believe we have a regular uh, schedule for that report to get updated by the by the consultants. So then we're aware of any. We won't be short. We're short. Any, we're short. We're short. Yes, that's the that was the conclusion of the last report was that we have to uh, we have to beef up our reserve, and the big concern is that we may be taking on additional. Uh, uh, cemeteries that may come into our control and when they come to our control they have no reserves uh, so that uh, that adds another burden onto it and I do assume that the perpetual care and trust fund money monies are invested so they are, are they? Uh, yes yeah okay yep and they're segregated in our reserve funds okay very good thank you okay thank you so if we don't have any further comments I'll call the vote all those in favor schedule fees opposed with one opposed. Uh, moving on to 7.3, debenture financing for the capital budget. There are six rec recommendations of staff looking for a motion on that. Moved by Councillor Strange, second by Councillor Pietrangelo. Call the vote. Oh, you want to speak to it, Councillor Pietrangelo? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, thanks, Your Worship. I, I just wanted to say uh, thanks to staff, I guess, for um, uh, agreeing to the guiding principle in the sense that, you know, they will only use debentures for larger projects. I just wanted to ask though, because in the report it talked about, you know, the sort of minimum amount for debenture that staff would be looking at. Staff are looking at a million dollars. Um, it wasn't quite what I had in mind when I brought it up last meeting. Uh, I talked about big projects, you know, I talked about the McBain Center, I talked about um, uh, the Gale Center, we, uh, we mentioned the History Museum, also the Arts and Culture Center, the exchange that we're doing now talked about, uh, you know, new service center. These were the type of projects that I had in mind. I think if you set the bar at a million dollars, um, to me that's really, that's really kind of low. Like if you look at our capital budget, you can probably pull out dozens upon dozens of projects that would fit in the million dollars or higher range. So that, that really wasn't what I had in mind, Your Worship. I'm just wondering if, uh, you know, staff would be amenable to, uh, I guess, taking the guiding principle as something that would be much larger in size than just a million dollars. So, okay, Mr. Uh We can take that. I think 
um, when we get to levy budget, we'd have to take a serious look at our capital reserves. We don't have sufficient reserves to um, to purchase you know several million dollars worth of equipment each year out of our cash holding. Uh, so a fire truck that you know might not be a, the size of a gale project, but it's two million dollars. Uh, we just don't have the sufficient. Uh, we've never had those capital reserves in there. So unless council starts to pump up those capital reserves, um, we we would be hard pressed to only limit it to major capital projects like that. Um, you know, I think we, as a rule, we try to minimize, uh, especially with the interest rates at this point in time, how much debt we are taking on. We try to sub substitute out, uh, but it would be it'd be difficult for staff to have the robust capital program without taking on uh, debt. So I kind of look at it in three ways. There's the, what you're borrowing the debt for should be long, uh, long lived asset, your total level of debt that you have and your, um, and your ARL calculation and you kind of combine all, all three of them and your level of reserve that you have. So uh, we can take it away uh, to look at it, but I think at every capital budget, you'll know what we're issuing the debt for. If you want to use more reserves, council can always make that adjustment. But we'll, I think if we go up much more above a million dollars, we may be pinching ourselves on how we can buy some of our assets that we require. Because, for example, the the fire truck is going to be a debt uh, a debt issued truck, and you may not consider that major. But we don't have the funding, frankly, to to take two million dollars out of the bank. We we can't fund that at this point in time because our reserves are just too low. Um, to that point then, Your Worship, I, I, I just really don't want to see us creeping up in terms of debt. Uh, I know our annual repayment limit right now is at around 7.5%. It did say in the report that other municipalities, although Niagara Falls has set a rate of 15%, uh, other municipalities are at 10 That That really puts us close. I mean, that's 2.5% away from what other municipalities deem as sort of their cap limit in terms of debt. I, I, I really would like to leave enough room in there so that if we do have a major project come downstream, then that's what we'd venture for. Uh, there's, there's many things that were written in the report in terms of, you know, we started with the, the we started with increasing debentures when the OLG funds dropped off during COVID, and then it also mentions in the report, well, now the OLG funds are back. Uh, the other thing was, you know, well, the interest rate was really low, when we started to the venture, well, now the interest rate is really high. We just got to keep remembering that for the, uh, I guess, more and more debt that we take on, it really handcuffs us uh, in future operating budgets because then we have no choice but to pay the interest on that debt right away before we look at anything else. Okay, thank you. And I, I do agree with the councilor. I think one of the major decisions that this council made wisely is they did save up in advance of their hospital contribution, which will be fully coming from reserves where most municipalities would borrow for that and pay, uh, frankly, higher interest rates than we would have. Uh, and that's why one of the recommendations will be uh, going forward is to pay that hospital contribution back into our reserves over the next uh, 20 years, because I think that will build up the reserve and get the result that, uh, that you're looking for. But that hospital contribution, by paying it in advance, which is a major thing that you're talking about, right, which we paid cash for, that's really going to depress our uh, reserves, so that's why it'll be important that we put that money back in over the next uh, few years, so that we can, for the next major project, have the, that reserve built up. Uh, so I, I do agree with you. Right now, we're just at that point in time where we've committed our our reserves out for those major projects, and we'll need to look to pay it back. Thank you. All right. Yes, Councilor Patel. Through you, Mr. Mayor, I will support this uh, uh, recommendation because if we're not supporting this, then uh, one almost one percent of the capital tax levy will go on our taxpayers, and this year is not the right time to put another one percent on our taxpayers. So that's why I will support this debt one million dollars. Okay, thank you for that. <clears throat> okay, we're going to call the vote now. All those in favor? Okay, opposed? With one opposed. Seven point four. Total solar eclipse. We've got an update just from our fire department. We're anxiously awaiting the one from our rec and culture department. That'll be the exciting one. This is the safety one. Motion by Councilor Peter Angel, second by Councilor Thompson. All those in favor? Okay, thank you for that. Boring safety, boo. <laughs>
sorry. It's, yours is the steak, hers will be the sizzle, and it'll be a good combination. 7.5. Uh, moving toward an administrative monetary penalty system, AMPS, for non-parking matters. Uh, we do have five recommendations here. Um, is that why Mr. Dowling came in? Was that for that? Uh, no, he was dead. Oh, he was what? He was dead. He was dead. Oh, okay. He came in, he ran out. All right. So we'll bring our solicitor, Ms. Pignarty. Thank you very much. Uh, and thank you, Council. And thank you, Council, for receiving uh, this report. Um, I thought I'd make a brief presentation given that this is a relatively new system for our municipality. So administrative monetary penalties are permitted under the Municipal Act um, as of 2017. And they're essentially a way for our bylaw enforcement matters to be adjudicated um, in-house at the municipality as opposed to going through the court system. So what we've done here is we put together a proposed bylaw um, that essentially identifies three of our city bylaws right now to go through the system, being the, uh, the noise control bylaw, the clean yard bylaw, and the vacation rental unit and bed and breakfast bylaw. And the schedule to the bylaw uh, proposes penalties that the municipality is able to impose in the event of a bylaw violation. So the process would essentially be, there's a violation noted by bylaw officer, they issue a notice of violation, they'll issue what's called a penalty notice in accordance with the proposed fees and charges in the schedule of the bylaw, and the individual either pays the penalty, which is revenue to the city, or within 15 days, they are going to request uh, that the city review that um, order and notice and um, see if um, a different decision can be made. And all of that is done internally at the city. There's no court process. Um, different municipalities um, have been doing this for some time and uh, it's something uh, our, we have been working towards uh, establishing here. Uh, what we are going to do is we have an existing system right now for uh, parking violations and adjudications. Um, we have a contract um, for shared services with other municipalities. We are going to be expanding that contract so that the adjudicators can um, uh, include these other bylaw violations in their contract for decision making. Um, so that's one level of implementation. We're also going to be amending the three other bylaws just to refer back to the administrative monetary penalties bylaw. Um, and we'll be reviewing the system uh, because we anticipate that it is going to be uh, resulting in faster decisions for people who um, dispute uh, bylaw violations as opposed to going through the court system, which takes years and years. Um, I'm happy to answer very specific questions, but just on a high level, um, some comments about the process. Our internal review process will be two levels of review. It's a screening which is the first level, and the second one is a hearing review. And there's two questions that are asked. The first one is a substantive question that our officer or the contracted out adjudicator would ask is, did this actually happen? Did the violation actually happen? The second question they will ask is more of a fairness and equity question. Is there undue hardship in paying the penalty? So they're going to be considering those circumstances before they render their, their decision. And there's two parts to their decision. It's the actual penalty and the admin fee. And both can be sort of asked to be reviewed at the city level. Um, there's no appeal from this process. So unlike the court process, which can be appealed to higher levels, these decisions are final. Um, and uh, other, other sort of legal implications of this is while there's no appeal, um, a party can bring an application for judicial review like any other um, administrative decision, essentially ask a court to decide whether it was properly done, but it's a very expensive process, specialized lawyers are required, um, and it's very rare for a court to overturn a decision of a screening or hearing officer. Um, the other legal implication I discussed in the report was um, potential challenges to the actual bylaw. Sometimes a party can challenge the actual bylaw in court for being unreasonable, unfair, um, unduly uh, causing hardship, 
and that's also a very complicated court process. Um, right now for the vacation rental units, given how prevalent the illegal vacation rental units are in, in our city, and given how much income um, offending owners are making, we're actually suggesting $1,000 per day of continuing violation uh, in our proposed fee schedule. Um, that's what we're proposing. Um, we'll see how it plays out, um, but we think that this is an appropriate amount to really discourage the activity. Okay. Uh, thank you, Ms. Pinarity. That was great. I've got Councillor Neusteg, Strange, Lacoco. And thank you, Ms. Pinarity. I know you did a lot of work, and I, you saved the city some money as well because it was supposed to be um, contracted out. So thank you for that. Thank you for your hard work. Um, I think this is, this makes a lot of sense um, in terms of you've identified it saves us tax time as well as there's a cost issue. But I think there's another part to it as well. There's two more advantages of this. Um, especially with vacation rental units. One thing we hear from our residents all the time is that they're frustrated, they're completely frustrated, they know something's wrong, or they've reported it, um, it's been investigated, but there's this time, and they get very frustrated, like why isn't something happening? So I think you're addressing the, the residents' frustration by doing this, because it'll speed it up. Secondly, I think it's mockery too, when people know they're doing something wrong and they continue to make money, upset all the neighbors, and I think the $1,000 is saying to people, no, you're breaking the law and you need to pay, so I think um, that needs to be noted. Um, I think even going further down, um, maybe with, we were talking earlier with the SBCA and the different fines there, maybe that can even be um, somehow incorporated under this AMPS program. And just one final thing is I want to say thank you for the fairness, because I think you are, when people, if there is any violation, it's not just slap a fine and we walk away. You're, you've really thought through and giving people, um, number one, asking if it's right, and secondly, if there's hardship to it. So I think it's an extremely fair um, method, and I thank you for all your work. I would definitely support it. Thank you so much, Councillor. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Strange. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thank you for the report, uh, Nitty. Um, I just want to know, are we new at this, or are we old at this? Do other municipalities currently do this the way that we're, we want to implement, implement this? Yes, we are um, sort of in between. Uh, some other Niagara municipalities have started implementing this as of 2019. So the law in fact changed in 2017 and it is quite a process to get up to speed. So Niagara on the Lake, uh, Fort Erie, Welland, uh, St. Catharines, uh, to name a few. They just got started around the 2020, 20, um, 2019, 2020 mark. Uh, so we're sort of, we're joining now in 2023, 2024, but uh, there's a few other municipalities that still have to join up. But because we're using shared services, um, I think it's gonna be easier for other municipalities to join up. And it just relieves the burden on the court system, allows us to just take care of our bylaw enforcement internally. And these other municipalities that I mentioned have a whole host of bylaws that go through that process. Like almost every single bylaw goes through that process as opposed to the court system. Okay, perfect. And I just want, if you could give me an example, so it's a VRU, the old way of trying to get these guys and uh, running an illegal VRU to the new one, what the process, when you, the old way and to this way you give them a thousand dollar fine, what after that happens? If you can do the old way and now the new way. Yep, under the old way, um, our uh, bylaw officers actually have to file what's called an information in the court system. So they have to file an affidavit and go before a judge and say, I need to charge, I, I need to get a summons uh, for this person to appear in court. And that summons is going to be, um, the court date's going to be a few months down the road. So they have to satisfy a justice of the peace that that's appropriate and then the summons is issued by the court. So that's a whole, like that takes weeks, and then the court date, the first court date takes several months. And then the person can either show up or not show up, and there's several delays. We have a few files right now of um, current um, offending um, vacation rental units. Offenses um, were detected as early as you know 2021, 2022. We're still in the court system. It's just because people know how to play the system, get further adjournments, say they didn't know about the court date, say they never received the notice, you know, dispute them on technicalities, and that's we're in that sort of spiral. 
and we're just trying so hard to make sure we get our fine of 15,000 or whatever it is that we've levied against the person. So that's the old system. The new system now is anticipated to be our officer no gets information, sufficient grounds to say that this person's operating illegally. They issue the penalty notice and then that person's liability to pay that penalty starts ticking right then. And each day that they don't pay, the fine is, you know, a thousand dollars more. So they'd either have to pay to make it stop do you have and to get pay that day, or do they have a certain amount? Um, so the timeline, um, we actually give 15 days, 15 days just so okay. they have some time to get and then organized. After 15 days would be a thousand dollars per day until. Yes, we are giving the first 15 days. We thought that would be fair, um, but then after that, it's going to be accruing on a per diem basis. Um, and they either can pay or they can file for a dispute at the city, but then it'll be those two questions I mentioned. Um, and if, if they're not happy with the second decision that they will get maybe within um, a few months max, I would say, just because these officers are probably shared with other municipalities. So, um, but that's a quicker result and they can't appeal it any further. So they have to still pay. And if they don't pay, it gets added to their taxes. Um, and we enforce them that way, just like property taxes. Well, that's great. I, I really like this <laughs> this new system. And I think the VRUs, you know, they're they're going to get this fine because they're running illegally. So they're either going to stop doing it, or they're going to come down and get their license here down at the city and do it legally. So I think it's it's a great option. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Coco. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I think this is great that we're looking at new options because this has definitely been a problem and we haven't been able to secure um, a, a good solution. I guess I have a couple of questions through the mayor to Ms. Pignarty. Are we going to go back to the open files that we have and go to them to see if they're still running and then find them? <coughs> so if we've already had a complaint under the old system, will you go back to those people now to find them? So anything in the old system, unfortunately, can't be taken out of the courts. So we still have to clean up the old ones through the court system. These are going to be, um, and this is um, this process is only going to be effective as of the date this bylaw becomes effective, and then we're going to go through the implementation, which will be um, entering into the agreement with our external hearing officers and screening officers, and then really implementing the bylaws, getting um, the, the penalty notices out. So we'll start that process in 2024, but up until we're up and running, we'll still have recourse to the court system, and we'll go through that way, just to make sure we don't miss anything. Thank you. Through the mayor, will there be any that haven't gone through the court system, but that we're aware of, and we will go to them to start with the fines? So if we become aware of something after this bylaw is in effect, then we would start the new system. Okay. Um, I guess my next question is, say if you go to a VRU on a Saturday and they have booked it for a whole week, is there any um, leniency on our part that we're not going to ask them to stop for one night when they ha have it booked for seven days? It's the same people in there. Obviously, it's illegal, but they, the people in the VRU, they don't know it's illegal. So you have people in there. Is there something that we can be lenient on? I know there's the 15 days that you said it's not going to go per day, but is that will that 15 days cover it if they're, they're still renting to the same people? So there's also um, the ability to extend time. So in addition to the review, um, a person affected by penalty notice can apply to our screening or hearing officer to say, hey, I'm, I'm, I missed the deadline and this is my explanation. And it has to be a good explanation according to the criteria, some extenuating circumstances that prevented them from taking action within the 15 days. And it's completely up to the screening or hearing officer's discretion to agree or disagree to the extension of time. And then they could, if it's granted, then they could proceed with their review. Okay. And will this moving forward, will it be on a complaint basis or will we be actively searching on the internet for them? So right now, um, as we've been doing everything else, it is still going to be complaint basis because of our resource capacities. It's just um, so this efficiency that we're proposing kicks in after we ident we have reasonable grounds to lay a charge well in this case it would be issue a penalty notice not lay a charge so i'll have to change okay. my lingo on that 
I, I always prefer giving education. Will there be some sort of education for people to know that, that will give them an opportunity to stop it before we find out that they're doing something illegal? I think as legal, as part of corporate services, as, you know, with communication. So I think we will be issuing an FAQ and updating our website. Uh, to make sure people are aware of um, AMPS, the fact that we have it, how it works, um, what their rights are, um, what actions they can take to mitigate. Through the mayor. Um, to that point, sorry, like yeah. people know, it, the, the owners know it's illegal, that what they're doing. Some people don't. Everybody knows they're running an illegal Airbnb. Come on, you've been talking about it forever. You vote against every single Airbnb we've done. But I don't understand, like they know it's illegal. Why would we give them the chance? You never want to give them a chance before. I would never if, give them a chance if they already know about it. If they already know about it, but how can we prove that they don't? So what I was going to say was about that postcard. We sent out a postcard. Mm -hmm. Is there some way that we can do something oh, yeah. like that? We'll, we'll definitely get word out for sure. We'll do it 100%, but but like Councilor Strange says, they, they're well aware of what they're doing. But, but we'll let everybody know, give them fair notice that there's gonna be a change in uh, fees penalties and for the record I've had residents call me and said that they didn't know it was illegal what can I do to make it legal so there are people out there that don't and I, I put them in touch with the city about how to get a license and, and do all of that so there are some um, I guess my question so I'll is just briefly respond to that through the chair um, our penalty notice sim similar to our order to comply actually contains all the information somebody needs so it actually contains the second page of that or the bottom half of that penalty notice tells them exactly what, why they've received it and what their next steps are. Um, going to um, compliance about grass. If you're running a legal vacation rental unit, that's one thing. But if your grass is a little bit too long, more than the 20 centimeters, is there an opportunity to give somebody a, a notice that it needs to be complied within a certain number of days? Maybe you didn't get out there, you were on vacation, maybe you were sick, you were going to do it the next day. Is, is there something like that through the mayor to, to the solicitor? Uh, through the chair, if there's a dispute on the fact that that notice was issued, um, that can always be sent to the city through those mechanisms, the screening, the hearing. Um, the bylaw manager actually has the ability to also review and um, revoke a penalty notice if they deem appropriate but really we we um it's only if there's a glaring error like if there if it was issued to the wrong person by mistake like that's really the idea of their authority <coughs> but if they dispute the actual um length of the grass and all of that like that's more of a substantive dispute through the review process that they would file Thank you. I, I think I was thinking more upon um, a neighbor complains about the other neighbor, the grass is too high. Before, a bylaw officer would go out there, contact the, the, the resident and say, your grass is too high, you need to have it cut within 10 days. And then if it wasn't cut, then it would go on the taxes. Right now, if the neighbor complains, there's, uh, there's going to be a, a, a fine issued. There's no, okay, I just wanted to make sure about that. And I guess my last question, my last question is, you said that it would go on the taxes if they don't pay. If somebody's paying monthly, how does that get adjusted for the additional amounts that they didn't pay for VRU or whatever? Um, through the chair, I'm not an expert on how it's all adjusted, but right now, um, bylaw charges do get added to the tax roll, fines, and I see the treasurer. Yeah, maybe <laughs> Ms. Clark can answer that one. Yeah, through you, Mr. Mayor. Um, we would do an adjustment on the pre-authorized payment. Um, I think we do it either once or twice a year, but we okay. would send you a notice that those charges Great. were added. That's all I wanted to know. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Ms. Patel? Councilor Patel? Through you, Mr. Mayor. Ms. Puniarte, thank you very much for a wonderful report. Thank you. You have put lots of time in there. And a couple of questions I have is, once this uh, bylaw comes into effect, we'll be getting lots of calls about VRUs. So how do we distinct what's right, what's correct, and what like which one is right calls and which one are wrong calls? Because are we still have, going to have to prove that that's a VRU? I know in a, under previous bylaw, our bylaw officers had to prove put certain hours in there to prove what, that it is a VRU. 
So it's the same process now? It's the same evidentiary process. So the standards of evidence are going to be the exact same, but we'll just deal with it internally, and there's no appeal. And it will deal with it faster, and we'll make some money. Okay, thank you. And for noise control bylaw, will that be a warning, or is it just a fine? Uh, the way it's proposed right now, it is um, a fine for those specific items that are in the uh, schedule. So we haven't um, identified every single item in the noise control bylaw. We've only isolated a few violations, and we've said there's a fine attached to it. So, um, But we are going to make it very clear what their rights and remedies are, any person affected by a penalty notice, So, and they have the 15 days. The other thing we've proposed is most municipalities actually charge, start the 15 days from the date the notice is actually issued by the municipality. Let's say there's um, it's served by mail, it's actually effective five days after. So we're actually saying that the 15 days will start from the date of receiving as opposed to the date of issuing. So we're proposing something different from other municipalities and that's also just from a fairness fairness standpoint. So they have a bit more time because it's date of receipt. Thank you. Through you, Mr. Mayor, for the clean yard, clean yard by bylaw for the backyard, will they need to, uh, would the bylaw officer need to get permission from the property owner to go in the backyard or they can just go in the backyard? Uh, through the chair under the Municipal Act, the bylaw officer does have some um, rights to enter uh, to look at a bylaw violation um, for for that particular bylaw. So if they have reasonable grounds, they will enter. Okay. Thank you very much. That's it, Mr. Mayor. And I'll move the motion. Okay, Accepted. great. So motion by council. Oh, yes, Councilor Strange. Uh, I'll second it. Just okay. with, with the amendment, hopefully that we can get a report, a financial report maybe back of how it's going and basically how much the city is kind of making and maybe compare it to last year like in penalties and fines, if you're okay for the amendment to get a, a report back. Yeah, okay. I can take it as advisory. Yeah, okay. okay. So we've got a motion uh, by Councilor Patel, second by Councilor Strange. Uh, you saw in the report the uh, recommendations. Let me just come back to them here. Uh, with the, uh, also with direction of staff, there are five <laughs> recommendations and with direction of staff to come back with an update on the, um, how it's going. Okay, so we'll call that vote. All those in favor? Okay, that's unanimous. Thank you for that. Thanks, for it, Ms. Pinarty. Thank you. 7.6, water, wastewater, storm. A motion. I, I, I'm happy to move it. I still have to declare a couple of conflicts. But I'm happy oh, okay. Well, why don't we start by declaring your conflicts? Okay. We'll get those done. Thanks, Your Worship. I just didn't make it to the start of the meeting because yep. you started at 1 o'clock, but I was still at school. So I have two conflicts with a couple planning items, uh, PBD 2023-81 and PBD 2023-73. Uh, both of these are yes. within the notification zone of my main residence. So okay. I'll sit out of them. We'll give those to the, clerk. This to the clerk. Thank you for that, yeah. Councillor. And then I'm happy to move that motion. Okay. okay. Motion by Councillor Pierangelo, second by Councillor Thompson, that we move 7.6, that the city extend the contract for Ontario Utility Locates of Niagara Falls for six months. All those in favor? Okay. That's unanimous. Thank you. 7.7. We're looking for, uh, there are four recommendations, basically draft approval of vacant land of condominium. Those. Motion by Councillor Pierangelo, second by Councillor Strange. All those, yeah, you wanna speak to it, Councillor? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just had a question. Um, I'm wondering why this is under reports and not planning. Was this, a, I don't remember this specific matter. Did it come to us before? Um, we can get an answer, uh, Mr. Bryce. Through you, Your Worship, uh, it did have R4 zoning. I did have the zoning for the uh, the property, uh, so uh, I don't believe it was brought forth before council previously. Do or don't? Uh, I don't believe. Don't believe. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So I'm wondering, was there notification to residents uh, around there? Through you, Your Worship, um, there would not have been notification. Uh, the Planning Act has changed. Uh, plans of condominium are not subject to public uh, hearings or public notification. That's Great. where I Thank thought you. we were going. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for that. And, and one final thing on um, page 10, it talks about um, the number of trees. There's no map there with the, with the trees. And then there's a comment, please investigate whether these can be preserved. I'd like to know if they can be preserved and how many. Mr. Bryce. Through you, Your Worship, uh, it's a condition of approval that they be, uh, basically look at those trees to see if they can be preserved. Uh, so that uh, a tree uh, a tree study would be done to determine that. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Great, thank you. 
So it was moved again by, I'm sorry, I'm losing track here. Uh, Councilor Peter Angel, second by Councilor Strange. We'll call the vote, all those in favor? Okay, and that's unanimous, thank you for that. Uh, 7.9, there are four rec, pardon me? Did I skip 7.8? Oh, I'm sorry, 7.8, draft plan of vacant land condominium approval. There are four, low, uh, four recommendations. Most, yes. Thanks, Your Worship. Just a couple questions through you to staff. I don't know if you can, uh, would you be able to pull up the plan um, on screen? I'm not sure. The one that we have as part of, as part of the report? Uh, through Your Worship, I'll look for uh, to clerks. Okay. See if we can do that. I, 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 well, my first question, Your Worship, was just in regards to the road. So, correct me if I'm wrong, this has always been a private road from McLeod all the way into the condo building that's there? Through you, Your Worship, yes. And now the city is going to be assuming Thundering Waters Boulevard from McLeod Road south to the Hydro Corridor? Uh, through you, Your Worship, uh, the, uh, the city, uh, the recommendation, uh, the condition is that uh, the, uh, the road be built to municipal standards and be assumed by the city to the, uh, the south end of the property. Okay. Our, um, how do we do that, like for snow plowing and for other services? Do, do, we, do we follow right through on the road or, or is it our obligation to lift up our plow when we get to the hydro corridor and someone else come in? Because I know that it used to be that way, Your Worship, when we had those wonky rules with city and then regional roads and then city and then regional roads. Does the same thing apply here in terms of services? I think Eric knows the answer. Mr. Nickel? Yeah, true, Mr. Mayor. Um, in this case, we wouldn't be authorized to drive those plows onto private property, so they'd stop at the limits of the subdivision, turn around, come back. The intention is, as the future developments continue along Thundering Waters Way, we would improve that whole thing to be a municipal road allowance um, all the way to the end of the where the golf course entrance is now in future over time. So this is phase one of the future road extension. So we will then stop plowing at the end of, uh, I guess, where the road meets the hydro corridor? Yes, correct, at the end of the development limits where so, it's municipal road. And then the rest of that private drive is owned by the golf course, is it? Uh, I don't have the ownership in front of me, but it's privately owned, yes. And then they would be responsible, I guess, to maintain the rest of it? Yeah, as they are today. Will we have any type of turnaround at the end of our municipal owned portion? Through you, you worship, uh, there is a turnaround, not, not only for, uh, for plows, but also for fire trucks at the, uh, the south end of the property. Okay, and that's great. And the only other question I had then was in regards to um, the, uh, the garbage, the placement of the garbage. Is it, um, is it street facing, do you know? Uh, through you, Your Worship, I don't uh, know that at the time. It will be determined through the, uh, uh, through the, uh, the submission of detailed uh, servicing drawings and plans. Okay. I, I just thought um, either I was told that by a resident or I saw that on the plan. Um, so if it's not, that's great. Uh, if it is, I, I, you know, I didn't, like, it would be great if they could find a better location than street front. So. I'll leave that with planning staff, Your Worship. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Councilor Lococo. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. In this report, it doesn't talk about Salad Steel and Washington Mills. Um, has, have there been any concerns from them? And if they're having or they're outside of the, um, uh, the area, people can still complain about noise. So what is the process at that point and what, what happens at that point? Mr. Bryce, are they uh, within the notification uh, area? Uh, through you, Your Worship, uh, uh, when we dealt with the uh, zoning bylaw, it went to the Ontario Land Tribunal. And uh, through that, there was a settlement with the two industries. Uh, and through that, there is a number of warning clauses. There are a number of uh, uh, noise mitigation measures that need to be incorporated. We've incorporated that in the, uh, in the uh, basically in the conditions of approval. Uh, so all, all, all future purchasers and tenants will be notified 
of the industry, notify that there is noise, they'll be notified that they, you know, there's, they need to have central air conditioning and, uh, you know, they'll be notified that, you know, that in some cases noise may exceed uh, limits. Great, thank you. Um, 28 one bedroom apartments are going to be affordable. That's absolutely great that we're working towards having affordable units in our community. Um, I, I've talked about these VRU units specifically on that. If we're looking, there's going to be 76 stacked townhouses for VRUs. If those 76 units are put in our housing target, they might not be for our residents, they might be VRU. So I, I brought this up again, we really need to keep track about what is a resident and what's a VRU. So we might have to start keeping track 76 possible VRUs. That's not our residential target. So I just want that. Mm -hmm. And then um, <coughs> I know that there's some residents here. I don't know if they wanted to speak or if they can speak, but I do see a few residents here. Well, we have a one registered speaker right okay. now, so we'll call her up. Okay, um, that was all I had. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Baldinelli, then you stay. Uh, through you, sir. Um, what about the drainage issue that they had from across the street? Uh, the forest that they have across the street from this, this planned development, there's a great big screen hole. Does it go underneath the road to this area? Does it help drain that area? Okay, uh, through you, you worship. Uh, I think we're talking about the con drain. Yeah. Okay, so uh, yeah, through the uh, through the conditions of approval, uh, they'll need to uh, address uh, drainage and need to provide an engineering uh, solution, uh, basically to uh, accommodate drainage on their property. Uh, it, I, I don't know, and I haven't viewed any uh, servicing drawings, but uh, I'm not sure what the solution is. Uh, but in that area, generally, uh, drainage does go out to uh, to the con drain. From under the road? N not from under the road. How does it get there? Okay, uh, I, I'm not sure if... Uh, uh, do you know, do you know how to speak at all? Yeah, you don't have those guys. I go in there for the mushrooms all the time. So across the street, there's a great big old screen pipe that's connected to this property. Councilor, are you across from the Cloud Road, or? Yeah, on the Cloud Road, the forest directly across from this development. Okay, well we can perhaps take that offline. I don't have that type of information today. Okay, thank you. Any other questions, uh, Councilor Baldinelli? No. No, okay, Councilor Neustad? Um, just a question through you, um, Mr. Mayor, to um, Mr. Bryce. Just a question of uh, clarity. So we're supposed to have 76 uh, vacation rental units there. Is that not a residential area? I thought. Um, BRUs are not part of residential, or is, oh, that's tourist commercial there? Yeah. Okay. The zoning, it's tourist commercial. Uh, through, through your worship, site-specific zoning does permit a portion of the property to be used for vacation rental units. So is that whole 76 kind of away from all the residential area as well? I believe, uh, through you, your worship, I believe it is the properties on the south side of the, uh, the driveway. Okay. So. Um, through you, Mr. Mayor. So when they went to the land tribunal and they had to make sure that they understood about the industry, are they also understanding that there's vacation rental units in that area as well? Uh, through you, Your Worship, um, there wouldn't be that specific warning. Okay. Because it's tourist commercial, it doesn't matter then. All right. Thank you. Clark. Okay. Thank you for that. So uh, do we, uh, now I understand Mary Lou, ten yes, I'm sorry. Through you, Mr. Councilor Mayor. Patel. Uh, to Mr. Bryce, if they're going to be VRU, do they have two parkings per unit? Uh, through you, Your Worship, they would have to provide uh, two parking spots, but the two parking spots can occur in, in tandem. Okay. So when they apply for VRU license, they will have to provide two parking spots? They will have to uh, demonstrate uh, that they have sufficient parking. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you for that. So uh, I understand Mary Lou Tanner is in the house. Would you like to address council just before we call the vote? Uh, is this on? 
Great. It's on. It is, yeah. Okay, great. Thank you very much. My name is Mary Lou Tanner, and I am the consultant representing the owner, Marina Holmes, and thank you for your time. I will be uh, brief. We are in support of the staff report and the conditions that are attached to the draft plan of vacant land condominium. We want to thank the staff uh, for uh, the work on this. This has been turned around very quickly, which we do appreciate. Um, we have gone through uh, a lot of work with you, with the community, on the official plan amendment and zoning bylaw, which has been implemented through our work together through the Ontario Land Tribunal and this plan of condominium and the site plan, which is draft approved, do reflect those decisions. I did want to speak very briefly uh, to Councillor Lococo's question about Washington Mills and Salad Steel. So this, these conditions reflect our private agreements with those uh, industries. In addition, when we filed the application, we provided them with all the materials. They have been aware of the process. We have provided them uh, the update on the site plan approval as well as this report to make sure that they were aware of it. Um, they've indicated to us that they'll be taking no position uh, through this process. In terms of the other details, um, Thundering Waters Boulevard will be a municipal road. It does provide access through our property to the end as, as you you did note and we want to work through all of the issues that you've raised tonight with your staff so that we can clear the conditions and move forward with the construction of the housing including the affordable home ownership units we'll be providing with that i thank you for your time i'm happy to answer any questions thank you miss tanner uh well if there's no further questions uh, we're going to call the vote do we have a motion yet i need a motion uh to move the record moved by councillor thompson second by councillor patel okay we're going to call the vote all those in favor Okay, and that's approved. Thank you very much, Ms. Tanner. Thanks for coming out. Ms. Tanner used to be one of the rock stars at the region, one of our rock star planners at the region. Well, uh, with Councillor Baldinelli is opposed, uh, Mr. Clerk, if you could mark that down, please. Uh, moving on to 7.9, um, we've got uh, draft plan of vacant land condominium, 3770 Montrose Road. Uh, what's the will of council? Do we have a... Do we have a motion to move the staff recommendations? Councillor uh, Strange makes the motion, looking for a second. Councillor Lococo, if there's no discussion, we'll call the vote. All those in favor? Okay, and that is unanimous, thank you for that. And then we've got three quick consent agenda items and then we get on to our planning. Okay, motion by Councillor Strange, second by Councillor uh, Thompson to move the consent agenda. We'll call the vote, all those in favor? Okay, and the consent agenda is moved. So, Mr. Clerk. Yes, uh, yes, Councilor Patel. For the... Uh, Sorry, which one? 8.1. 8.1. The tax levy supported operating budget city council approved the city department be allowed to incur costs to a level 50% of the department expenditure budget of the prior year. So what happens if we don't come to that percentage of the budget for the tax levy budget? Okay, Mr. Uh, CAO. Um, Sorry, to you, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, so what it does is it, it just provides, unless this council cuts the budget by more than 50%, which would be uh, traumatic, to, to say the least, uh, well, all it really does is it allows, until the budget is approved, this council has to give authority for staff to spend. So what you're really saying is, you know, you can spend 50% of what you did last year. So that should cover us for the, you know, up until June, if you guys took till June to pass the budget. So it's just a quick way to allow us to continue to pay our bills come January and February when the budget is still in debate. So that's all it does. Okay. So, um, yeah, unless you decide to cut the budget by more than 50% of what we spent last year, right. um, there, it's, it's, just a, it's just a technical mechanism to allow us to continue to spend uh, and pay our payroll. Okay, so once the budget is passed, this, it negates this? The, yeah, it negates it completely. It's just a stopgap measure until a new budget's in place. Okay. Thank you. Okay, we're ready to get started in our planning section of the agenda. So Mr. Clerk, would you please introduce the next item on the agenda? A public meeting is now being convened to consider a proposed amendment to the city's zoning bylaw to permit the development of 44 townhouse dwelling units together with one detached and two semi-detached dwellings at 7769, 7735, and 7751 Thronstone Road. Notice was given by first class mail in accordance with the Planning Act on November 10th, 2023 and by posting a sign on the property in question. Anyone who wants notice of the passing of the zoning bylaw amendment 
or preserve their opportunity to appeal to the Ontario Land Tribunal shall give notice to the City Clerk immediately after today's public meeting or by signing the sign-in sheets that are located just outside the Council Chamber. Okay, thank you. Um, Mr. Clerk, we're now going to ask our planner to explain the purpose and the reason for the proposed uh, bylaw amendment. And we've got Nick De Benedetti, our planner two, who's going to provide the overview. So welcome, Mr. De Benedetti. <laughs> Hello there, Council and, and Your Worship. So we're here, the applicant is the uh, Thorold West Construction, Agent Craig Rowe, and it's a zoning bylaw amendment application, 2023-10, and as indicated by the clerk, to request the site-specific R4 zone to permit 44-unit stacked townhold with 470 detached and one single detached dwelling. Uh, the location is um, on Thorold Stone Road with Shriners Creek to the north, um, residential units to the south. You have a park also to the north. There's a townhome complex to the west, and then there's vacant land and a commercial plaza to the east. The proposal to rezone the subject property to site specific residential R4 and in part an environmental protection area, EPA. The official plan land is designated residential in the official plan and located in the built up area. The development will provide a density of 31.47 units per hectare, uh, which is in, allowed in a density of 20 to 40 units per hectare. The development will provide housing options within the city, uh, located in the built-up area, and the property will utilize existing uh, infrastructure. The lands are currently uh, zoned the DH in accordance with the zoning bylaw 79-200 as amended. Uh, we had an open house on October 25th. Uh, there was a gentleman that attended and then we had further emails uh, in regards to the proposal. Uh, there was some comments and concern that uh, they were looking at a proposed chain link fence adjacent to Shriners Creek to have no gates and they wanted 1.8 meters in height. Uh, so the basic if the applicant will install a 1.8 meter in height chain link fence with no gates. Uh, that the townhouse dwelling units not to be three stories in height. Uh, the, the zoning bylaw will limit it to height to, to two stories and to 11 meters. And the trees along Shriners Creek should not be disturbed. Uh, no trees adjacent to Shriners Creek will be disturbed as they are protected. A 10 meter buffer zone adjacent to, will be established for the protection of any trees. So now requesting zoning relief. Uh, basically, they're looking at adding the use for a single and a detached dwelling to the R4 zone. They're looking at a minor reduction in the rear yard from 7.5 to 6.9 for units 17 specifically. Reduce the interior side yard from 5.5 to 3.1 for the one unit, unit 24. Increase the maximum height from 10 to 11 meters and only two stories in height. And finally, reduce the minimum privacy yard from 7.5 to 6.9 just for unit 17. So basically, council approves zoning by amendment as modified and recommended in report 2023-73. That it? That's it. Okay. Usually the slide says questions, so it's great for that slide. <laughs> Okay, uh, do we have any questions for Mr. De Benedetti, Councilor LaCoco? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through you to Mr. Ben, ben Be De, De, sorry, De, De Benedetti. Benedetti. Yep. Um, it, it talks about on page three that the um, Niagara Regional Environmental Planning reviewed the updated scope of the impact assessment and there's no objection of slight reduction to the water course buffer. What was it supposed to be and what was it reduced to? Is that the 10 meters? Yeah, that was the 10 meters that we're going to implement. And what was it supposed to be? Uh, from from the study, I think it was around 12, and we're just going, to, going down to 10. Okay, and then um, right below that, it says the NPCA permits required for work within 15 meters of the water course. Is that a buffer of 15 meters? I'm well, that that's a that that that'll be the area that's applicable. So if they try to do any work in there, they also have to get permits from the conservation authority. 
Okay, so they're saying 15, but if you're going down to 10. Well, it would still be in that parameter. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Any other Councilor Strange? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. And to Nick, um, so I know there was a few residents that were kind of a little concerned because it was coming on <coughs> to their encroaching on their property. But this is this is an R4. What, they're putting a nice uh, townhouse complex in. For an R4, what could they have put in? What that would really Well, you, you could actually go to an apartment zone because the R4 they could have put up to probably a four or five story apartment building if they needed Yeah, you would have to obviously satisfy the height. But the good thing about that, you have the Shriners Creek and you have that additional buffer. Yeah, you have that buffer. Yeah, you're not right on the there. rear lot line. No, 100%. I just want the residents to know that this this um, this developer that's coming in, he's being <laughs> bright good, pretty good with the two story townhouses and yes. not putting up a big, huge, huge. Uh, apartment complex exactly. and look over everything. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions for Mr. De Benedetti? No? Uh, okay. So now we're going to close the meeting. Oh, first, um, uh, members, thanks very much, Mr. De Benedetti. Members of the public are advised that failure to make an oral or written submission at this public meeting will result in the Ontario Land Tribunal dismissing any referral it receives. Failure to notify the city clerk to preserve their opportunity to appeal will result in staff rejecting an appeal as per section 3419 of the Planning Act. Is there anyone here other than the applicant who wishes to speak to the proposed bylaw amendment? Okay, seeing none, council will now hear from the applicant or his or her representative. I think I would just focus on anything that hasn't been covered yet. Absolutely. <laughs> um, so thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of council, appreciate your time and I am very cognizant of the agenda tonight. So I'll be brief in my remarks. I had a prepared presentation, I'm not gonna, gonna go through that. I just wanted to provide just a couple of clarifications from the staff presentation to make sure that we're all on the same page. Um, with regards to the zoning bylaw amendment, uh, the subject lands are actually, it's currently under two zones. We have development holding, which aligns with the uh, single detached dwellings, which you can see on this map. And then the unaddressed parcel on the left is actually an R5A zone. This was through a zoning bylaw amendment in 1988. It actually permits an apartment building. So we're kind of taking the development holding in this apartment and we're blending into what we feel is a good kind of low medium density development uh, for the subject lands. Um, there was a discussion uh, in a comment in the slide that said that these were stacked townhouses, which is a unit above and below. That's not the case. These are block townhouses uh, for the townhouse element. That's your standard townhouse that you would see in a vacant land condominium. So two stories and in, in accordance with the comments that we heard from the public, two stories is the maximum with a peaked roof on top. It won't be a flat roof structure. So it's to, to keep in keeping with that. Um, with regards to just the question about the uh, EIS that was completed from Councillor Lococo, the required uh, buffer from the Shriners Creek is 10 meters because of the type of fish habitat. You will see that little point that's up there on the map near unit 17. Um, we need to go with a little bit of a pinch point here to just make sure that we have sufficient rear yard. Uh, so the MPCA said that that one meter reduction in that area is not an issue. Uh, so we do need to get a permit. Uh, they have a 30 meter swath of permit control land, 15 on the north. 15 meters on the south, so any development within there requires a permit. So when we go for our site plan approval, our grading plan, any works like that, uh, we need to get a permit from them in order to carry out those works. So we'll have to obtain that before we could get a building permit. Um, but overall, this development, uh, we're, we're trying to make the most use of the land that we can. Uh, we're just at the zoning stage, so our site plan is gonna consist of uh, doing some more detailed engineering studies on this, things like tree preservation. There's a lot of trees on the property, but through our EIS, we determine we're not dealing with a significant woodland, but evaluate those opportunities. We also have 21 visitor parking spaces, two functional spaces per unit uh, for a ratio of about 1.7 parking spaces per unit because we all know we can't park on Thorold Stone Road. Uh, so this will be self-sufficient as a good variety. We have the amenity built in with the playground and we felt that a window street would work well here to landscape that and pedestrian connections out to the street. So overall, a nice compact low density development on a site that's deserving of this development. Very nice. Any questions for Mr. Lowe? Okay. Seeing none, the public meeting with respect to the proposed zoning bylaw amendment is now concluded. Motion by Councillor Thompson, seconded by Councillor Lococo. There's no, uh, Councillor uh, Strange? Yeah, again, I'd just like to say, Mr. Mayor, and I, I, I commend the developer for listening to the residents um, because they didn't want to be intruded by a six story uh, apartment building, which he probably could have put there uh, with the zoning. Yep. And he put up a nice 
uh, low density, two story uh, townhouse complex, which is gonna really beautify that area. That's great, thank you very much. Uh, then I'm gonna call the vote. All those in favor? Okay, and that's unanimous. Great job, thank you very much. Okay. All right, we ready, Mr. Clerk, for the next one. Uh, Mr. Clerk, please introduce the next item on the agenda. You guys can hang around if you like. There's a lot more excitement coming. I might, but uh, <laughs> bye guys, thank you. Hey, thank you. A public meeting is now being convened to consider a proposed amendment to the city zoning bylaw to permit the development of nine townhouse dwelling units together with three detached dwellings at 3151 Montrose Road plus one additional vacant parcel to the north. Notice was given by first class mail in accordance with the Planning Act on November the 10th, 2023, and by posting a sign on the property in question. Anyone who wants notice of the passing of the zoning bylaw amendment or preserve their opportunity to appeal to the Ontario Land Tribunal shall give notice to the city clerk immediately after today's public meeting or by signing the sign in sheet located outside council chamber. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. We're now going to ask Mr. De Benedetti, our planner two, to explain the purpose and reason for the proposed bylaw amendment. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we're here to allow us to speak to zoning bylaw application AM 2023-20. Again, the proposal is to permit the nine townhouse dwelling and units in two blocks with three single detached dwelling one with the existing house, and one would be fronting on Montrose Road. Uh, the, the area uh, where we're looking at the location, uh, it's on the west side of Montrose Road, uh, which singles onto the west and south side, the hydro field to the north side with uh, two other singles, and townhomes to the east with a, a further development that will be on the next uh, item in regards to our further development of uh, there's more townhomes to the east side. Proposal to rezone the townhomes um, and two of the dwellings under a site specific R4 zone and they place a third detached dwelling in front onto Montrose Road with a site specific R1E zone. The land is designated, again, uh, in the official plan in the built-up area. Um, the development will provide a density of 21.42 units per hectare, which complies with the density of 20 to 40. The development will provide housing options, again, in the city of Niagara Falls, located in the built-up area, and again, will utilize existing municipal infrastructure. Uh, the lands are currently zoned R1A, amended by bylaw 1995-1. Or six in part, R1E as amended by bylaw 2018 054 in part, and bylaw uh, residential R1C density 384 in part, uh, which is bylaw 1995 146. Now, an open house was held on November 6. Uh, it was attended by basically, we had emails in regards to the proposal, and there were the comments and concerns were that. One of the issues was there were no law to have parking on the private street and only single car driveways. Now, the single car driveway can't be supported as there are five additional uh, visitor parking spaces and also there's parking in the garage for each unit with double driveways provided for the detached dwellings. Uh, fire services will review at the, at the plan of subdivision stage if there's an opportunity to post fire access route signs, which will have no parking on the private street. There was also concern about, uh, again, fire concerns and garbage collection. Uh, city's fire service reviewed the proposal and stated that it complies with the city standards for uh, the fire access routes. Uh, the garbage collection will be a normal collection with dumpsters on the, or there would be no dumpsters and no garbage enclosures. And garbage pads can be placed on lot two and block five for garbage collection. And then the third item was snow removal and privacy adjacent to unit three. Now uh, there's an area behind the uh, visitor parking area that would allow for the storage of snow. Uh, during a heavy snow event, it could be uh, the trucks will be able to be contracted and moved out uh, the snow through a future condominium and through the board. And a limited number of windows will be placed on the side yard of unit three adjacent to the rear yard property. Uh, 
Request a zoning relief. So part one, the, the, we're basically going to add the use of a single detached dwelling to the R4 zone. Part one, we're going to reduce the minimum yard, rear yard width from 7.5 to 2. And for unit three, uh, and then three to three meters for unit one, and reduce interior side yard from three meters to 2.69 for unit six, and two meters for unit 11. And then for the part two, which is the single, is we're basically reduced the rear yard from 7.5 uh, down to seven, as indicated on unit two. So in summary, uh, basically, uh, the council approves zoning bylaw amendment as modified and recommend, recommended in report PDD 23-74. Thank you. Any questions for Mr. DeBenedetti? Councilor DeCoco. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. There's a comment in here. It says that it's near agricultural uses that regional staff will look into implementing agricultural warning. Can Mr. David Benedetti explain that a little bit further? So adjacent to the hydro field, that area is zoned and designated agriculture. So I guess um, through their review, as when we go through the plan of subdivision, they just want a study to confirm that there's no uh, future impact from that agriculture use to the north. Okay, and um, through the mayor, so no impact from the agricultural to the, the development. What about from the development to the Vice agricultural? Vice versa, they'd be looking at both sides. They'd both be looking sides. at both, okay. Yes. And the other two are more comments, maybe not questions. Uh, we talk about nine parking spaces more in the garage and I'm seeing that on other um, applications that we're now counting parking spaces in the garage. I know parking is an issue, land's an issue, the cost of land, I get that, it's just sort of ironic. Um, and then about it not being affordable, 650,000 townhouse, because of the cost of the land in irregular shape, and I'm seeing those comments on a couple of the applications, irregular shape and the cost of land. A lot of the developments are going to be the cost of land in irregular shape. So I hope we don't keep seeing that with a, with a reason not to be affordable. I, I don't have a problem with this development. I'm just seeing the, the same comments coming in some of our what applications. What was the comment you said with um, That it's not affordable. One of the reasons is the cost of land and a regular shape of the land. Regular. Irregular. Irregular shape. Right. And it's, okay. on, it's on another one tonight as well. Yeah. So it's, it, I'm just seeing some of the same comments to come up and I just wanted to comment on it. Okay. Thank you. thank you for that. Any other? Yes, Councillor Strange. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, and if I'm not uh, wrong, the the neighboring property just got put in, like the agriculture property, that just got in, put inside the urban boundary, did it not? No, not in this area. Not in that area? No. I'm pretty sure. Andrew Bryce? Uh, uh, just through you, uh, your, your, your worship, yes, uh, it was just incorporated uh, uh, through the regional policy plan amendment. Under the city's official plan and zoning, it's still designated yeah, and zoned. But it, but it just got but, put in, so it's, it's going to have their secondary plan done, and most likely this will be residential beside it. Yes, eventually uh, it will be, uh, it will be uh, developed for urban purposes. Uh, okay. That might be residential. Okay, perfect. Thank you. But, but currently, I did it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But moving just, forward, yes. Yeah, yeah sorry. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes, Councillor Patel. Through you, Mr. Mayor, to Mr. Benedetti. Uh, about the garbage collection, you said they could uh, they will have to put garbage on a Montrose Road if there is no dumpster. The garbage truck cannot go inside to pick up the garbage from front of the houses. They they can. They would, as indicated, there is a there would be the garbage pads. So they're under the, that specific lot in that unit, they can place it there. Uh, there is uh, a further review that uh, when we go through the plan of subdivision, if it's going to be private, then. Uh, uh, they would have to satisfy the turning templates, but on the initial review, they, uh, if the region was going in there, they can make the turns and everything. Uh, to you, Mr. Mayor. When it comes to dumpster, it brings lots of problem with the dumpster, with the rodents and smell, because the, it is a developed area behind this uh, proposed, uh, uh, the proposed pack, uh, parcel. So can we make a clause? Can we put a clause into the zoning bylaw uh, that there is no dumpster? No, there's, there, even in the report that there's not going to be no dumpster or garbage enclosure. Okay, there's no dumpster. No, no, okay. no dumpster, no garbage enclosure. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, seeing none, thank you, Mr. DeBenedetti. Members of the public are advised that failure to make an oral or written submission at this public meeting will result in the Ontario <coughs> Land Tribunal dismissing any referral it receives. Failure to notify the city clerk to preserve their opportunity to appeal 
will result in staff rejecting an appeal as per section 3419 of the Planning Act. Council now hear from anyone other than the applicant who wishes to speak to the proposed bylaw amendment. Is there anyone to speak to this other than the applicant? Okay, seeing none, council will now hear from the applicant or his or her representative. And I'd suggest anything new you have to offer would be welcome. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And members of council, uh, Mr. De Benedetti did a wonderful job and covered just about everything. Um, I just want to reiterate that there will be either public collection of waste or private waste collection. Um, should this application for zoning bylaw amendment be approved, we'll be coming forward with a plan of subdivision and a subsequent plan of condominium to create the tenure of the units. So this is the first step to allow for the development of this property. Um, and we'd just like to note that Okay, now I can control it. Um, one of the key items in the design of this development has been that we are maintaining the existing house that's there, incorporating it into the overall design. Um, and many of the requests for amendment to the zoning bylaw that have been made are as a result of the way in which we're creating the lots through the plan of condominium. Um, the rear yard setback will then be a side yard setback. We've also uh, are proposing and will be constructing bungalow offs or one and one half story dwellings for the towns as well as for the single to minimize any overlook and any impact on the existing residents to the west and to the south. Mm -hmm. And I'm available for any questions should you have them. Are there any questions of council? Okay, I think we're good. Thank you. The public meeting with respect to, to the proposed zoning bylaw amendment is now concluded. What's the will of council? Motion by Councillor Strange, second by Councillor Peter Angelo, that we move the recommendation. We'll call the vote on that. All those in favor? Okay, and that's unanimous. Thank you for that. <coughs> Mr. Clerk, would you please introduce the next item on the agenda? A public meeting is now being convened to consider a proposed amendment to the city zoning bylaw to permit the development of six townhouse dwelling units together with a semi-detached dwelling at 3090 Montrose Road. Notice was given by First Class Mail in accordance with the Planning Act on November 10, 2023 and by posting a sign on the property in question. Anyone who wants notice of the passing of the zoning bylaw amendment or preserve their opportunity to appeal to the Ontario Land Tribunal shall give notice to the city clerk immediately after today's public meeting or by signing the sign-in sheet located outside council chamber. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. There go here. All right, now I'm gonna ask Mr. De Benedetti to get, come up here one more time. He is our planner too, and he's a busy, busy guy tonight. And I'm gonna ask him if he'd please explain the purpose and the reason for the proposed bylaw amendment. <laughs> you think by now you, you know, right? It's your third one. I'm slipping over here. Sorry, guys. <laughs> uh, we're here to discuss zoning bylaw amendment application 2023-24. Uh, it's the applicant is a numbered company, and the agent is Greg Terrace. Basically, we're here to request a site-specific R4 zone to permit a semi-detached dwelling and six townhouse dwellings. The loca location is across the street from the proposal we just discussed, uh, adjacent to the highway. Again, there's a hydro corridor to the north, and then there's a, uh, a subdivision uh, to the south, and again, singles, and the future proposal to the west. So the proposal is basically to rezone the subject property to R4 site-specific zoning. The land is designated residential and official plan and located in the built up area. The development will provide a density of 28.5 units per hectare, which again is in between the 20 and 40 units per hectare. Uh, again, the development is providing some additional housing options within the city and located in the built up area and the property will use existing services. 
The subject lands are currently zoned in DH, <laughs> Development Holding Zone, in accordance with 79-200. We just had one uh, email, and basically it was a similar comment. It was the same uh, email in, in regards to no parking on the private street and single car driveways. And again, the single car driveway can be supported because there, there are four additional parking spaces for the visitors parking. And again, there's parking in the garage for each unit. Uh, fire services will review at the plan of subdivision. And again, if there will be an opportunity to post uh, fire access route signs, which will allow no parking on the private street. The requested zoning relief. So basically part one is to add the use of the semi detached dwelling to the R4 zone, uh, reduce the minimum lot front of, from 30 down to 24.22 and to reduce the minimum interior side yard from 4.61 to 1.2 for the one unit and 1.22 for unit six. So basically we're here to recommendation is that the council approve the zoning bylaw amendment as modified and recommended in report 2023-75. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. DeBenedetti. Do we have any questions of council? Okay, seeing none. Thank you very much, Mr. DeBenedetti. Members of the public are advised that failure to make an oral or written submission at this public meeting will result in the Ontario Land Tribunal dismissing any referral that it receives. Failure to notify the city clerk to preserve their opportunity to appeal will result in staff rejecting an appeal as per section 3419 of the Planning Act. Council will now hear from anyone other than the applicant who wishes to speak to the proposed bylaw amendment. Mr. Clerk, do we have anyone registered to speak to this? We do not. Is there anyone here to speak to this? Okay, seeing, no, not, not to, other than the applicant. Okay, council will now hear from the, uh, the applicant or his or her representative. So unless you, we'll be looking for anything that's been left out. Yeah, no, I, uh, thank you, um, Mayor Diodati and members of council. My name is Greg Terrace. I'm a senior planner with urban environmental management here in Niagara Falls. And uh, I think uh, Nick, uh, Mr. Benedetti did an excellent job of presenting the proposal. Uh, the only thing I did want to add is that um, there will be a noise barrier wall constructed along the rear of the property uh, because of the QEW highway. We are working with the adjacent uh, subdivision at this time so that we're not creating separate um, noise barrier walls to continue this one on this property. This will allow us to avoid creating the wing wall in between the two properties uh, right now. So we're hoping to avoid that. Um, other than that, there's really nothing I, I have to add. Uh, we support the uh, uh, planning staff report and looking forward to bringing this further to uh, council for approvals. Great, any questions for Mr. Terrace? Okay, so that's great. Thank you very much. Thank you. The public meeting with respect to the proposed zoning bylaw amendment is now concluded. What's the will of council? Motion by Councillor Strange. Uh, motion by Councillor Thompson, seconding it. We'll call that vote then. All those in favor? Okay, and that's unanimous. Thank you for that. All right. Mr. Clerk, please introduce the next item on the agenda. <laughs> Public meeting is now being convened to consider a proposed amendment to the city's zoning bylaw to permit a 43 apartment dwelling unit stacked townhouse development at 5809, 5821, and 5829 McLeod Road. Notice was given by first class mail in, a, in accordance with the Planning Act on November 10, 2023, and by posting a sign on the property in question. Anyone who wants notice of the passing of the zoning bylaw amendment or preserve their opportunity to appeal to the Ontario Land Tribunal shall give notice to the city clerk immediately after today's public meeting or by signing the sign-in sheet located just outside council chamber. Thank you very much, Mr. Clerk. I'm now gonna ask once again, Mr. De Benedetti, planner two, who turned his microphone on this time, um, okay, Mr. KJ be happy about that, to explain the purpose and reason for the proposed bylaw amendment. Okay, your worship through council. Uh, this is zoning bylaw amendment application A22-330. Um, now I've been actually working with the applicant for 
a while, for a couple of years on this. We've been going back and forth uh, for different type of applications, and we finally came up with this. So you can see that's in a 22 file, so it's been a little bit. Uh, so basically, it's a numbered company, the agent's Tom Vanny. Uh, the proposal is to request a site-specific R5C density to permit three stacked townhomes with a total of 43 units. The location is basically we're um, on McLeod Road there on the north side um, where there's uh, semis to the north, there's vacant parcels to the east, there are townhomes uh, just immediately to the northwest and then there's singles along the west side there. The official plan, the land is designated residential in accord with the official plan located in the McLeod Road intensification corridor. The development will provide, again, new housing options with the City of Niagara Falls. The proposal intensifies the residential use of the property and increases the density to 103 units per hectare, which is supported in the intensification corridor. And again, the property will, will utilize existing municipal, municipal infrastructure. Uh, the subject land is currently zoned R4 in accordance with 79-200. Uh, an open house meeting was held on October 23rd. Uh, there was no comments received and there was no public in attendance. The requested zoning relief. Uh, they reduced the minimum lot area from 100 square meters down to 98.46, which is a minor reduction. They reduce the minimum side yard from 6.27 to 5. They reduce the minimum landscape from 40 to 38 percent, and reduce the parking standard from 1.4 to 1.25. And then the one last uh, departure is they increase the balcony projection into the interior side yard from 0 0.45 to 1.6 to add a little bit more amenity area. Planning it. Analysis, the land is designated residential in the official plan and again located on the intensifi intensification corridor. Uh, you're basically intensifying the residential use and increasing the density. And again, we'll be utilizing the existing municipal infrastructure. Finally, a uh, recommendation that council approve zoning bylaw amendment as modified and recommended in report PBD 2023-72. Okay, thank you, Mr. DeMandadetti. Are there any questions of members of council? Okay, members of the public are advised that failure to make an oral or written submission at this public meeting will result in the Ontario Land Tribunal dismissing any referral it receives. Failure to notify the city clerk to preserve their opportunity to appeal will result in staff rejecting an appeal as per section 3419 of the Planning Act. Council will hear from anyone other than the applicant who wishes to speak to the proposed bylaw amendment. Mr. Clerk, is there anyone who wishes to speak? No one registered. No one registered. Okay. Uh, Council will now hear from the applicant or his or her representative. Come forward. Hello. Oh, hello. Is there someone on the line? Yeah, there's, there's. Uh, hello, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the agent, agent on the line. S sorry. A agent on the line. My agent on the line. Okay, your agent is on the yeah. line. Yes, I can hear you. Yeah. Hello. I just need to right. Okay. Darshan? Hello. Uh, Mr. Clark, if I may, uh, perhaps there's a, a bit of a language barrier. Uh, my name is Maurizio Logato. I'm a registered professional planner. Uh, I was retained to prepare the planning justification report uh, for the proposed zoning bylaw amendment and development. Um, uh, and therefore, I just simply wanted to thank uh, staff for their presentation. Uh, we agree with the presentation and we're happy to answer any questions and look forward to the advancement of the proposed development. Okay, Thank thanks, you. Mauricio. I'll see if there's any questions for members of council. All right, do we have any questions for members of council? Seeing none, where are we at, Mr. Clark? <laughs> yeah.
Okay, no, no, I know. Okay, so are we close the public meeting? You can do that now and entertain the motion. Okay, so uh, I'm, okay, give me one second. The public meeting with respect to the proposed zoning bylaw amendment is now concluded. Uh, Councilor Lococo. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. 375,000 to 425,000 affordable housing units. I'm so happy that this development is there. It's really bringing in affordable units into our community. So I'd be happy to put the motion forward. Okay. Motion by Councilor Lococo, seconded by Councilor Patel. If there's no discussion to that, we'll call the vote. All those in favor? Okay, and that's unanimous. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, members of council, and happy holidays. Thank you Thank very you. much. Same as you, same to you. Hey, Mr. Clerk, would you please introduce the next item on the agenda? A public meeting is now being convened to consider a proposed amendment to the city's zoning bylaw to permit three detached dwelling units uh, and facilitate three conditionally approved consent applications north of Lyons Creek Parkway between Ord Road and Lyons Creek, partially known as 4949 Lyons Parkway. Notice was given by first class mail in accordance with the Planning Act on November 10th, 2023, and by posting a sign on the property in question. Anyone who wants notice of the passing of the zoning bylaw amendment or preserve their opportunity to appeal to the Ontario Land Tribunal shall give notice to the city clerk immediately after today's public meeting or by signing the sign-in sheet located outside council chamber. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. I'd like to now ask Alexa Cooper, Planner 2, to explain the purpose and reason for the proposed bylaw amendment. Thank you, and good evening, Mayor Diodati and members of council. As mentioned, my name is Alexa Cooper, and I'm here to present staff's recommendation report to permit a total of three de detached dwelling units on the subject land. So the location of the property is uh, between Lions Creek to the north, Lions Parkway to the east, and Ort Road to the west. To the south is a detached lot, and then beyond that a treed lot. To the east there's some detached dwellings, part of Chippewa. To the north, Lions Creek. And then to the west, uh, a detached lot, and the red dash line you see there is the city's urban boundary line. So the subject land received conditional approval from the Committee of Adjustment in March 2023 to sever the property into three lots. Some of the conditions of that consent included the extension of Ort Road, the extension of services from Lyons Creek, or sorry, pardon me, from Lyons Parkway over to Ort Road, uh, and then a tree preservation plan for the lots with access from our Ort Road, uh, and to rezone the land the appropriate residential and environmental zones. The applications uh, have now been submitted to amend the subject land to facilitate the conditionally approved consent applications. So currently the subject lands are zoned rural in part and conservation open space in part under our Willoughby zoning bylaw. And this small corner you can see um, in red is under 79200 and it's a site specific R1C zone. The application is requesting that the land be rezoned to two site-specific R1E density zones to permit the three detached <coughs> dwelling units and as well as an environmental protection zone area under bylaw 79200. So the concept plan here shows the three lots that will be created. So part one in red will be one, the part two in purple will be a second, and then parts three and four in blue will be the third. <coughs> The site specifics that the applicant has requested include a minimum rear yard depth of 1.2 meters for each of the proposed lots, where is required is 7.5, and then a minimum lot frontage of three meters for part two, and then for the lot on part three and part four, where normally 12 meters is required. Staff recommend um, that an R1C zone, as opposed to the R1E zone requested, uh, be approved and that the full 7.5 meter rear yard depth be required and a lot frontage of 6.3 meters also be uh, recommended for the other two lots. So for the R1C zone, uh, this is to reflect adjacent residential properties in the area. In addition, the minimum lot frontage and area can be met for part one and the minimum lot area can be met for part two and three. For the minimum rear yard depth, 
uh, 7.5 is recommended to ensure adequate private amenity space is located on the property for each dwelling as the EPA zone is intended for environmental protection. And finally, for lot frontage, 6.3 meters is recommended as the concept plan we were just looking at shows it can be met and it will also ensure maximum lot frontage can be provided for access to the property. An open house was held on October 19, 2023, where the following concerns were received. So there were concerns about the extent of tree removal on the property. As a condition of the approved consent applications, a tree preservation plan was required to be submitted for parts one and two for review and approval in accordance with the region's woodland conservation bylaw. There was concerns about the proper installation of services and again as a condition of consent the applicant is required to enter into an agreement with the city for the extension of municipal services through the subject lands from Lyons Parkway to Ort Road. And finally there were concerns about a, three, a through road being constructed from Lyons Creek to Ort Road. Um, there's no through road proposed, the municipality will not be taking on any roadways, there is only driveway access proposed, one for for part three off of Lyons Creek and then two off of uh, Ort Road for parts one and two. And Ort Road will have to be extended as mentioned in order to gain um, that access. So f in conclusion, staff recommend that council approve the proposed zoning bylaw amendment application with the recommended modifications that I outlined in my presentation and are contained in staff's report on tonight's agenda. Thank you. That's great. Thank you. Any questions of council? Uh, Councilor Lococo. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, in the report, it says that staff do not support the rezoning to R1E, but rather R residential 1C because of the natural features in the 15 min, uh, meter buffer. And then it also says that staff reviewed the EIS satisfied that could avoid um, negatively impacting the natural and eco features if mitigation measures were uh, implemented. Can uh, Ms. Cooper expand on that? I'm a little concerned about the, the 15 minute, uh, 15 minute, 15 meter buffer, and then if uh, mitigation member, mitigation uh, measures were implemented. Okay, Ms. Cooper. Yeah, through you, Mr. Mayor. Um, the staff are, are not in support of the R1E designation across the residential portion, rather R1C to fit with the neighborhood. The EPA zone that's proposed along the PSW, the wetlands, as well as the 15 meter associated buffer. Uh, staff have no objection to that and are in support of it in order to preserve um, the EPA area. Um, as far as mitigation measures, as part of the consent application, when the developer enters into an agreement with the city for the extension of services, they are going to have to put into that development agreement the mitigation measures that were recommended as part of the EIS. So that's how we will get them to sign an agreement that says we will make sure that we implement these mitigation measures. Okay, thank you. The word if was a little scary. And my last one was, um, it talks about cost sharing for extending municipal services. Would that be normal for the city to do cost sharing in a development like this that the municipal services are, are not used for anything else? No, oh, that'd be a, yeah, Mr. Nichol, question. Yeah, through you, Mr. Mayor, this is a bit of a special circumstance. Our development charges background study had oversizing for sewers to connect through what was a former road allowance, but it was sold off and is now being developed in order to get services to Ort Road. So there's a small portion there where development charges will be used to, um, to fund our share of the oversizing because the size for local servicing is small diameter, but we need them to be larger to connect for those future connections. It's a very unusual and special circumstance just based on this location. Thank you, through, through the mayor. So we sold off the road allowance and because of that, we have to do something different now? Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, it was actually never our road allowance. So okay. it was never sold, it was just never acquired. And so it was now being developed. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you, any other questions? We're all good, thank you very much, Ms. Cooper. Members of the public are advised that failure to make an oral or written submission at this public meeting will result in the Ontario Land Tribunal dismissing any referrals it receives. Failure to notify the city clerk to preserve their opportunity to appeal will result in staff rejecting an appeal as per section 3419 of the Planning Act. Council will now hear from anyone other than the applicant who wishes to speak to the proposed bylaw amendment. Mr. Clerk, do we have anyone registered? Uh, yes, Your Worship, we do have two uh, people that had previously registered, and they're both attending online. 
Uh, the first one would be Leslie Lawn. Leslie Lawn? Not like Lawn? L-A-W-A? L-A-A-N. Okay. Two okay. okay. Ms. Lawn, are you there? I am. Okay, great. Well, welcome to the meeting. Hello, thank you, and thank you for the opportunity to speak. And again, thank you all for the great work you guys are all doing on our behalf. Um, I don't know, I can't see myself on screen, so I don't know if I'm fully in my picture or if I'm cutting my head off or not anyway. We can't see uh, either, so we're okay. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, I would, I can appreciate the work and the effort that staff has gone into um, and the adjustment, uh, Committee of Adjustment has gone through with regard to this application. Um, I... I could see possibly putting maybe one home in this, but three plus the ancillary outbuildings that would go along with detached dwellings in this area, I think will really um, disrupt a couple of things. And my main concern is that um, I realize that there's been a lot of accommodation with regard to the uh, provincially significant wetland out in front. Of, or in, on the Lions Creek side of this property, on the north side of the property, and um, kudos to that. But I think um, designating the wood lot or tree lot that is on the south side of this property is kind of shortchanging it because I believe um, in some of the regional mapping that <coughs> is designated as a provincially significant woodland slash slough forest. Um, and with regard to that, it hosts a number of uh, um, species um, and not only hosts it, but it, it offers um, a variety of their um, seasonal um, migration and hibernation areas. Um, I find that um, I'm a little concerned because the EIS was done back in 2017, I believe, which is six years ago. I know a lot has changed since then, including a lot of our um, provincial planning definitions. And unfortunately, those have been changed um, probably not for the environmental protection that we would like to see. Um, my main concern is that you have a very functional and um, vibrant uh, climate, extreme climate weather mitigation um, tool existing between the woodland and the wetland. Um, you've got a lot of concrete in the area with the uh, Chippewa West subdivision abutting the tree lot. Um, I know there's development all along Lyons Parkway and because of the concrete in the area and the hard and non-porous <laughs> surfaces in that area, an awful lot of the water that runs off of that subdivision goes into that woodlot and eventually percolates through this property. Um, as it percolates through, it also filters. Uh, because of the riparian um, buffer that exists there now. And my concern is that, one, the disruption that's going to occur with both the road and driveway construction, um, with the excavation um, that's required to put through the infrastructure to Ort Road, all of these things will have a very... Um, I guess a, a negative impact on the hydrological function of this property in this area. And I know that they say that they're going to mitigate this with ditching, but then you lose that filtering um, portion of um, what the transfer of water from the tree and the slough area forest behind on the south side to the creek. Um, this little slice of property, it may not seem significant, but it does probably do quite a significant job, hence the vitality and the health of that little wetland on um, the north side of that property. Um, it's also migration 
um, routes for a lot of both amphibian and at-risk um, reptiles in the area uh, for winter migration, nest laying, those types of things. And I understand that the EIS was scoped, which means that it was probably mostly done as a desktop type of thing, and it may not be um, as complete as we would like. Um, and I think that going ahead, I didn't really see, um, I don't know, I guess they weren't on, I didn't see any length of actual time that they were on the land in the EIS. I would have liked to have seen um, more than, you know, once one year and once another year. Um, I just, I feel that there have been some, maybe some corners that have been cut here. Um, and I also have a great concern about, uh, you put three detached dwellings in this area and something that wasn't brought up, that was, I believe, brought up at the uh, open house and was not mentioned in the staff's report is the concern about dockage. Okay, nobody purchases or builds, or not usually, people don't build a water front property without wanting to put docks and access to that waterfront in. And because you're dealing with um, a significant wetland there, and it does have intact colonies of right now of an endangered species, which is the American water willow, fronting the whole property. There, I went out on an afternoon in my canoe and I, I videoed at least five colonies with um, stem counts between, um, I would say, 50 and 150 in each colony. And these may seem like small or colony sizes, but for a species that's endangered in our area, this is significant. And I think it needs to be taken into consideration. In the EIS, it was said that it was in the vicinity, which is a very um, open-ended statement. And I don't know that any of the actual um, EIS uh, plant studies were done from the water. Um, some of these things could be seen from land. Ms. Lon, Ms. Lon, I'm going to have to. I'm going to have to ask you to wrap up because it, it is a five-minute time limit. We're at seven minutes now, so I can ask you to wrap up. I'm sorry. Thank you. Um, so yeah. Anyway, they um, there are significant um, established colonies there. Um, so I would, I would have a tendency to maybe take a little closer look at the EIS and take into consideration what an amazing and functional um, extreme weather um, event mitigation tool you have as it exists right now um, before possibly going forward with this. I would think I would want maybe a little more in-depth study and recognition of the property as it stands as it is and its function as it is. So thank you again for the opportunity for speaking and um, I appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Mr. Clerk, do we, you said we had two speakers? No. Our second speaker uh, is not uh, online. Uh, you could check to see if there's anyone in the gallery before turning that over to the applicant. Thank you very much. Uh, is there anyone? Uh, yes, Councillor Lococo. I was wondering if Ms. Cooper could respond to any of the comments that Ms. Land said. Yep, well, asked. why don't I first see if there's okay. anyone else Thanks. and then she can address any of the concerns if there's anyone else. Council will now hear from anyone other than the applicant who wishes to speak to the proposed bylaw amendment. Is there anyone other than the applicant? Okay, seeing none. So, Ms. Cooper, uh, might you address the comments of Ms. Lon? From yeah, the EIS, of course. Please? Yes. Um, so, I do recall hearing about a uh, concern about docks. With the EPA zoning, a dock wouldn't be permitted to be constructed in the waterway. In addition to that, uh, so they would have to go through a rezoning process in order to permit it. In addition to that, it is also regulated by the MPCA, so they would need permits from the MPCA before they could build um, a dock in the water. As far as um, the EIS comments go, um, I recognize it was originally 
done in 2017. There were further updates to it in 2020 and 2021. Because we have a bit of a history with this file, with the two consent applications that have come and gone through, that would be the, the reasoning for the, the years associated um, with it. But that being said, during the consent review process, both in 2021 and 2023, the region and the MPCA uh, accepted the findings of the EIS and they had no objection to the EIS that the applicant provided. Uh, in addition to that, through the rezoning application, the MPCA didn't comment because they commented through the consent application process, but the region did provide comments um, specifically saying, I'm just gonna flip here, um, that they're satisfied that the development could avoid negatively impacting the natural features and ecological functions of the core natural heritage system if the re recommended mitigation measures were implemented, which, as I mentioned earlier, they will be through the development agreement. So I think, I think that captured all the questions. I think so. Thank you for that. Okay, thank you. Okay. Council now hear from the applicant or his or her representative. Is the applicant uh, here, Mr. Craig? Uh, we do have uh, Mr. Craig Corey, uh, the applicant. He is uh, available virtually. Okay. Um, are you there, Mr. Corey? I am, Mr. Mayor. Thank okay. you uh, for having me here and members of council. Um, I'm just here to answer any questions anyone may have. Um, I just wanted to uh, let Leslie know there's been no corners cut. Um, every report has been done, which is very time consuming and expensive. Now um, here, well, applicant or his or her representative. So I'm here to answer any questions. Okay, that's great, thank you. Are there any questions of counsel for Mr. Corey? Yes, uh, Councilor Patel. To you, Mr. Mayor, were there any wild, wildlife impact studies done on this lands, Mr. Corey? Yes, that was also included in the environmental impacts uh, study. Okay, great. Thank okay, you thank for that. You. Okay, that was in the EIS as well. So if there are no further questions, the public meeting with respect to the proposed zoning bylaw amendment is now concluded. What's the will of council? Uh, Councilor Strange, move the recommendation. Second by Councilor Peter Angelo. If there's no further discussion, we'll call the vote. All those in favor? Okay, and that's unanimously approved. Thank you for that. On this? Yeah. This just is the nine seven. Yeah, that's what we're on. I thought we're at nine seven. No? Don't don't wish the night away. <laughs> I can wish it if I want. Mr. Clerk, can you introduce the next item on the agenda, please? Public meeting is now being convened to consider a proposed amendment to the city's zoning bylaw to per to permit the construction of a semi detached dwelling uh, on the south side of Hawkins Street. Notice was given by first class mail in accordance with the Planning Act on October 26, 2023 and by posting a sign on the property in question. Anyone who wants notice of the passing of the zoning bylaw amendment or preserve their opportunity to appeal to the Ontario Land Tribunal shall give notice to the city clerk immediately after today's public meeting or by signing the sign in sheet located outside council chamber. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. I'm now going to ask Danielle Foley, working in our planning department, to explain the purpose and the reason for the proposed bylaw amendment. Uh, good evening, Mayor Diodati and members of council. As mentioned, my name is Danielle Foley, and I'm here to present an overview of the recommendation report for the zoning bylaw amendment application on Hawkins Street to permit a semi detached dwelling. Um, here's a location map for the subject lands located on Hawkins Street to the east of Adams Avenue. The lands are currently vacant. Surrounding the subject property are primarily detached dwellings. To the west of the lands is a parcel of vacant land zoned R4 multi-residential and further west on the corner of Hawkins and Adams Avenue is a church. Uh, and then to the southeast is a three-story apartment building. So under the official plan, the lands are designated residential and a semi-detached dwelling would be a permitted use under this designation. The land is currently zoned R1C in part as well as um, R4 in part under zoning bylaw 79-200. Um, as semi-detached dwellings are not permitted under the current zoning, the applicant is requesting to rezone the land to a site-specific R2 zone to permit that dwelling type. And to facilitate this proposal, zoning relief is requested for a reduced lot frontage. So the site-specific zoning relief that is requested can be seen on the slide 
Um, the applicant has proposed a reduction to the minimum lot frontage requirement from the 18 meters required uh, for the R2 zone to 15.2 meters. Uh, staff are proposing an additional provision be included in the amending bylaw to require a further front yard setback of three meters from the front main wall of the dwelling uh, to apply to the attached private garages. And this is recommended to implement urban design best practices by maintaining the existing streetscape and then ensuring that the garages are not a prominent feature of the dwelling. Um, here the conceptual elevations for the proposal provided by the applicant can be seen. Um, a public open house was held on November 9th and two members of the public attended. Um, a concern was compatibility of the proposal with the existing neighborhood uh, and staff's response is that the proposal follows all zoning regulations uh, and has a built form consistent with that that could be built as of right under the current zoning. Um, concerns with parking were also raised and in response parking services identified that on-street parking is permitted. Um, there are no parking restrictions on Hawkins Street and the only potential issue would be uh, parking too close to a driveway which would be addressed on a complaint basis. Um, in terms of traffic volumes and safety, a low volume of traffic is anticipated to be generated for this proposal. Uh, transportation services completed an assessment uh, in response to resident concerns and as a result they are recommending that the yield signs uh, be replaced with stop signs at the three intersections along Hawkins Street, uh, which includes the one directly across from this proposal. Um, additionally, uh, transportation services indicated that the proposed driveway location uh, across from that T-style intersection with Paisley has no safety concerns. Um, and then lastly, regarding property values, there would be no evidence to suggest that uh, there would be a negative impact on property values. Uh, written comments were, were received from one member of the public uh, in support of the proposal um, as they supported introducing new compatible housing forms in the neighborhood. Um, however, concerns were raised regarding the poor condition of Hawkins Street and Adams Avenue. Uh, staff forwarded these comments to Municipal Works and they identified that there are underlying buried infrastructure concerns that need to be dealt with prior to these roadworks which would be incorporated into the city's 10-year capital plan. Um, so in conclusion, staff recommend that council approve the zoning bylaw amendment to permit the development of a semi-detached dwelling subject to the modifications and regulations outlined in report number PBD 2023-77. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Foley. Any questions of council? Thank you, Ms. Foley. Great job. Any questions of council? Councillor Lococo. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I guess I haven't seen a semi-detached when it says future severance uh, application to divide along the common wall. So is this, will it, for, for separate ownership, I do understand that. Is this the normal procedure? I guess I just haven't seen something like that. I guess through you to Ms. Foley. Yeah, uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, Councillor Lococo, thank you for the question. I believe it is standard practice if they are permitting separate ownership of the two units that it would go through a consent. Okay, thank you. Okay, great, thank you for that. Any other questions of council for Ms. Foley? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Members of the public are advised that failure to make an oral or written submission at this public meeting will result in the Ontario Land Tribunal dismissing any referral it receives. Failure to notify the city clerk to preserve their opportunity to appeal will result in staff rejecting an appeal as per section 3419 of the Planning Act. Council will now hear from anyone other than the applicant who wishes to speak to the proposed bylaw amendment. Mr. Clerk, do we have anyone registered? Uh, yes, we do have Mr. Frank DeLuca who is registered online. Okay. He's attending virtually. Okay. Mr. DeLuca, are you there? Yes, I am. Oh, welcome to the meeting. Can you hear me? Yep, yeah, we can hear you fine. Welcome, yeah. welcome to the meeting. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. You've got your five yes, minutes. Thanks for having me. Oh, thank you. Okay. Right down to now, okay, so 6.49. So, um, yeah, so this is um, just, just a matter of bad timing. This semi-project is, uh, I don't have a slide, but I'd like to, through my, my speech, have the aerial photograph of the location map, one that was provided by the city, just to show, just as a visual. And there are two issues about this development. And one, they're asking for a variance of the lot frontage. 
And this isn't minor. This is an 18% or 10 feet reduction. Um, and uh, council is on record rejecting similar applications for a difference of only one foot. And alone, this is one of the four tests of a, of a minor variance. This fails the, the, the minor aspect of it. Um, the other is the proximity of the in, uh, proximity of this particular development uh, with Paisley and Hawkins. These uh, prevent two new driveways that are less than 50 feet away from that intersection. And the <coughs> other aspect that I did not realize until I saw her presentation was I noticed that previously there was a requirement for the garage to be set back three meters. My question to the planning staff is just an explanation of this because the drawing does not reflect this requirement. So if I could ask that question to through you, the mayor, to the planning department to explain this setback. Okay, sounds good. We've got Ms. Foley back to the mic. Perfect. And through you, Mr. Mayor, to uh, thank you for that question. So the reason the elevations do not reflect that setback is because they were proposed after the application was received, um, kind of late in the stage. So that's why um, that's not reflected in those drawings and we just proposed it so that the garages were not a prominent feature uh, to ensure urban design uh, uh, best practices are there and that the existing streetscape is maintained so the main so the front door would be protruding and the garage would be set back correct yes excellent actually great idea okay so i just want to mention that um like i talked about bad timing and the developer is local they build nice houses. I saw it through the website. They'll in turn hire local people. They'll be priced higher than most houses in the neighborhood. But most importantly, this development will be built soon and we won't have to wait eight years. And I want to put a pin in that statement because what we haven't added to this equation is behind this property. And it is the habitat project. And ironically, the two most pressing issues from that particular particular aspect or that particular project was front lot frontage and traffic safety. So now we have the same issues that the, the habitat project had. So every issue we have now is not only the two, two semis that we have there, we have the other seven, 16 there. So now it's 10 times as bad. The lot frontage issue and the traffic issue are now 10 times as bad. And if it was only the semi, and this is what we're talking about, I wouldn't be here today. I'm here because we're talking about two projects. And now, if we take the two projects together, we apply the four tests of a minor variance, and we add this semi and that habitat project, and it fails all four tests. Does the city consider the application minor? They do. I don't. The variances requested are not minor and have a severe impact on the neighborhood. Generally, the application uh, is the intent of the zoning bylaw. They're ch changing the zoning bylaw to fit this proposal. As for the habitat development, six years ago, I stood before you and told you this was a bad idea and it would take eight years to build. I did it again three years ago. Six years later, the site is rife with garbage and gets cleaned up every time we call and I have to give credit to the bylaw for doing that. The church parking issue was brought up several times but there's been no action. The church sells their parking lot, reducing their parking lot requirement to a third. Every time there's an event, we have a parking problem. Just wait until it will be severe when the habitat development ever comes to fruition. So 49 of the 50 homes in that area had the same problem with that development and combined it moves now from 16 to 18 units. Number 50 moved out of the neighborhood. So now it's 49 out of 49. Both reduce the number of parking spots. Combined traffic on Hawkins Street increases 200%. A 900% increase in traffic at that one intersection alone. 20 driveways are within 60 feet of that intersection. The Habitat Project itself has stated it will not happen in 2025 it will not happen in 2025 or 2024 the infrastructure it will take is one million dollars another year to install funding for that will be over six million 
This business plan didn't work six years ago, did not work three years ago, and now today. I just want to make people aware of the fact that they will in turn be asking for an extension. I'm just asking them to work with a partner to fulfill the quota that they have of two units per year and that we get our tax revenue much sooner. I'd like to see something built there. I don't like it to sit and stand there and do nothing. The other thing that is out there is 6680 Hawkins. Now, with this semi project and that habitat project, you're going to surround that house with 18 units. My uncle, who owns that house, reserves the right to go to the Ontario Land Tribunal and ask for compensation through injurious affection because council approved the development of 16 townhouses that will greatly affect the value of the property. I never suggested that that project alone would affect the value. I had suggested that that habitat project was the one that was going to affect it, and now you're adding two more units. This semi is not the reason for the reduced property values. It stands alone, it would be an improvement. It is the installation of the road three feet from 6680 Hawkins Street that will cause all the problems. Going back to the other thing, this gospel church sells their parking lot to Habitat and reduces their parking by half. Even though it's been brought up at council several times, no one has addressed the zoning infraction. Mr. Herlovich sat it in this chamber and told everyone that property was never in compliance. So all I'm asking is that we still take a look at the overall property before we make a decision on this property. I believe that this property alone is not an issue. Uh, I believe in combination with everything else, it is an issue. That's my speech. Thank, thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Mr. DeLuca. We gave you a couple extra minutes. So thanks. Oh, you're, you're kind. You gave <laughs> me three extra minutes. It's Christmas, it's Christmas. Well, thank Merry Christmas to you, sir. <laughs> thank you. Okay. Um, are there any final questions of council? Okay, seeing none, the public meeting with respect to the proposed zoning bylaw amendment is now concluded. What's the will of council? Did we have somebody else? Oh, did we skip over? Oh, I'm sorry. Did, did the planner wash? Okay. That's okay. I'm going to back that comment up. Council will now hear from the applicant or his or her representative. My apologies. Not a problem. Is there anything you wanted to add that maybe we've left out? There absolutely is. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And I forgot to introduce myself in my last meeting. I'm Rochelle LaRock, a registered professional planner with the Biglieri Group. Got and it. I'm representing my clients this evening. Um, there is, I will let my presentation come up. And while we're waiting, uh, acknowledge we've got Regional Councilor Joyce Morocco in the house. Uh, thank you for being here today. Um, so I would like to thank staff for their presentation to start off with and the hard work um, going into this application. Um, however, the request for the garages to be pushed back three meters from the front wall of the house is something that uh, we do not agree with and quite frankly is completely impractical for a semi-detached dwelling. Um, if you would look at the screen, I will point to the garage, which the front of the garage is behind the front porch. But should that move back three meters from the front uh, wall of that house, that means you end up having a 10 meter hallway, essentially, for this dwelling, which means that we then have to add additional house and additional floor space to the rear of the unit, um, thus reducing that rear yard amenity space more. If this was a single detached dwelling, absolutely moving the garage back behind that front wall of the dwelling would absolutely be something that we would be willing to consider. However, the request of staff to move that front wall of the front of the garage back three meters simply reduces far more livable and usable area in the house. It also increases the length of the driveway, as has been requested by staff in order to make sure that this dwelling is in line with the other dwellings on the property and on Hawkins Street. 
the front yard setback is approximately 10 meters. The original application that we'd submitted had a front yard setback of six meters. So we've reduced that rear yard amenity space by approximately four meters. By pushing the garage back an additional three meters, that means that we're going to have to make up that main floor living space by pushing that house back even further into that required rear yard. Uh, recognizing <coughs> the urban design principles and the ideals that staff are trying to implement. However, for the semi-detached dwelling, it's unfeasible to provide usable living space. We're open to increasing the width or the depth of the front porch on the house to provide a more prominent front porch that goes further into the front yard than the garage. However, um, the request by staff is not something that we agree with and would request that council not include that requirement as part of the zoning bylaw amendment. And I'm happy to take any questions that council may have. Okay, thank you for that. So maybe first we'd like to get staff to weigh in on uh, your suggestions. So I don't know if uh, Mr. Bryce or if it'll be, uh, uh, it'll be Ms. Uh, Cooper, or Foley, sorry. Uh, yes, uh, yeah, yes, your worship. Um, the recommendation is uh, is twofold. Number one, trying to uh, avoid a, uh, a streetscape where the garage is prominent. Number two, uh, the character of the area, it's a uh, majority of the houses on uh, Hawkins Street, uh, either they're flush with the main wall of the dwelling or set back slightly. There's a couple of uh, garages that project slightly ahead. Um, so, you know, our, our recommendation uh, uh, would, would be as in the report, but however, if council is is considering this, um, I would recommend a uh, alignment of the front garage with at least the main wall of the dwelling. Uh, that would push the garage back slightly back from where it is now, uh, and it would be a bit behind the uh, the porch. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, do we have some uh, feedback on that uh, suggestion from our director of planning? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And speaking with my client, it's still not preferred to move that garage wall in line with the front face of the house. Again, because you increase this unusable area, which is a very long interior hallway that can't be used for much. Okay. Um, so we're trying to find some compromise grounds here. Uh, any uh, feedback? Yes, Councilor Peter Angelo. Yeah, I'm just trying to understand. So what is the what is the front uh, yard setback currently? Is it six meters? Uh, through you, Your Worship, it actually is a, it's a uh, average of the two abutting properties. Right. So it is set back well uh, back from six meters. So is it actually a 10 meter setback as it's showing right now? Is that what the front yard setback is? Uh, correct. Uh, it's. 10 meters to the uh, the main wall. So the uh, the porch you see there is there is a projection of the porch, but uh, 10 meters to the main wall. So it is well you know set back well behind the six meters. And sorry, you worship through you to the planner, and you're asking for the garage to be uh, protruded out in front. Through the mayor, what we're asking for is what's shown on the diagram in front of you. So the garage is slightly in front of the front wall of the house. However, we've included a front porch, which exceeds that front wall of the garage face. Okay. Um, and can I just get a word from staff on, 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 on why this is uh, not what you're recommending? Yeah, Mr. Bryce. Uh, yes, uh, yeah, through your worship. Uh, number one, it's uh, again, the urban design we're, we're hoping to avoid uh, you know, streetscape where the garage is dominant. And number two, we're just uh, looking to try and better reflect the character of the, of the neighborhood. Uh, you know, it's, if, if you have a, a situation where the, where the porch is projecting in front, of the, uh, in front of the garage, that may be an alternate uh, solution. Uh, so uh, I, don't, I don't know if the, uh, the client has a recommendation about that. Uh, three, Mr. Mayor, the porch at this time does extend beyond the front wall of the garage. We're open to looking at extending it further if that's something that would be agreeable. Um, it's just shifting that garage location around. 
just makes the design difficult and makes the interior usable space of the house more difficult. Can I ask you how far the porch extends beyond the garage in this diagram? Oh. Approximately? I would say approximately half a meter. Okay. Okay. Hmm? Oh, and is it is it a covered porch? At this time, yes, it is a covered porch. Okay. So, uh, Ed, do we have concerns with this, Mr. Bryce? I mean, I get the character of the neighborhood bit, and I also understand the the usable space bit. I'm just wondering. We're trying to find the you know the happy medium here. Uh, What's your thoughts? I, I would recommend that, that you know, if in, in lieu of the other recommendation about lining with the main wall of the dwelling, that the porch maybe extend out uh, another meter, uh, maybe having a 1.5 meter projection beyond the garage. Through you, Mr. Mayor, that would be completely acceptable. Okay. I think maybe we found our compromise. Are we good? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So. So I think we're good. Let me close this meeting and try to move forward on this then. Okay, the public meeting with, uh, the, for the second time uh, is uh, closed respect to the proposed zoning bylaw amendment. So what is the will of council? Council? Okay, Councilor Patel moves the motion with the amendment that uh, um, Director Bryce proposed, seconded by Councilor Strange. Do you have any discussion to that motion? Let's call the vote. All those in favor? Okay. Opposed? Okay. You're opposed? Yes. Okay. <laughs> well, they're comfortable with it. That's great. So that's approved. We're good. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good job. Thank you. Mr. Uh, Mr. Clerk, can you please introduce the next item on the agenda? Public meeting is now being convened to consider a proposed amendment to the city's official plan and zoning bylaw to permit 87 dwelling units within two existing buildings at 8004 Lundy's Lane. Notice was given by first class mail in accordance with the Planning Act on October 25th, 2023 and by posting a sign on the property in question. Anyone who wants notice of the passing of the official plan and zoning bylaw amendment or preserve their opportunity to appeal to the Ontario Land Tribunal shall give notice to the city clerk immediately after today's public meeting or leave their name on the sign-in sheets located outside council chamber. Thank you very much, Mr. Clerk. Uh, I now ask our planner, senior planner, Mackenzie, to please explain the purpose and the reason for the proposed amendments. Good evening, Mayor, Council, staff, and area residents. Thank you for joining the public meeting for the official plan and zoning bylaw amendment application AM 2023-017 for 8004 Lundy's Lane. The subject lands currently contain two buildings that formerly operated as a 91-unit motel known as the Carriage House Motor Inn and was rezoned in 2018 to permit 52 dwelling units for long-term residential tenancy. The lands are surrounded by detached dwellings and commercial uses to the north, a commercial plaza to the west, the Fullerton Manor Inn to the east, and West Lane Secondary School to the south. The subject lands are approximately 0.53 hectares in area and are designated tourist commercial in the city's official plan. The lands are also located within the Lundy's Lane Satellite District and Intensification Corridor, which permits standalone residential with a maximum density of 100 units per hectare. The applicant is proposing to place the lands under a special policy area to permit a maximum density of 166 units per hectare. The lands are correspondingly zoned site-specific residential apartment 5C density zone, which was established through a previous rezoning application in 2018. The applicant is proposing to rezone the lands to a site-specific residential apartment 5F density zone to permit 87 dwelling units within the two existing buildings. 53 of the 87 dwelling units have proposed rental rates that would be considered affordable to low income households. The remainder of the units would be considered affordable to moderate income households. And this slide shows um, a image of the site plan that was submitted with the application. 
In terms of the site-specific zoning relief that's being requested, staff support the relief to the minimum front yard depth, rear yard depth, easterly interior side yard setback, the maximum lot coverage, and the maximum number of buildings on one lot as it recognizes the existing conditions and built form that are on site. The requested reduction to the minimum area uh, for the amenity space can also be supported as the proposal maximizes available amenity area through indoor and outdoor means. Staff are supportive of the parking rate of 0.66 spaces per unit, but recommend a further reduction to 0.62 spaces per unit as supported by transportation services and the parking demand study. This will allow the three parking spaces that are closest to Lundy's Lane to be replaced with landscaping, which will bring the proposal in conformity with the city's official plan. For this reason, staff do not support the applicant's request to permit parking in the front yard and recommend a reduction to 16% instead of 15% for the minimum landscaped open space area. Further, staff recommend recognizing the existing building height, westerly interior side yard setback, and front yard depth, a depth to the port cochet, and the amending bylaw, again, so that the zoning is reflective of the existing site conditions. A public information open house was held on November 8th, 2023, and no members of the public were in attendance, nor have we received any written comments since then. And in conclusion, staff recommend that council approves the official plan and zoning bylaw amendment subject to the modifications and regulations detailed in report <coughs> PBD 2023-76. Thank you. That's great, thank you very much. Any questions of council? Councilor Lococo. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, I like this development. It's got, um, it, it's bringing a lot of affordable units into our city. Um, the f 53 units are the affordable, so that's great. But it talks about being secured for 10 years through CMHC. Why is it only 10 years? Uh, I understand that we have to start somewhere, but after 10 years, they're not going to be affordable, I guess, through, um, through to the speaker. Uh, through you to Councillor Lococo, I don't have the details about the 10 years. Um, maybe that's something that the planning uh, consultant can speak to. I don't think it's necessarily that they wouldn't honour a commitment necessarily longer, but um, for now that that's what their client was proposing was the 10 years, which is often most, like more than a lot of developers are even proposing. A lot of them don't have that financial mechanism in place, so here they're at least um, trying to have that agreement registered on titles. So. It's great. I just wanted more. For longer. Sure. <laughs> um, can you talk about the, the parking study, about the four-day thing? I don't know if I understood the four-day, why four days? I, did, I didn't understand it. Um, I can have a look. I don't know if I have a copy of the parking study with me, but I have the comments. Yeah, in the report it talks about the four, because you're talking about the 66 spaces down to 51 over a four-day period. Um, going down to 58 over four days. I just wonder what four day is. I didn't write the page down, I'm sorry. No, that's okay. Yes, uh, um, Mr. Nick. I can help out Mackenzie on that. Um, so we would ask the applicant, in which they did in this case, to do a representative site and study it for multiple days. Because what you see on one site one day might be different another day, so they'd average it over four days. So that's all this is reference to a representative site where it was modeled for four days. Okay, I've just never seen it. It's on page three and page four about that. Um, okay, and then um, do I understand this correctly that we're changing it from tourist commercial to residential or does it still remain tourist commercial? Uh, it would still remain tourist commercial. It's just a special policy area that would okay. um, essentially recognize the density that's being requested. So again, I'll go back to VRUs. It's a commercial area. These could be used for VRUs, but not they don't have enough parking. Is that correct? Uh, through you, Your Worship, uh, the property is recommended to be zoned residential. Uh, that zone will not permit VRUs. Okay, so even though it's tourist commercial, it's zoned residential, correct. and it can't be VRUs. Perfect, thank you. Um, Will the Niagara Regional Transit be commenting for buses and transportation? Like I know transportation departments do, but will Niagara Regional Transit be commenting at some point on future applications? You know, that's a good question. I don't know the answer. Would, uh, would uh, one of our staff know the answer to that question? Like now that it's a regional entity, I don't know, it's uh, new territory. Don't know, but we can, I'm sure, get come back to you on that. 
Okay, and I'm really happy about the, the rent, $759 to $1,045 per month. Uh, so that that's great. Um, and I just have a comment after. That, that was all my questions. Thank you. Okay, thank you for that. Any other questions of council? Okay. Um, okay, so I think we're good at this point. Members of the public are advised a failure to make an oral or written submission at this public meeting could result in the Ontario Land Tribunal dismissing any referral it receives. Failure to notify the city clerk to preserve their opportunity to appeal will result in staff rejecting an appeal as per section 3419 of the Planning Act. Council will hear from anyone other than the applicant who wishes to speak to the proposed amendments. Mr. Clerk, do we have anyone who wishes to speak? Uh, there were no residents that had asked to speak to this. Okay, thank you for that. Is anyone here to speak to this? Okay, seeing none. Council will now hear from the applicant or his or her representative. They're online, yes. Whoa. Uh, good evening, Your Worship and members of Council. My name is Azar Davis. I'm a planner from Zilin Capriamo in the City of Toronto, here today on behalf of the owner. Uh, I will endeavour to keep this brief. Um, so just to respond to a couple of earlier questions, um, my understanding regarding the 10-year uh, secured affordable rates, uh, my understanding is that that's just a, a, the period of the specific agreement the client is exploring with CMHC. Uh, but we have been advised uh, by the client that they're interested in and open to future renewals. So that's to be determined, but it will be secured for a minimum of 10 years. Thank you. Um, to respond to staff's recommendation to remove the three parking spaces adjacent to the front property line, you know, we understand that the intent of this request is to buffer the front yard parking between the building and the street. However, we would like to reiterate that these parking spaces are in existing condition, and in our opinion, Retaining as much parking as possible on site would be beneficial to the long-term use of these units. Uh, the requested parking rate is already quite low, as noted by staff, being 0.66 spaces per unit, and the owner is proposing a significant amount of new landscaping, I'm oh, sorry, landscaped open space uh, to be introduced uh, in a future site plan control application. So we therefore respectfully request that council consider removing the need for a landscape buffer on a site-specific basis for these lands, given the constrained parking conditions that are present here. Okay, thank you for that. Any questions um, of our speaker? No? Okay, thank you for that. The public meeting with respect to the proposed official plan and zoning bylaw amendment is now concluded. The will of council, Council Lococo. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I would like to move the recommendation, but before I do that, I would like to uh, ask Mr. Bryce about the, the comment about removing that parking because of the extra the landscape buffer is that something that yep. we can entertain yep mr brace uh through you your worship uh, it uh, it would be a recommendation to uh to have a, a a landscape buffer there but i'll leave that to the will of council okay councilor here we go with the conflicting you know parking landscape yeah, I know. Um, it's always a compromise this, this development has been there for many years these are not new units but they're uh, reconfigured units and it's bringing much needed supply into our community um, parking is definitely an issue and um, you know you, you go down Lundy's Lane there's things right there so um, I, I would like to go with what uh, the suggestion from the developer is Okay, the on, the th on the three parking spots. Yes. Okay, so um, mo moving the recommendation, but with the uh, adding in the three um, parking stalls, um, Councillor Thompson was going to second it. Uh, are you supportive of that, Councillor Thompson? I uh, like uh, the. So he's saying he's not is. Uh, so we're looking for a second. I'll, I'll Okay, so Councillor Patel is willing to second that. Do you have any discussion to the motion? Councillor Peter Angelo. Your Worship, the motion on the floor is to remove landscaping? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't think I'm in favor of that, Your Worship. Okay. Uh, any other discussion to the motion? Okay, so we've got a motion, and we've got it seconded. Okay, yep, yep. I just want to mention, I mean, I know. Uh, the council earlier talked about permeable solutions. I mean, that's what landscaping acts as. It's an area where water can percolate down through the ground, doesn't actually go in our sewers. The more parking that we build, uh, the more water that we have to service ourselves. And I know that uh, permeable solutions as well as part of the urban forest strategy that's gonna come back to the city. 
I would like to keep landscaping, you know, as much as we can, Your Worship. So I, I'm not in favor of that. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, Councillor Newestag. Uh, yes, I, I want to echo Councillor Peter Angel. The, um, we are taking residential and putting it into tourist commercial. The tourist commercial is there. We have um, people coming to our city. Landscaping adds to that element. Um, so I'm, I won't support the extra parking. I would prefer the to keep it with the landscaping. Thank okay, you. Thank you. Councilor Lococo, and then you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. People were already living there. It's not like it's a brand new development and that we're removing, um, you know, starting from scratch without that. That Those three parking spaces, uh, if you look, we're already down to 0.5, so that's um, half a car for every residential unit. So for an additional three parking spaces, we're talking. Uh, I don't know, a few feet of landscape. I, I really see that it going down to 0.51 spaces um, might be difficult, so that's why I wanted to include the three spaces. I love landscaping. I, I've you know stood up for trees and everything, but for this specific development, I think the three spaces can be accommodated. And if that's not the will of council, that's fine. I'd still mm -hmm. like to approve the development because I yep. think it's an excellent development. Councillor Patel. I just wanted to know Mr. Nickel or Mr. Bryce's uh, opinion on this. Okay. Removing the landscaping and bringing the parking, so landscape, landscaping. Let's start off, uh, Mr. Nickel. Yeah, through you, Mr. Mayor. Um, you know, because we have the demonstrated traffic report and um, because this is a, a low, um, or I'll call it affordable housing development, I mean, staff do support the recommend, you know, I support the recommendation of staff that is in the staff report before you which I believe is to, to include the landscaping as those buffer elements. Um, Mr. Bryce may want to comment on it further, but I'd support that. The three spaces would, can be, um, you know, they've demonstrated that it's, it's, accept, uh, it's an acceptable number of parking spaces to suit the uh, development on site. Mr. Bryce? Okay, uh, through you, Your Worship. I just, uh, you know, just to reiterate staffs, like, you know, we, we, we do recommend, uh, you know, a landscape buffer there, but uh, certainly leave it to the will of council, what council feels is best. Thank you for that. I've got uh, Councillor Baldinelli and then Councillor Coco. Sorry, I'm just looking at this, the, the overhead. Um, how many, where do you see three? I see, I think I think I see like five, yeah, six, seven. seven. Is, that, is, that, is that what you're needing? Two in front of the building on each side plus another two on the left side. Is that correct? Through you to the councillor. Um, so it would be uh, what's in front uh, of the building here. So it's these three directly adjacent to, um, to Lundy's Lane. So it would be number one, I believe it's number 57, and then this one that's opposite. So one, two, three. So it doesn't go to the sidewalk. Is that what you're showing me? Sorry. What I'm looking for, what I'm looking at is overhead. So you're saying that one beside this one, so that'd be removal of this tree? And one beside this one, removal of that tree? So some of these parking spaces um, don't exist. It's a little bit different because this is what they're proposing. So I'm just trying to see based on the entrances. Yeah, so they would be roughly where that vegetation's shown to the far. Uh, east That's there, one. yeah, so it would be roughly there, there, and, and then, yeah, roughly on the other side of the, yep. So there would still be grass between the sidewalk? Correct, which would be, uh, most of the landscaping that would be maintained would be in the Municipal Boulevard so at that point. you have to replace those trees as well, right? Uh, that fall, I don't, I'm maybe through, through you, Victor, is that like two for one as well? <coughs> two for one. If you remove a tree, you put two back? Yeah, we usually do three, but uh, yeah. I'm just asking. Yeah. Because there'd be one or two for sure, we right? I think, uh, I'll come to you, uh, Councillor. I think uh, our CAO has a suggestion to help us get through this impasse, and then we can we can vote. Mr. CAO? Yeah, thank you. In consultation with staff, um, you know, clearly we're talking about three parking spots. 
uh, you know, staff would be comfortable with going with the original staff recommendation. If after a year when the building's functioning, if we notice that there's challenges with the parking, then have the applicant come back and then we can adjust the, the parking requirement at that. You know, unfortunately it might mean, you know, redoing the landscaping, but uh, we think that would be an acceptable solution that if, if it, the building's not functioning correctly, then we can take a, a look at it after it's been operating live. Yeah. And Councilor, just one more, and uh, the, the senior planner, uh, or the planner, would like to say a word from the proponent. Um, Ms. Davis, you had your hand up? Yes, thank you. Sorry, I'd just like to respond to, uh, to a couple of concerns. Um, so these, these three parking spaces, they are existing. So no, there is no landscaping that's proposed to be removed here. Uh, these are existing parking spaces. Um, in fact, th there is no... Um, there are no uh, additional paved areas that are proposed here. Um, we're adding, and we're proposing to add a few more landscaped areas, but otherwise there's no significant changes to the site itself. Okay, thank you for that. Okay, Council Lococo. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I will remove my last motion and um, put the motion forward that we accept the uh, recommendation with the um, amendment that the CAO said about if after a year and the parking is needed, then we'll, we'll put that in. Okay, uh, is a seconder agreeable to that? Okay, okay, great. And, and then when, once we vote, I do have a comment after that. Okay, so if we're ready to call the vote on this, all those in favor? Okay, and that's unanimous. You wanted to comment, Councilor? Thank you. There were so many planning applications on this agenda, and I just wondered how many units of housing did we approve? So I went through and I did the number. 796 units went through tonight. Um, 124 of those were affordable, which is 15.58%. If you add the possible affordable units, that comes out to 35.05%. 35 if we remove Lindy's Lane, this one that we're talking about, because they were units before people were living there, um, our affordable units were 10.66%, and if you put the possible affordable ones, it's 33.94%. I just thought that was interesting for a whole evening of work, 796 units. That's a great, it's a great move in the right direction. Yeah. Okay, we're now on to communicate, am I right, and Mr. Clerk? Communications? So there's recommendation here from our clerk that we approve or support items 10.1 through 10.7. Okay, motion by Councillor Thompson, second by, are you seconding it, Councillor? No, not exactly. Well, let me first get a seconder and then we can pull. Yeah. Are, are, Those are the... What's yeah. that? Well, the clerk suggested... Yeah, that's the name. Oh, you're right. We do. We got to pick, we have to pick a name. You're right. Councillor Coco. Uh, on 10.1 in October, on October 3rd, when the, the calendar officially came out, um, we approved that report and it said 4 p.m. <coughs> this one here says 3 p.m. start. Um, I did speak with the clerk and I understand we have very long meetings. We're looking to possibly move it forward. Um, I've made a commitment that I can't be here at 3 p.m. now. So I was going by what we already approved on October 3rd at 4 p.m. This one says 3 p.m. And usually we talk amongst ourselves to say if we are going to change it, is it okay with everybody? It's very inconvenient for me to change it to 3 p.m. For all the meetings? Uh, every Tuesday, correct. Okay. Um, well, that, but that, sorry, Councillor. Uh, I was just going to say that we stick with four. Yeah, then they'll have to just stick with four and we'll just go a little later in the night. That's all. S sorry, but I made that commitment because the first one said 4 p.m. Okay, I appreciate that. So yes, I would put a motion forward to accept it with 4 p.m., not the 3 p.m. Okay, so that was for item uh, one. 10.1, yes. 10.1. Okay, uh, motion by Council Lacoca that we approve it with the uh, proviso that we move the meeting to 4 p.m. rather than 3 p.m. And then maybe we could look at possibly the year after, you know, if, if you can look at your schedule or if your schedule changes. <laughs> yeah, because uh, obviously the clerk does a lot of scheduling around that if you're able. Um, do we have a seconder for that motion? Councilor Neustag, any discussion to the motion? Okay, we'll call the vote, all those in favor? Okay, that's approved. 10.2, Niagara Transit Commission. Uh, we had, is it, is it three names that we had? Mr. Clerk? 
Uh, yes, so the correspondence from the region uh, does suggest that uh, they are looking for each municipality to put forward a nomination. They have gone through the application process and before us tonight we have three applicants, uh, Ursula Hudson, Janet Jessup and Carmelo Carrera. And we do have some ballots prepared. It would probably only take a moment uh, as those come around. Uh, if you want to check off who it is that uh, you'd be voting for. Again, this is for the Public Advisory Committee to the Niagara Transit Commission. Uh, and it's stated in the correspondence from the regional clerk that uh, that committee would be meeting quarterly in 2024. Worship, while, yes. we're, while we're waiting, can I move 10.3 to 10.7? Uh, yes, you can. Okay. Motion okay. by Councillor Peter Angelo, second by Councillor <laughs> Patel to move 10.3 through 10.7. All those in favor? Okay, that's approved. Thank you for that. Good move, Councillor. Uh, thank you. Thank you. something okay which one counselor I'd, I'd like to pull 11.1 and 11.7 please okay why don't we deal with 11.1 first uh, this is regarding the um, letter from the mayor in response to the Minister of Housing uh, I, I'd like to thank Thank everybody for that uh, reply through our planning staff and, and our mayor that it was the reversal of the Kaler Road um, uh, as part of the urban boundary expansion. Well, request for request. Yes, yeah. so um, that, that was great. Regarding the second item in the letter, it talks about the two kilometer SciTech radius. I expressed concerns before uh, regarding SciTech. They're not giving us the information that we need and I suggested an in-camera meeting that we can get that information because it's very hard for us to make a decision to approve something or not approve or be told that it's dangerous or there's issues or there's legalities but we're not getting the information. So in, in the letter, um, as a result, um, it says, I, I, I with the support of my council request it be struck from the regional pl plan. I'm not opposed to it and I'm not for it. We haven't really had a time to discuss it other than at those specific development um, hearing, not hearings, uh, applications. What I would suggest is that we have time to write SciTech once more and ask for that information, have an in-camera meeting so we know for sure, rather than just striking it from the OP without having that meeting. Like I know we've heard from staff, but we haven't had an actual discussion about what we need to do or what we can do. Okay, I've got our um, uh, solicitor uh, gonna help us out here. I don't know if Mr. Bryce went to. Thank you, through the chair. I will defer to Mr. Bryce on like sort of more details, but there is litigation um, around this matter right now. So I'm not sure how much we can talk about in open session. Okay, okay, thank you for that, Mr. CAO. Yeah, and you have to remember, this was put into the official plan based upon a mediated settlement between a developer and uh, you know and the corporation that somehow got put into the official plan. So how it got put into the official plan is even in question. So to you know to us it would be better to strike it out and then have it go through the official plan process with the actual documentation that's been provided. So uh, I think it's trying to accomplish the same thing that you're trying to get to is that they should be providing that information through an official planning process so that we can then document why it's in there. Right now it was essentially a settlement between two parties and, and they say that that's binding on everyone and it never went through a process. So I think we're trying to say the same thing uh, and I think that would force them to uh, present the information that's been requested both legally, uh, both on the floor of council uh, because that was a direction of council and legally through the lawsuit. So Thank I think you it gets you to the same spot. The lawsuit is on one specific one. I, I, like I said, I'm not for or against what we're doing, just that we haven't had the discussion specifically about the two kilometers with SciTech outside of a development application. So I feel that we should be 
um, talking about it once more, make a decision. If they don't supply us, then let's do it. Um, I was just a little surprised that we, we said, please strike it. And I don't think we've really had the conversations about what this means to us or like we've had conversations, but I mean in general about this topic, not a development topic. Well, I, Mr. I was just going to say, but we've never had the conversation to put it in the official plan either. And that's the challenge. So the region put it in the official plan based upon a settlement that we weren't party to. Um, so what we're saying is exactly what you're saying. Let's have the discussion. Let's start back at where at ground zero. Give us the information and have that. You know, to put it into the official plan. Um, you know, it never went through the process, uh, and this council should have had that opportunity to review the information, uh, and the council should have been able to have some of that input uh, into it, and and kind of go from there. So I think that's what we're saying the same thing because you're saying you haven't had the information. That information should have come through uh, the official plan process, and you know that's why asking to strike it would restart that that mandatory discussion. I, I understand what the CAO is saying. I'm. I'm just going to the, the words in there to have it struck with council support. We haven't had a vote that it's council support. Like I said, I don't know if I'm for or against striking it, but it's on the official plan right now, so we have to deal with that. But the way that it's being dealt with is, let's strike it off and then force them to deal with it. I guess I wanted to go the other way, but be um, included in that discussion. There was a decision just to strike it. Yeah, but council never accepted it so by saying don't strike it, you're saying you've accepted it. <laughs> I think that's the challenge. I, I understand what you're saying, but it is in the official plan and a letter has gone to say, please strike it with the support of council. And I don't think we've actually talked about that yeah, it's, it's the support of council. It's really no different than the other items that got put into the official plan where this council never debated it. So they added a land into the official plan. This council never debated it. Um, so it'd be no different than saying, you know, let's not strike that, you know, let's not strike those additions to the official plan because the council hasn't had it. But, you know, council can, council can look at it. I think the, the letter, I think, was trying to reset it to say things should go through an appropriate process and the things that haven't been going through the appropriate process, reset it. Uh, I think that was the, really the intent. Yeah. Well, uh, we could put it to a vote, council. Yeah. I mean, the letter went out. And, and the, it was reflective of the discussion we had here on the development. We were looking for evidence that there should, show us the evidence why there should be a two kilometer arc that sterilizes the land around. And that's what we we're looking for. And we've yet to see it. None of us have seen it. Yes, and, and that's why those discussions were, again, I'm just going to go back. It wasn't the support of council to strike it. And I would let, like, if we were to vote on it now, other than our discussions before, we don't have any specific, um, information about what's allowable what's not like i'd like to see a package with our staff's recommendation we've just been talking about it on specific development packages so I, i'd like to have a a report from from legal from our staff about exactly what the ramifications are either way it would be a legal opinion in camera um that that's all i'm looking for because well, let's let's get to the discussion of council on this because I thought we actually had quite a debate. We had uh, Mr. Vaca here. You know, we talked about this specific thing. So let's find out because the impression that staff and I got was that we felt the same way. We have to hash this out, and by um, not being against it means you're for it. So that's what we're saying. We're saying we have, we're forcing it into a discussion. That's what we're trying to do without saying too much. Like our solicitor said, we can't say too much. But you've all seen the letter. Right, and the letter where we're suggesting that we're not supportive of the two kilometer, there's no evidence to prove, so what we're asking for is, we're asking that it be struck, because it was put in without our support, so maybe some feedback. Councillor uh, Peter Angelo. Thanks, Your Worship. Uh, I remember the discussion as well, and you're right. I mean, that was the majority of council that you know, talked about why the two kilometer arc was there. But just to go uh, to Mr. Burgess's points about the fact that you, know, you can't ask that one be taken out but then leave the other one alone. I mean, we didn't ask that either one be put in the official plan. So it would make sense that we ask for both of them to get taken out, and then, and then we can have a discussion with the province. So I think the letter is appropriate. Yeah, so that's why I'm saying if we're, and then maybe that makes it official, you know, uh, by being supportive of the letter, we're saying we, we take a stand on it. Yeah, Councillor? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I agree with the end 
thing that we're trying to accomplish. I just don't think that we fully agreed on the way to do it because we didn't have a discussion <coughs> to say, write the minister and ask it to be struck. That's all I'm saying. Yeah, well, the letter, okay. Well, then may, we'll do that tonight then. We'll see if there's support around it. Thank, thank you. If we can, um, we, it doesn't really matter. We can't, we don't have to do it. But what I would like is a report from staff that clearly outlines the ramifications either way. And, and I have no problem supporting that, but I do want support for the letter because the letter went out and I don't want it to be, to make it look like I went out on my own on an opinion. I was reflective of the council's decision. So I will ask for council's support or they can not vote against it. I will ask for that. We can still get a report because this isn't the end of the story. I'm sure there's gonna be a lot more parts to this. But did we vote on sending a letter to the minister to have it stricken? We I didn't know. vote on a letter on, on either part. Right. But you're supportive of the one letter about taking the land out of the out of the urban boundary, but you're not supportive of the other part about the arc. So what we're saying is you can't be kind of in and kind of out. You're in or you're out on this. I mean, are you- They're two different you, issues. It's select, pardon me? They're two different issues. They're two different issues, but they're both about uh, what's in the official plan. So they're the same issue in that regard. I, I see what you're saying, but again, we did not agree to have it stricken right. from the so plan. Then we just we're gonna discussed. do the vote. We'll do the vote now, and then we, we won't have to have that discussion. Okay, I understand, but I can't vote not knowing the ramifications if I support or don't. Our solicitor, yes, Ms. Uh -huh. Pinarty. Thank you, um, through you. So this is subject to sort of litigation privilege right now. So for me to comment further, we would need to go in camera and we can be really brief. And I propose to do that. Like I really don't think resources to do a fulsome report from a legal end are warranted. There are litigation privileged reasons behind what we're doing. So um, I'm happy to speak to them briefly for a few minutes in camera if that's, if council's agreeable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Mr. I think Mr. I think Mr. Mayor, I don't, I don't know if it's just about this specific one about litigation. It's any two kilometer one. So it, it's not just about this litigation one. It's about anything. The two kilometer. Right. So let's take the vote on the letter. So why don't we put it on the floor? Okay. And I don't know if I support it or not because I don't know. I, I would, just want to know if okay, not. Thank you. It's, it's a council decision, right? So it's, let's see if council supports. It. Yes. So do we have a motion? I don't even know, do we have a motion right now, uh, Mr. Clerk? I made a motion to oh, yes. accept 11-1 to 11 It's to receive and file. It's, it's, a, it's a letter from the, if you want a letter, from if the you ministry. Want to my motion. And in, as, as background information, the letter from your office was included for information of council. Well, then why don't we start then with 11.1? We'll do them individual since we talked about sure. it. Sure. Your Worship, I'll make a motion that we uh, accept or uh, I guess endorse the recommendations that you put forward in the letter of 11.1. Okay, motion by Council Peter Angel, second by Councilor Thompson. If, is there any further discussion? Yeah, go ahead, Councilor Coco. I will support <coughs> that um, recommendation, that motion, but could we add that we get a report at another time about the two kilometer SciTech mm -hmm. in general arc? Yes, uh, if, if, the, if the mover is agreeable to it. No, okay. So it might have to be okay. a second, it might be, have to be a second uh, separate motion. Okay, Counselor. thank you. Okay, any other discussion to that motion? Okay, all those in favor? Okay, opposed? Okay, one opposed. Okay. Uh, so then can I bring up the, rec yep. the, the motion now? I, I'd like uh, for staff to bring back a report about the two kilometer SciTech arc in general, not about this specific property. Pro, uh, rec um, um, well, the this ramifications of it. Ramifications? So, okay, but this isn't about a specific property, right? The, uh, for the, it's the arc in general. I understand that, but our solicitor said that there was litigation and that's about a specific property. Okay, they can bring something Thank you. Back. Yes, Councilor? Your Worship, the reason that I didn't want to include it in my motion is because I, I listened to the solicitor say that it was, uh, I guess, an unwise use of resources to do that. Uh, until other litigation is settled, and then maybe a report can come back. But to bring a report back now, um, I guess, I, I don't know that it would tell us everything that we need to know, which is the reason why I didn't want to include it. Uh, mm -hmm. If you want to get our solicitor to comment further, I, I'd be happy, but I will vote against the motion at this point as well, uh, simply because I'm gonna listen to our solicitor. Okay, well, yes, go ahead, uh, Ms. Pinarty. 
Thank you. And it's not like details about that arc are not in our public reports. There's at least two or three reports that we brought forward to this council in the last year on different matters that have a substantial section on this arc. So we have no further information than that. So any further report that could be brought forward in the public realm wouldn't have any additional information. And I think the important thing is um, the process that we are um, intending to follow does not prevent anyone from filing further information down the road, right? Like that's the important thing. No interests um, are, um, I guess, deprioritized or um, harmed in this process. So we have no further information. Um, from a litigation strategy standpoint, that's all closed session stuff. I'm happy to speak to it verbally. I think that's a better use um, of time. Um, and that's all I can say at this point. Okay, thank you for that. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'll just remove the motion. That's okay, fine. Okay, thank you. Okay, 11, uh, so you had another one you wanted to speak to, Councillor? Oh, yes, sir. Sorry, 11.7 Niagara Regional Correspondence about the unbuilt homes. I was wondering, I know we get a report about the permits and all of that. I was wondering if we can also get a report of our unbuilt homes, if that could be added to the reports that we already have. This was very helpful. Uh, so would that be plan a planning report? Or is that, uh, Mr. Bryce, is that something? Uh Through you, Your Worship, uh, we do quarterly reports and report to council on that. We can include that information in our next yep. report. Okay, that would great. be great, thank you. Okay, thank you. And if I could just ask real quick, 11.9, Redeemer Bible Church, they're asking for some support on um, guidance regarding opening up a daycare program. I don't know, do we just refer that to staff or, you know? Suggestions and ideas, uh, sure. Okay. okay, motion by Councillor Peter Angel, second by Councillor Strange. We refer 11.9 to staff. Uh, all those in favor? Okay, now did you want to make your motion for the rest? Okay, motion by Councilor Peter Angel, second by Councilor Newestag to um, approve the bal balance of 11. All those in favor? Okay, and that's approved, thank you. Okay, I'm just getting there. Uh, here we go, uh, 12, motion by Councilor Peter Angel, second by Councilor uh, Newestag that we approve the special occasion permit request for 2024 Niagara Heart Beer and Taco Festival, the Convention Center, March 23rd. All those in favor? Okay, and that's approved unanimously. I said heart beer, not heartburn. <laughs> but it will be some heart beer, I think. Heartburn. Uh, Mr. Clerk, uh, ratification of in camera. Uh, thanks, Your Worship. Uh, for ratification purposes, for uh, meeting in camera earlier this afternoon, uh, that Council uh, accept an offer to purchase 4621 St. Clair Avenue for a uh, price of $150,000 plus HST, subject to adjust adjustments if necessary. Also that a condition form a part of the terms of the agreement of purchase and sale, that the purchaser must obtain a building permit and commence, commence building by the end of 2026, failing which the property will be returned to the city. And thirdly, that the city solicitor and the chief administrative officer or their designate is authorized to execute the documentation and take whatever steps necessary to carry out recommendation one and complete the transaction. Uh, the other item uh, to ratify is that council delegate its powers pursuant uh, to section 23.1 of the Municipal Act uh, to each of the CAO, the treasurer and the city solicitor to take any step or necessary action including undertaking of litigation steps and strategies and giving instructions to external counsel with respect to an assessment review board appeal. Okay, looking for a motion to approve uh, ratification. Uh, Councillor Strange, second by Councillor Patel. All those in favor? Okay, that's approved. Thank you for that. Uh, any notices of motion or new business? Uh, Councillor Lococo and Thompson. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I have a notice of motion. When, when the region was talking about the increase of transit, there was a lot of discussions um, going back and forth about 
the increases and why. So the motion I would like to bring at the next meeting is uh, one that staff be directed to report back to council as to whether the transit amalgamation has met the goals that were outlined to this council for the amalgamation. Two, that staff provide a range of options to council as to how to work with the Niagara Transit Commission slash Niagara Regional Transit to obtain better results. And three, that staff be directed to begin conversations with Niagara Regional Transit slash Niagara Regional Niagara Transit Commission, Niagara Regional Transit regarding the process and cost of expanding the transit system to the new regional hospital on Montrose and Bigger Road. So that's the motion that I'll bring at the next council meeting. Okay, okay, we've got that. Uh, did you want to speak, uh, Ms. Pinardi? Yes? I didn't see, okay. Yeah, so that will be a notice of motion, so it'll come through Okay, got it. Okay, thank you for that. Um, do we have, uh, did you have new business, Councillor Thompson? Yes. Pardon me. Yeah, uh, Merry Christmas to Ev, and I think I'm Santa to the night. I'm uh, happy you have the, the talk for a few. I was um, um, six year old, and and. Um, I was, uh, my father was the, the fireman and for 37 years and I spent my life about the fire department for 30 years and when my father passed I, I ran a, a, a really a, a fire hall situation and I bought it and 20 years ago and I um, haven't, it was in my storage and I thought I think we got a great uh, fire chief, Joe, and, and he's great at council, but he got the, the best um, fire hall that probably in on, Ontario. Anyway, I, I would like to give this uh, to um, him and to um, um, have him um, um, put us in his um, office. Get in there, Joe. That's how unbelievable. Smile. It's, uh, you got to look at this. It's got uh, 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 Wayne, X. Look over here, Wayne. And, yeah, and I, I think that he's great. And I, I thought was, why would this storage and I'm going to put it wow. in his, his, his wow. speech. Speech. I don't know what to say, uh, he, Councilor. He wants you to come in the middle. I, uh, <laughs> uh, I, 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 I'm honored uh, to see this, and I have a special place in my office that I will. Uh, yeah, I will put it so when you come Show and visit me, oh, wait, uh, come here, you'll, uh, you'll see it. And uh, I'll make sure that uh, all, the, all the staff uh, are, uh, know the, uh, the history behind it and the meaning for it. It, it, it truly, uh, it, it, you know, it's made a long meeting um, a very special one for me, so I appreciate that very Tip much. Tip it forward a little bit, guys. There we go. One, two, one, two, three. And then one more. One, two, three. Oh, great. You guys are awesome. Great job.
I appreciate that very much. We do need to go back to Niagara Transit. We do. Just to announce the, the vote. Okay. Uh, okay, so the clerk is going to announce the vote oh, for us for. Oh, before sorry. I want to get for Wayne Thompson. Too. Oh, okay. Oh, this is a All right. Read this. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, oh, I nice. I didn't know you were going to do that, Wayne. So this is a little picture. You guys see that the mustache guy? Oh, that's yes. Wayne oh. Thompson. Mom, okay, so that's for you. Uh, Merry Christmas. Everybody's getting something today. Yeah. <laughs> sorry, I didn't know you were presenting. I was going to give that to you later, Wayne. I had the year of 93. All right, do we have any other new business? Councillor Patel. Huh? Through you, Mr. Oh, yeah. I just have a question through you, Mr. Mayor, to Mr. Nichols. Uh, I am getting, <laughs> sorry. Oh, they said pickles. <laughs> I'm just getting so many calls from Chippewa about the Main Street, constru uh, Main Street construction. Would you please tell us what's going on there? Thank you, uh, through you, Mr. Mayor. I guess I have um, good news as we approach the holidays. Uh, the curbs have been poured. We're expecting uh, base asphalt to go down this week. And uh, if the weather permits, we can get on to uh, some of the sidewalks before the end of this year. And then we plan to retender the rest of the project uh, over the winter so that we can finish up all the rest of the three phases um, in a coordinated fashion, hopefully a lot quicker than we were able to get first, the first phase of Chippewa done. Okay, thank you. It's a good news for holidays. That's great. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, Councilor Strange. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, this is our uh, ninth uh, year anniversary coming up for Dalton's uh, wish. That's coming up, and I just wanted to put a little reminder out to everyone um, about Dalton Jakes, who was a, a Welland resident and a young boy when he was uh, uh, diagnosed with osteosarcoma. Uh, they actually avoided um, amputating his leg because they amputated. They, they got rid of the bone and his cancerous bone. Um, they thought it was uh, he was in remission for a while, and unfortunately, it spread right to his to his jaw, um, and. Uh, um, he was a very special boy, and uh, in 2014 I met him, and then in 2015 he was um, very sick, and just before Christmas we wanted to get him something, uh, something special for Christmas, so we asked him, and he says, Mike, I just want all the kids and their families to get presents at Ronald McDonald's, which is the most unselfish thing you can imagine, and uh, um, so shortly after, a couple, uh, couple months later, he passed away. And uh, now it's going to be a ninth year that we're doing this in, in Dalton's legacy. And um, so we're having a, a Dalton's wish. We can bring toys that are going to go up to Ronald McDonald House um, and at Boston Pizza on, on Dorchester Road on December 21st, which is Thursday from 4 to 7. Come by. Uh, Rob Phillips, who's the owner, he's uh, um, going to give 15% off all the food and, and drinks there. So um, it's, he was a really special boy. And I know. Our legal department with Nitty and Bonnie are, are collecting toys on behalf of City Hall as well. So if yeah, anyone of the staff want to bring some toys, I know in, in specific they need from infant to like four years old and from like 16 to 18 years old. This is a tough, tough way. And we're continuing his legacy to help. He loved Ron McDonald so much. And Ron McDonald is such a great place that uh, houses uh, uh, families and their siblings uh, while their child is at Ron at, uh, McMaster Children's Hospital, and Dalton loved it. So every time he didn't have to go for treatment, he stayed around with Dalton. So he he loved it there, and, and uh, it's going to be so special. So we appreciate it. If you could just spread the news uh, for this. So December 21st, four to seven, um, Boston at Pizza. Boston Pizza, and we're going to bring him to Ron McDonald's the next day. Um, so if anyone would like to join us, it can be possible. Too. That's great. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you for that. Uh, just before we uh, go to adjournment, we have to go back to the clerk for the vote on the transit, and I think we'll have to affirm this. Uh, and then do the bylaws. And then do the bylaws. Yeah, thanks, Your Worship. Uh, so just going back to the uh, Niagara Transit Commission, uh, looking for a representative for the Public Advisory Committee. Uh, I just want to get confirmation from Councillor Campbell. Uh, he did send me electronically his vote. <laughs> But if he's online, um, we just get it official by him declaring it verbally. Councillor Campbell, uh, I had here that you had voted for Janet Jessup. Is that correct? Yes, yes. Okay, appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, I would suggest Thank that uh, Council uh, pass a motion uh, that Janet Jessup 
be the representative in the nomination uh, that we submit to the region uh, to be the representative for the Public Advisory Committee to the Niagara Transit Commission. Okay, thank you for that, Mr. Clerk. We got a, mo a motion by Councillor Patel, second by Councillor Peter Angelo. All those in favor? Okay, and uh, Janet Jessup is the new uh, representative on the Transit Board. Uh, and there's no more new business? No? Uh, just remember Sparkle Awards, uh, Award. deadlines tomorrow if you want to submit your house, <laughs> Councilor Strange, and this weekend is voting. So Friday, Saturday, Sunday, go around, drive around, vote, 41 properties, do the people's choice. It's a fun thing to do on the weekend. And my tie, I'm entering it too as well, yes. First, second, and third. The Motion by Councilor Peter Angel, give the bylaws a first, second, and third reading. All those, oh, no, I'm sorry, Councilor uh, LeCoco? Uh, I'm opposed to 117 and 120. Okay, Related to uh, fees. Mr. Clerk, can we? Uh... Yeah. Okay, we made note of that. Okay, uh, motion by Councilor uh, Pierangelo, uh, second by Councilor uh, Thompson. All those in favor? Okay, we're approved. Motion for adjournment. Merry All right, Merry Christmas, everyone. Have a great holiday. Motion by Councilor Baldinelli, second by Councilor Newestag. All those in favor? Thank you. We're adjourned. Have a great night. Merry, Merry Christmas, Christmas, everybody. You too, Wayne. You and Helga. Merry Christmas.